The Bane of the Black Sword Book One, The Stealer of Souls, in which Elric once again makes the acquaintance of Queen Yashana of Jakor and Thaleb Ka'ana of Pantang, and receives satisfaction at last. In a city called Bakshan, which was rich enough to make all the other cities of the northeast seem poor, in a tall towered tavern one night, Alaric, lord of the smoking ruins of Malnibane, smiled like a shark and dryly jested with four powerful merchant princes whom, in a day or so, he intended to pauperise. Moonglum the Outlander, Alaric's companion, viewed the tall albino with admiration and concern, for Alric to laugh and joke was rare. But that he should share his good humour with men of the merchant stamp, that was unprecedented. Moonglum congratulated himself that he was Alric's friend and wondered upon the outcome of the meeting. Alric had, as usual, elaborated little of his plan to Moonglum. We need your particular qualities as swordsman and sorcerer, Lord Elric, and will of course pay well for them. Palamo, overdressed, intense and scrawny, was main spokesman for the four. And how shall you pay, gentlemen? inquired Elric politely, still smiling. Palamo's colleagues raised their eyebrows, and even their spokesman was slightly taken aback. He waved his hand through the smoky air of the tavern room, which was occupied only by the six men. Or in gold, and gems, answered Palamo. In chains, said Elric. We free travellers need no chains of that sort. Moonglum bent forward out of the shadows where he sat, his expression showing that he strongly disapproved of Elric's statement. Palamo and the other merchants were plainly astonished too. Well then, how shall we pay you? I'll decide that later. Alric smiled. But why talk of such things until the time? What do you wish me to do? Palamo coughed and exchanged glances with his peers. They nodded. Palamo dropped his tone and spoke slowly. You are aware that trade is highly competitive in this city, Lord Alric. Many merchants vie with one another to secure the custom of the people. Bakshan is a rich city and its populace is comfortably off. In the main. Well, this is well known, Elric agreed. He was privately likening the well-to-do citizens of Bakshan to sheep and himself to the wolf who would rob the fold. Because of these thoughts, his scarlet eyes were full of a humour which Moonglum knew to be malevolent and ironic. There is one merchant in the city who controls more warehouses and shops than any other, Palamo continued. Because of the size and strength of his caravans, we can afford to import greater quantities of goods into Bakshan and thus sell them for lower prices. He is virtually a thief. He will ruin us with his unfair methods. Palamo was genuinely hurt and aggrieved. Will you refer to Nikorn of Ilmar? Moonglum spoke from behind Elric. Palamo nodded mutely. Elric frowned. This man heads his own caravans braves the dangers of the desert, forest, and mountain. He has earned his position. Well, that is hardly the point, snapped fat Tormiel, beringed and powdered, his flesh a-quiver. No, of course not, smooth-tongued Kalos patted his colleague's arm consolingly. But, but we all admire bravery, I hope. His friends nodded. Silent, dying staff, the last of the four, also coughed and wagged his hairy head. He put his unhealthy fingers on the jeweled hilt of an ornate but virtually useless poignard and squared his shoulders. But, Kalos went on, glancing at Deanstaff with approval, Nikorn takes no risks selling his good cheaply. He's killing us with his low prices. Nikorn is a thorn in our flesh, Palamo elaborated unnecessarily. And you gentlemen require myself and my companion to remove this thorn, Elric stated. In a nutshell, yes. 
Palamo was sweating. He seemed more than a trifle weary of the smiling albino. Legends referring to Elrakim as dreadful, doom-filled exploits were many and elaborately detailed. It was only because of their desperation that they had sought his help in this matter. They needed one who could deal in the necromantic arts, as well as wield a useful blade. Elric's arrival in Bakshan was potential salvation for them. We wish to destroy Nykorn's power, Palamo continued. And if this means destroying Nykorn, well then. He shrugged and half smiled, watching Elric's face. Well, common assassins are easily employed, particularly in Bakshan, Elric pointed out softly. Ah, true, Palamo agreed, but Nykorn implies a sorcerer and a private army. The sorcerer protects him in his palace by means of magic, and a guard of desert men serve to ensure that if magic fails, the natural methods can be used for the purpose. Assassins have attempted to eliminate the traitor, but unfortunately, they were not lucky. Elric laughed. How disappointing, my friends. Still, assassins are the most dispensable members of the community, are they not? And their souls probably went to placate some demon who would otherwise have plagued more honest folk. The merchants laughed half-heartedly at this. Moongrum grinned, enjoyed himself from his seat in the shadows. Elric poured wine for the other five. It was of a vintage which the law in Bakshan forbade the populace to drink. Too much drove the imbiber mad, yet Elric had already quaffed great quantities and showed no ill effects. He raised a cup of the yellow wine to his lips and drained it, breathing deeply and with satisfaction as the stuff entered his system. The others sipped theirs cautiously. The merchants were already regretting their haste in contacting the albino. They had a feeling that not only were the legends true, but that they did not do justice to the strange-eyed man they wished to employ. Elric poured more yellow wine into his goblet and his hand trembled slightly and his dry tongue moved over his lips quickly. His breathing increased as he allowed the beverage to trickle down his throat. He had taken more than enough to make other men into mewling idiots, but those few signs were the only indication the wine had any effect upon him at all. This was a wine for those who wished to dream of different and less tangible worlds. Elric drank it in the hope that he would, for a night or so, cease to dream. Now he asked, And who is this mighty sorcerer, Master Palamo? His name is Theleb Ka'ana, Palamo answered nervously. Elric's scarlet eyes narrowed. The sorcerer of Pantang. Aye, he comes from that island. Elric put his cup down on the table and rose, fingering the blade of Black Island, Iron, the Rune Sword, Stormbringer. He said with conviction, I will help you, gentlemen. He had made up his mind not to rob them after all. A new and more important plan was forming in his brain. Theleb Karna, he thought. So you have made Bakshan your bolt hole, eh? Theleb Kana tittered. It was an obscene sound, coming as it did from the throat of a sorcerer of no mean skill. It did not fit with his sombre, black-bearded countenance, his tall, scarlet-robed frame. It was not a sound suited to one of his extreme wisdom. Theleb Kana tittered and stared with dreamy eyes at the woman who lolled on the couch beside him. He whispered clumsily words of endearment into her ear and she smiled indulgently, stroking his long black hair as she would stroke the coat of a dog. You're a fool for all your learning, Theleb Kana, she murmured, her hooded eyes staring beyond him at the bright green and orange tapestries which decorate the stone walls of her bedchamber. She reflected lazily that a woman could not but help take advantage of any man who put himself so into her power. Yes, Shana, you are a bitch, Theleb Ka'ana breathed foolishly, and all the learning in the world cannot combat love. I love you. He spoke simply, directly, not understanding the woman who lay beside him. 
He had seen into the black bowels of hell and had returned sane. He knew secrets which would turn any ordinary man's mind into quivering, jumbled jelly. Yet in certain arts he was as unversed as those of his youngest acolyte. The art of love was one of these. I love you, he repeated, and wondered why she ignored him. Yashana, Queen of Jakor, pushed the saucer away from her and rose abruptly, swinging bare, well-formed legs off the divan. She was a handsome woman, with hair as black as her soul. Though her youth was fading, she had a strange quality about her which both repelled and attracted men. She wore her multicoloured silks well, and they swirled about her with light grace. She strode to the barred window of the chamber, and stared out into the dark and turbulent night. The sorcerer watched her through narrow, puzzled eyes, disappointed at this halt to their lovemaking. What's wrong? The queen continued to stare out at the night. Great banks of black cloud moved like predatory monsters swiftly across the wind-torn sky. The night was raucous and angry about Bakshan, full of ominous portent. Thelab Ka'ana repeated his question and again received no answer. He stood up angrily then and joined her at the window. Let us leave now, Yashana, before it is too late. If Elric learns of our presence in Bakshan, we shall both suffer. She did not reply, but her breasts heaved beneath the flimsy fabric and her mouth tightened. The sorcerer growled, gripped her arm. Forget your renegade freebooter, Elric. You have me now and I can do much more for you than any sword-swinging medicine man from a broken and senile empire. Yashana laughed unpleasantly and turned on her lover. You are a fool, Thaleb Kana, and you're much less of a man than Elric. Three aching years have passed since he deserted me, skulking off into the night on your trail and leaving me to pine for him. But I still remember his savage kisses and his wild love-making. Gods, I wish he had an equal. Since he left, I've never found one to match him, though many have tried and proved better than you, till you came skulking back and your spells drove them off or destroyed them. She sneered, mocking and taunting him. You've been too long among your parchments to be much good to me. The sorcerer's faces, muscles, tautened beneath his tanned skin and he scowled. Then why do you let me remain? I could make you a slave with a potion, you know that. But you wouldn't, and thus you are my slave, mighty wizard. When Elric threatened to displace you in my affections, you conjured that demon and Elric was forced to fight it. He won, you'll remember, but in his pride refused to compromise. You fled into hiding, and he went in search of you, leaving me. That is what you did. You're in love, Thalib Kana, she laughed in his face, and your love won't let you use your arts against me. Only my other lovers. I put up with you because you are often useful. But if Elric were to return... Dalib Khanna turned away, pettishly picking at his long black beard. Yashana said, I half hate Elric, I. But that is better than half loving you. The sorcerer snarled. Then why did you join me in Bakshan? Why did you leave your brother's son upon the throne as regent and come here? I sent word and you came. You must have some affection for me to do that. Yashana laughed again. I heard that a pale-faced sorcerer with crimson eyes and a howling rune sword was travelling in the northeast. That is why I came, Thaleb Khanna. Thaleb Khanna's face twisted with anger as he bent forward and gripped the woman's shoulder in his taloned hand. You'll remember that this same pale-faced sorcerer was responsible for your own brother's death, he spat. You lay with a man who was a slayer of his kin and yours. He deserted the fleet, which he had left led to pillage his own land, when the dragon masters retaliated. Darmit, your brother, was aboard one of those ships, and he now lies scorched and rotting on the ocean bed. Yashana shook her head wearily. You always mention this and hope to shame me. Yes, I entertained one who was virtually my brother's murderer. 
But Elric had ghastlier crimes on his conscience, and I still loved him, in spite or because of them. Your words do not have the effect you require, Thelemkana. Now leave me, I wish to sleep alone. The sorcerer's nails were still biting into Yashana's cool flesh. He relaxed his grip. I'm sorry, he said, his voice breaking. Let me stay. Go, she said softly. Tortured by his own weakness, Thelab Ka'ana, sorcerer of Pantang, left. Elric of Malnibane was in Bakshan, and Elric had sworn several oaths of vengeance upon Thelab Ka'ana on several separate occasions, in Lormir, Nadsakor, and Tawaloru, as well as in Jakor. In his heart, the black-bearded sorcerer knew who would win any duel which might take place. The four merchants had left, swathed in dark cloaks. They had not deemed it wise for anyone to be aware of their association with Elric. Now, Elric brooded over a fresh cup of yellow wine. He knew that he would need help of a particular and powerful kind if he were going to capture Nykorn's castle. It was virtually unstormable, and with Thelab Ka'ana's necromantic protection... A uh, particularly potent sorcery would have to be used. He knew that he was Thelab Khanna's match and more when it came to wizardry, but if all his energy were expended on fighting the other magician, he would have none left to effect an entry past the crack guard of desert warriors employed by the merchant prince. He needed help. In the forests which lay to the south of Bakshan, he knew he would find men whose aid would be useful. But would they help him? He discussed the problem with Moonglum. I have heard that a band of my countrymen have recently come north from Vilmir, where they have pillaged several large towns, he informed the Eastlander. Since the great battle of Imrir four years ago, the men of Malnibane have spread outwards from the Dragon Isle, becoming mercenaries and freebooters. It was because of me that Imrir fell, and thus they know but if I offer them rich loot, they might aid me. Moonglum smiled wryly. I would not count on it, Elric, he said. Such an act as yours can hardly be forgotten, if you'll forgive my frankness. Your countrymen are now unwilling wanderers, citizens of a raised city. The oldest and greatest the world has known. When Imria the Beautiful fell, there must have been many who wished great suffering upon you. Elric emitted a short laugh. Eh, possibly, he agreed. But these are my people, and I know them. We Melnimoneans are an old and sophisticated race. We rarely allow emotions to interfere with our general well-being. Moonglum raised his eyebrows in an ironic grimace, and Elric interpreted the expression rightly. I was an exception for a short while, he said. But now Cimarill and my cousin lie in the ruins of Imrir, and my own torment will avenge any ill I have done. I think my countrymen will realise this. Moonglum sighed. I hope you are right, Elric. Who leads this band? An old friend, Elric answered. He was a dragon master, and led the attack upon the reaver ships after they had looted Imrir. His name is Divim Tvar, once Lord of the Dragon Caves. And what of his beasts? Where are they? Sleep in the caves again. They can only be roused, rarely. They need years to recuperate while their venom is redistilled and their energy revitalized. If it were not for this, the Dragon Masters would rule the world. And lucky for you they don't, Moonglum commented. Auric said slowly. Who knows? With me to lead them, they might yet. At least... We could carve a new empire from this world, just as our forefathers did. Moonglum said nothing. He thought, privately, that the young kingdoms would not be so easily vanquished. Malnibane and her people were ancient, cruel, and wise. But even their cruelty was tempered with the soft disease which comes with age. They lacked the vitality of the barbarian race, who had been the ancestors of the builders of Imrir and her long-forgotten sister cities. Vitality was often replaced by tolerance, the tolerance of the aged, the ones who have known past glory but whose day is done. 
In the morning, said Elric, we will make contact with Divim Tvar and hope that what he did to the Reaver fleet, coupled with the conscience pangs which I have personally suffered, will serve to give him a properly objective attitude to my scheme. Now for sleep, I think, Moonglum said. I need it anyway, and the wench who awaits me might be growing impatient. Elric shrugged. As you will. I'll drink a little more wine and seek my bed later. The black clouds which had huddled over Bakshan on the previous night were still there in the morning. The sun rose behind them, but the inhabitants were unaware of it. It rose unheralded, but in the fresh rain-splashed dawn, Elric and Moonglum rode the narrow streets of the city, heading for the south gate and the forests beyond. Elric had discarded his usual garb for a simple jerkin of green-dyed leather, which bore the insignia of the royal line of Melnibide, a scarlet dragon rampant on a golden field. On his finger was the Ring of Kings, the single rare Arcturios stone set in the ring of rune-carved silver. This was the ring that Elric's mighty forefathers had worn. It was many centuries old. A short cloak hung from his shoulders, and his hose was also blue, tucked into high black riding boots. At his side hung Stormbringer. A symbiosis existed between man and sword. The man without the sword could become a cripple, lacking sight and energy. The sword without the man could not drink the blood and the souls it needed for its existence. They rode together, sword and man, and none could tell which was the master. Moonglum, more conscious of the inclement weather than his friend, hugged a high-coloured cloak around him and cursed the elements occasionally. It took them an hour's hard riding to reach the outskirts of the forest. As yet in Bakshan, there were only rumours of the Imriarian freebooters coming. Once or twice a tall stranger had been seen in obscure taverns near the southern wall, and this had been remarked upon by the citizens of Bakshan, they felt secure in their wealth and power and had reasoned, with a certain truth in their conviction, that Bakshan could withstand a raid far more ferocious than those raids which had taken weaker Vilmirian towns. Elric had no idea why his countrymen had driven northwards to Bakshan. Possibly they had come to rest and turn their loot into food supplies in the bazaars. The smoke of several large campfires told Elric and Moonglum where the Malnabonaeans were entrenched. With a slackening of pace, they guided their horses in that direction, while wet branches brushed their faces and the scents of the forest. Released by the life-bringing rain, impinged sweetly on their nostrils. It was with a feeling akin to relaxation that Elric met the outguard who suddenly appeared from the undergrowth to bar their way along the forest trail. The Imrerian guard was swathed in furs and steel. Beneath the visor of an intricately worked helmet, he peered at Elric with weary eyes. His vision was slightly impaired by the visor and the rain which dripped from it, so that he did not immediately recognize Elric. Holt, what do you in these parts? Elric said impatiently, Let me pass, it is Elric, your lord and emperor. The guard gasped and lowered the long-bladed spear he carried. He pushed back his helmet and gazed at the man before him with a myriad of different emotions passing across his face. Among these were amazement, reverence, and hate. He bowed stiffly. This is no place for you, my liege. You renounced and betrayed your people five years ago, and while I acknowledge the blood of kings which flows in your veins, I cannot obey you or do you the homage which, of course, otherwise it would be your right to expect. Of course, said Elric proudly, sitting his horse straight-backed, but let your leader, my boyhood friend, Divim Tvar, be the judge of how to deal with me. Take me to him at once, and remember that my companion has done you no ill, but treat him with respect as befits the chosen friend of an emperor of Malnibane. The guard bowed again, and took hold of the reins of Elric's mount. He led the pair down the trail into a large clearing wherein were pitched the tents of the men of Imrir. Cooking fires flared in the centre of the great circle of pavilions, 
and the fine-featured warriors of Malnibane sat talking softly around them. Even in the light of the gloomy day, the fabrics of the tents were bright and gay. The soft tones were wholly Malnibonean in texture. Deep, smoky greens. Azure, ochre, gold, dark blue. The colours did not clash, they blended. Elric felt sad nostalgia for the sundered, multicoloured towers of Umrir the Beautiful. As the two companions and their guide drew nearer, men looked up in astonishment, and a low muttering replaced the sounds of ordinary conversation. Please remain here, the guard said to Elric. I will inform Lord Divim Tvar of your coming. Elric nodded his acquiescence and sat firmly in his saddle, conscious of the gaze of the gathered warriors. None approached him, and some, whom Elric had known personally in the old days, were openly embarrassed. They were the ones who did not stare, but rather averted their eyes, tending to the cooking fires or taking a sudden interest in the polish of their finely wrought longswords and dirks. A few growled angrily, but they were in a definite minority. Most of the men were simply shocked, and also inquisitive. Why had this man their king and their betrayer, come to their camp. The largest pavilion of gold and scarlet had at its peak a banner upon which was emblazoned a dormant dragon, blue upon white. This was the tent of Divim Tvar, and from it the dragon master hurried, buckling on his sword belt, his intelligent eyes puzzled and weary. Divim Tvar was a man a little older than Elric, and he bore the stamp of Malnibonean nobility. His mother had been a princess, a cousin to Elric's own mother. His cheekbones were high and delicate, his eyes slightly slanting, while his skull was narrow, tapering at the jaw. Like Elric, his ears were thin, near lobeless, and coming almost to a point. His hands, the left one now folded around the hilt of a sword, were long-fingered, and like the rest of his skin, pale, though not nearly so pale as the dead white of the albinos. He strode towards the mounted emperor of Malnibane, and now his emotions were controlled. When he was five feet away from Elric, Divim Tvar bowed slowly, his head bent and his face hidden. When he looked up again, his eyes met those of Elric and remained fixed. Divim Tvar Lord of the Dragon Caves greets Elric, master of Malnibane, exponent of her secret arts. Dragon Master spoke gravely, the age-old ritual greeting. Elric was not as confident as he seemed, as he replied, Elric, master of Malnibane, greets his loyal subject and demands that he give audience to Divim Tvar. It was not fitting by ancient Maldabonean standards that the king should request an audience with one of his subjects, and the dragon master understood this. He now said, I would be honoured if my liege would allow me to accompany him to my pavilion. Elric dismounted and led the way towards Divim Tvar's pavilion. Moonglum also dismounted and made to follow, but Elric waved him back. The two Imrerian noblemen entered the tent. Inside, a small oil lamp augmented the gloomy daylight which filtered through the colourful fabric. The tent was simply furnished, possessing only a soldier's hard bed, a table and several carved wooden stalls. Divim Tvar bowed and silently indicated one of these stalls. Arik sat down. For several moments, the two men said nothing. Neither allowed emotion to register on their controlled features. They simply sat and stared at one another. Eventually, Elric said, You know me for a betrayer, a thief, a murderer of my own kin, and a slayer of my countrymen, Dragon Master. Divim Tvar nodded. With my liege's permission, I will agree with him. We were never so formal in the old days when alone, Elric said. Let us forget ritual and tradition. Malnibane is broken and her sons are wanderers. We meet, as we used to, as equals. 
Only now this is wholly true. We are equals. The ruby throne crashed in the ashes of Imbria, and now no emperor may sit in state. Divim Tvar sighed. This is true, Elric. But why have you come here? We were content to forget you. Even while thoughts of vengeance were fresh, we made no move to seek you out. Have you come to mock? You know I would never do that, Divim Tvar. I rarely sleep in these days, and when I do, I have such dreams that I would rather be awake. You know that Urkun forced me to do what I did when he usurped the throne for the second time, after I had trusted him as regent, when, again, for the second time, he put his sister, whom I loved, into a sorcerous slumber. To aid that Reaver fleet was my only hope of forcing him to undo his work and release Cimmeril from the spell. I was moved by vengeance, but it was Stormbringer, my sword, which slew Cimmeril, not I. Of this I am aware, Divim Tvar sighed again and rubbed one jeweled hand across his face, but it does not explain why you come here. There should be no contact between you and your people. We are weary of you, Elric. Even if we allowed you to lead us again, you would take your own doomed path and us with you. There is no future there for myself and my men. Agreed. But I need your help for this one time. Then our ways can part again. We should kill you, Alric. But which would be the greater crime? Failure to do justice and slay our betrayer? Or regicide? You have given me a problem at a time when there are too many problems already. Should I attempt to solve it? I but played my part in history, Elric said earnestly. Time would have done what I did, eventually. I but brought the day nearer. And brought it when you and our people are still resilient enough to combat it and turn to a new way of life. Divim Tvar smiled ironically. That is one point of view, Elric, and it has truth in it, I grant you. But tell it to the men who lost their kin and their homes because of you. Tell it to warriors who had to tend maimed comrades, to brothers, fathers and husbands whose wives, daughters and sisters, prowl, proud Melnibonean women were used to pleasure the barbarian pillagers. I, Eric dropped his eyes. When he next spoke, it was quietly. I can do nothing to replace what our people have lost. Would that I could. I yearn for Imria often, and her woman and her wines and entertainments. But I can offer plunder. I can offer you the richest palace in Bakshan. Forget the old wounds and follow me this once. Do you seek the riches of Bakshan, Elric? You were never one for jewels and precious metals. Why? Elric ran his hands through his white hair. His red eyes were troubled. For vengeance once again, Divim Tvar. I owe a debt to a sorcerer from Pan Tang, Theleb Ka'ana. You may have heard of him. He is fairly powerful for one of a comparatively young race. Then we're joined in this, Elric. Divim Tvar spoke grimly. You are not the only Melnibonean who owes Theleb Kana a debt. Because of that bitch queen Yashana of Jakor, one of our men was done to death a year ago in a most foul and horrible manner. Killed by Theleb Kana because he gave his embraces to Yashana, who sought a substitute for you. We can unite to avenge that blood, King Elric and it will be a fitting excuse for those who would rather have your blood on their knives. Elric was not glad. He had a sudden premonition 
that this fortunate coincidence was to have grave and unpredictable outcomings. But he smiled. In a smoking pit, somewhere beyond the limitations of space and time, a creature stirred. All around it, shadows moved. They were the shadows of the souls of men. And these shadows which move through the bright darkness were the masters of the creature. It allowed them to master it, so long as they paid its price. In the speech of men, this creature had a name. It was called Qualnargan, and would answer to this name if called. Now it stirred. It heard its name carrying over the barriers which normally blocked its way to the earth. The calling of the name affected a temporary pathway through those intangible barriers. It stirred again as its name was called for the second time. I was unaware of why it was called or to what it was called. I was only muzzily conscious of one fact. When the pathway was opened, it could feed. It did not eat flesh, and it did not drink blood. It fed on the minds and the souls of adult men and women. Occasionally as an appetizer, it enjoyed the morsels. The sweetmeats, as it were, of the innocent life force which it sucked from children. It ignored animals, since there was not enough awareness in an animal to savour. The creature was, for all its alien stupidity, a gourmet and a connoisseur. Now its name was called for the third time. It stirred again and flowed forward. The time was approaching when it could, once again, feed. Thelib Ka'ana shuddered. He was basically, he felt, a man of peace. It was not his fault that his avaricious love for Yashana had turned him mad. It was not his fault that, because of her, he now controlled several powerful and malevolent demons who, in return for the slaves and enemies he fed them, protected the palace of Nikorn, the merchant. He felt very strongly that none of it was his fault. It was circumstance which had damned him. He wished sadly that he had never met Yushana, never returned to her after that unfortunate episode outside the walls of Tanalorn. He shuddered again as he stood within the pentacle and summoned Qual Nagan. His embryonic talent for precognition had shown him a little of the near future, and he knew that Elric was preparing to do battle with him. Thelib Kano was taking the opportunity of summoning all the aid he could control. Qual Nagan must be sent to destroy Elric if it could, before the albino reached the castle. Thelib Khanna congratulated himself that he still retained the lock of white hair which had enabled him, in the past, to send another, now deceased, demon against Elric. Qual Nargan knew that it was reaching its master. It propelled itself sluggishly forward and felt a stinging pain as it entered the alien continuum. It knew that its master's soul hovered before it but for some reason was disappointingly unattainable. Something was dropped in front of it. Qual Nargan centred at it and knew what it must do. This was part of its new feed. It flowed gratefully away, intent on finding its prey before the pain was too endemic. And before the pain which was endemic of a prolonged stay in the strange place grew too much.
Elric rode at the head of his countrymen. On his right was Divim Tvar, the dragon master, and on his left Moonglum of Elhwer. Behind him rode two hundred fighting men, and behind them the wagons containing their loot, their war machines, and their slaves. The caravan was resplendent with proud banners and the gleaming, long-bladed lances of Imrir. They were clad in steel with tapering greaves, helmets, and shoulder pieces. Their breastplates were polished and glinted where the long fur jerkins were open. Over the jerkins were flung bright colours of Imririan fabrics, scintillating in the watering sunshine. The archers were immediately close to Elric and his companions. They carried unstrung bone bows of tremendous power, which only they could use. On their backs were quivers crammed with black-fletched arrows. Then came the lancers, with their shining lances at a tilt to avoid the low branches of the trees. Behind these rode the main strength, the Imririan swordsmen carrying long swords and shorter stabbing weapons, which were too short to be real swords and too long to be named as knives. They rode, skirting Bakshan, for the palace of Nikorn, which lay to the north of Bakshan. They rode these men in silence. They could think of nothing to say, while Elric, their liege, led them to battle for the first time in five years. Stormbringer, the black Hellblade, tingled under Elric's hand, anticipating a new sword quenching. Moonglum fidgeted in his saddle, nervous of the forthcoming fight, which he knew would involve dark sorcery. Moonglum had no liking for the sorceress arts, or for the creatures they spawned. To his mind, men should fight their own battles without help. They rode on, nervous and tense. Stormbringer shook against Elric's side. A faint moan emanated from the metal, and the tone was one of warning. Elric raised a hand, and the cavalcade reined to a halt. There is something coming near which only I can deal with, he informed the men. I will ride on ahead. He spurred his horse into a weary canter, keeping his eyes before him. Stormbringer's voice was louder, sharper, a muted shriek. The horse trembled and Elric's own nerves were tense. He had not expected trouble so soon, and he prayed that whatever evil was lurking in the forest is not directed against him. Ariok, be with me, he breathed. Aid me now and I'll dedicate a score of warriors to you. Aid me, Arioch. A foul odour forced itself into Elric's nostrils. He coughed and covered his mouth with his hands, his eyes seeking the source of the stink. The horse whinnied. Elric jumped from the saddle and slapped his mount on the rump, sending it back along the trail. He crouched warily, Stormbringer now in its, his grasp, the black metal quivering from point to pommel. He sensed it with the witch side of his forebears, before he saw it with his own eyes, and he recognised its shape. He himself was one of its masters. But this time, he had no control over Qual Narigan. He was standing in no pentacle, and his only protection was his blade and his wits. He knew also of the power of Qual Narigan and shuddered. Could he overcome such a horror single-handedly? Ariok! Ariok, aid me! It was a scream, high and desperate. There was no time to conjure a spell. Qual Narigan was before him, a great green toad thing, which hopped along the trail obscenely moaning to itself in its earth-fostered pain. It towered over Elric so that the albino was in its shadow before it was ten feet away from him. Elric breathed steadily and screamed once more. Arioch! Blood and souls if you aid me now! Suddenly the toad demon leapt. Elric sprang to one side but was caught by the long-nailed foot which sent him flying into the undergrowth. Qual Narigan turned clumsily and its filthy mouth opened hungrily, displaying a deep, 
toothless cavity from which a foul odour poured. Arioch! In its evil and alien insensitivity, the toad thing did not even recognise the name of so powerful a demon god. It could not be frightened. It had to be fought. And as it approached Elric for the second time, the clouds belched rain from their bowels and a downpour lashed the forest. Half blinded by the rain, smashing against his face, Elric backed against a tree, his rune sword ready. In ordinary terms, Qual Nargan was blind. It could not see Elric or the forest, it could not feel the rain. It could only see and smell men's souls, its feed. The toad demon blundered past him, and as it did so, Elric leapt high, holding his blade with both hands, and plunged it into the hilt. And plunged it to the hilt into the demon's soft and quivering back. Flesh, or whatever earthbound stuff formed the demon's body, squelched nauseatingly. Elric pulled at the Stormbringer's hilt as the sorcerer's sword seared into the Hellbeast's back, cutting down where the spine should be, but where no spine was. While Narragan piped its pain, its voice was thin and reedy, even in such extreme agony. It retaliated. Elric felt his mind go numb, and then his head was filled with a pain which was not natural in any sense. He could not even shriek. His eyes widened in horror as he realised what was happening to him. His soul was being drawn from his body. He knew it. He felt no physical weakness. He was only aware of looking out, and but even the awareness was fading. Everything was fading. Even the pain. Even the dreadful hell-spawned pain. Arioch. He croaked. Savagely, he summoned strength from somewhere. Not from himself, not even from Stormbringer, from somewhere. Something was aiding him at last, giving him strength, enough strength to do what he must. He wrenched the blade from the demon's back. He stood over Qual Narragan. Above him, he was floating somewhere, not in the air of the earth, just floating over the demon. With thoughtful deliberation, he selected a spot on the demon's skull, which he somehow knew to be the only spot on his body where Stormbringer might slay. Slowly and carefully, he lowered Stormbringer and twisted the rune sword through Qual Narragan's skull. The toad thing whimpered, dropped, and vanished. Ulrich lay sprawling in the undergrowth, trembling the length of his aching body. He picked himself up slowly. All his energy had been drained from him. Stormbringer too seemed to have lost its vitality, but that Ulrich knew would return and in returning bring him new strength. But then he felt his whole frame tugged rigid. He was astounded. What was happening? senses began to blank out. He had the feeling that he was staring down a long black tunnel which stretched into nowhere. Everything was vague. He was aware of motion. He was travelling. How or where he could not tell. For brief seconds he travelled, conscious only of an unearthly feeling of motion and the fact that Stormbringer, his life, was clutched in his right hand. Then he felt hard stone beneath him and he opened his eyes, or was it, he wondered, that his vision returned. He looked up at the gloating face above him. Thelem Kana, he whispered hoarsely. How did you affect this? The sorcerer bent down and tugged Stormbringer from Ulrich's enfeebled grasp. He sneered. I followed your commendable battle with my messenger, Lord Elric. When it was obvious that somehow you had summoned aid, I quickly conjured another spell and brought you here. Now I have your sword and your strength. I know that without it you are nothing. 
You're in my power, Alric of Malnibonet. Alric gasped air into his lungs. His whole body was pain-wracked. He tried to smile, but he could not. It was not in his nature to smile when he was beaten. Give me back my sword. Taleb Ka'ana gave a self-satisfied smirk. He chuckled. Who talks of vengeance now, Elric? Give me my sword. Elric tried to rise, but he was too weak. His vision blurred until he could hardly see the gloating sorcerer. And what kind of bargain do you offer? Taleb Ka'ana asked. You are not a well man, Lord Elric, and sick men do not bargain. They beg. Elric trembled in impotent anger. He tightened his mouth. He would not beg, neither would he bargain. In silence he glowered at the sorcerer. I think that first, Thelib Kana said, smiling, I shall lock this away. He hefted Stormbringer in his hand and turned towards a cupboard beside him. From his robes he produced a key with which he unlocked the cupboard and placed the rune sword inside, carefully locking the door again when he had done so. Then, I think I'll show our virile hero to his ex-mistress, sister of the man he betrayed four years ago. Eric said nothing. And after that... The Abkana continued, My employer Nikorn shall be shown the assassin who thought he could do what others failed to achieve. He smiled. What a day. So full. So rich with pleasure. The Abkana tittered and picked up a handbell. He rang it. The door behind Elric opened and two tall desert warriors strode in. They glanced at Elric and then at The Abkana. They were evidently amazed. No questions, Thelib Kana snapped. Take this refuse to the chambers of Queen Yashana. Arik fumed as he was hefted up between the two. The men were dark-skinned, bearded, and their eyes were deep-set beneath shaggy brows. They wore the heavy, wool-trimmed metal caps of their race, and their armour was not of iron, but of thick, leather-covered wood. Down a long corridor they lugged Elric's weakened body and one of them rapped sharply on the door. Elric recognised Yashana's voice, bid them enter. Behind the desert men in their burden came the tittering, fussing sorcerer. A present for you, Yashana, he called. The desert men entered. Elric could not see Yashana, but he heard her gasp. On the couch, directed the sorcerer. Elric was deposited on yielding fabric. He lay completely exhausted on the couch, staring up at a bright, lewd mural which had been painted on the ceiling. Yashana bent over. Elric could smell her erotic perfume. He said hoarsely, An unprecedented reunion, Queen. Yashana's eyes were for a moment concerned. Then they hardened and she laughed cynically. Oh, my hero has returned to me at last, but I'd rather he'd come at his own volition, not dragged here by the back of his neck like a puppy. The wolf's teeth shall be drawn, and there's no one to savage me at night. She turned away, disgust on her painted face. Take him away, Thelib Kana, you've proved your point. The sorcerer nodded. And now, he said, to visit Nikorn. I think he should be expecting us by this time. Nikorn of Ilmar was not a young man. He was well past fifty, but had preserved his youth. His face was that of a peasant, firm-boned but not fleshy. His eyes were keen and hard as he stared at Elric, who had been mockingly propped in a chair. So you are Elric of Malnibane, the wolf of the snarling sea, spoiler, reaver, and woman slayer. I think you could hardly slay a child now. However, I will say that it discomforts me to see any man in such a position, particularly one who has been so active as you. Was it true what the spellmaker says? Were you sent here by my enemies to assassinate me? 
Arik was concerned for his men. What would they do? Wait or go on? If they stormed the palace now, they were doomed, and so was he. Is it true? Nikorn was insistent. No, whispered Elric. My quarrel was with Theleb Kana. I have an old score to settle with him. Well, I'm not interested in old scores, my friend, Nikorn said, not unkindly. I am interested in preserving my life. Who sent you here? Theleb Kana speaks falsely if he told you I was sent, Elric lied. I was interested only in paying my debt. And it's not only the sorcerer who told me, I'm afraid, Nikorn said. I have many spies in the city, and two of them independently informed me of a plot by local merchants to employ you to kill me. Elric smiled faintly. Very well, he agreed. It was true, but I had no intention of doing what you asked. I had no intention of doing what they asked. Nikorn said, I might believe you, Alric of Malnobanet, but now I do not know what to do with you. I would not turn anyone over to Theleb Kana's mercies. May I have your word that you will not make an attempt on my life again? Are we bargaining, Master Nikorn? Alric said faintly. We are. Well, then what do I give my word in return for, sir? Your life and freedom, Lord Elric. And my sword? Nikorn shrugged regretfully. I'm sorry, not your sword. Then take my life, said Elric brokenly. Come now, my bargain's good. Have your life and freedom and give your word that you will not plague me again. Elric breathed deeply. Very well. Nikorn moved away. Theleb Kaana, who had been standing in the shadows, put a hand on the merchant's arm. You are going to release him? Aye, Nikorn said. He's no threat to either of us now. Elric was aware of a certain feeling of friendship in Nikorn's attitude towards him. He too felt something of the same. He was a man both courageous and clever. But, Elric fought madness, without Stormbringer, what could he do to fight back? The 200 Imrerian warriors lay hidden in the undergrowth as dusk gave way to night. They watched and wondered. What had happened to Elric? Was he now in the castle, as Divim Tvar thought? The Dragon Master knew something of the art of divining, as did all members of the royal line of Melnubine. From what small spells he had conjured, it seemed that Elric now lay within the castle walls. But without Elric to battle Theleb Kana's power, how could they take it? Nikon's palace was also a fortress, bleak and unlovely. It was surrounded by a deep moat of dark, stagnant water. It stood high above the surrounding forest, built into, rather than onto, the rock. Much of it had been carved out of the living stone. It was sprawling and rambling and covered in a large area, surrounded by natural buttresses. The rock was porous in places, and slimy water ran down the walls of the lower parts, spreading through dark moss. It was not a pleasant place, judging from the outside, but it was almost certainly impregnable. Two hundred men could not take it without the, age of, without the aid of magic. Some of the Malnabonean warriors were becoming impatient. There were a few who muttered that Elric had once again betrayed them. Divim Tvar and Moonglum did not believe this. They had seen the signs of conflict and heard them in the forest. They waited, hoping for a signal from the castle itself. They watched the castle's great main gate, and their patience at last proved of value. The huge wood and metal gate swung inwards on chains, and a white-faced man in the tattered regalia of Malnibane appeared between two desert warriors. They were supporting him, it seemed. They pushed him forward. He staggered a few yards along the causeway of slimy stone which bridged the moat. Then he fell. He began to crawl wearily, painfully forward. 
Moonglum growled. What have they done to him? I must help him. But Divim Tvar held him back. No, it would not do to betray our presence here. Let him reach the forest first, and then we can help him. Even those who had cursed Elric now felt pity for the albino as staggering and crawling alternately. He dragged his body slowly towards them. From the battlements of the fortress, a tittering laugh was borne down to the ears of those below. They also caught a few words. What now, wolf? said the voice. What now? Moonglum clenched his hands and trembled with rage, hating to see his proud friend so mocked in his weakness. What's happened to him? What have they done? Patience, Divin Tvar said. We'll find out in a short while. It was an agony to wait until Elric finally crawled on his knees into the undergrowth. Moonglum went forward to aid his friend. He put a supporting arm around Elric's shoulders, but the albino snarled and shook it off. His whole countenance aflame with terrible hate, made more terrible because it was impotent. Elric could do nothing to destroy that which he hated. Nothing. Divim Tvar said urgently, Elric, you must tell us what happened. If we're to help you, we must know what happened. Elric breathed heavily and nodded his agreement. His face partially cleared of the emotion he felt, and weakly he stuttered out the story. So, Moonglum growled, our plans come to nothing, and you have lost your strength forever. Elric shook his head. There must be a way. There must. What? How? If you have a plan, Elric, let me hear it now. Elric, Elric swallowed thickly and mumbled. Very well. Moonglum, you shall hear it, but listen carefully, for I have not the strength to repeat it. Moonglum was a lover of the night, but only when it was lit by the torches found at the cities. He did not like the night when it came to open countryside, and he was not fond of it when it pressed a castle such as Nykorn's. But he moved on and hoped for the best. If Elric had been right in his interpretation, then the battle meant might, might yet be won, and Nykorn's palace taken. But it still meant danger for Moonglum, and he was not one to deliberately put himself into danger. As he viewed the stagnant waters of the moat with distaste, he reflected that this was enough to test any friendship to the utmost. Philosophically, he lowered himself down into the water and began to swim across it. The moss on the fortress offered a flimsy handhold, but it led to ivy, which gave a better grip. Moonglum slowly clambered up the wall. He hoped that Elric had been right and that Thalabka'ana would need to rest for a while before he could work more sorcery. That was why Elric had suggested he make haste. Moonglum clambered on and eventually reached the small, unbarred window he sought. A normal-sized man could not have entered, but Moonglum's small frame was proving useful. He wriggled through the gap, shivering with cold, landed on the hard stone of a narrow staircase which ran both up and down the interior walls of the fortress. Moonglum frowned and then took the steps leading upwards. Elric had given him a rough idea of how to reach his destination. Expecting the worst, he went soft-footed up the stone steps. He went towards the chambers of Yashana, Queen of Jacquois. In an hour, Moonglum was back, shivering with cold and dripping with water. In his hands, he carried Stormbringer. He carried the rune sword with cautious care, nervous of its sentient evil. It was alive again, with black, pulsating life. Thank the gods I was right, Elric murmured weakly from where he lay, surrounded by two or three Imrerians, including Divim Tvar, who was staring at the albino with concern. I prayed that I was correct in my assumption, and Thaleb Khanna was resting after his earlier exertions on my behalf. He stirred, and Divim Tvar helped him to sit upright. 
Alric reached out a long white hand, reached like an addict of some terrible drug towards the sword. Did you give her my message? he asked as he gratefully seized the pommel. Aye, Moonglum said shakily, and she agreed. You were also right in your other interpretation, Elric. It did not take her long to inveigle the key out of a weary Thalab Kana. The sorcerer was tremendously tired, and Nikorn was becoming nervous, wondering if an attack of any kind would take place while Thalab Kana was incapable of action. She went herself to the cupboard and got me the blade. Woman can sometimes be useful, said Divim Tvar dryly, though usually in matters like these there are hindrance. It was possible to see that something other than immediate problems of taking the castle were worrying Divim Tvar, but no one thought to ask him what it was that bothered him. It seemed a personal thing. I agree, Dragon Master, Alric said almost gaily. The gathered men were aware of the strength which poured swiftly into the albino's deficient veins, imbuing him with a new hell-born vitality. It's time for our vengeance, but remember, no harm to Nikorn. I gave him my word. He folded his right hand firmly around Stormbringer's hilt. Now for a sword quenching. I believe I can obtain the help of just the allies we need to keep the sorcerer occupied while we storm the castle. I'll need no pentacle to summon my friends of the air. Moonglum licked his long lips. So it's sorcery again. In truth, Elric, this whole country is beginning to stink of wizardry and the minions of hell. Elric murmured for his friend's ears. No hell beings, these, but honest elementals, equally powerful in many ways. Curb your belly fear, Moonglum. A little more simple conjuring and Thalab Kana will have no desire to retaliate. The albino frowned, remembering the secret pacts of his forefathers. He took a deep breath and closed his pain-filled scarlet eyes. He swayed, the rune sword half loose in his grip. His chant was low, like the far-off moaning of the wind itself. His chest moved quickly up and down, and some of the younger warriors, those who had never been fully initiated into the ancient lore of Malnibane, stirred with discomfort. Eric's voice was not addressing human folk. His words were for the invisible, the intangible, the supernatural. An old and ancient rhyme began, the casting of word runes. Hear the doomed one's dark decision. Let the wind giant's wail be heard. Gaol and Misha's mighty moaning. Send my enemy like a bird. By the sultry scarlet tones... By the bane of my black blade, by the lass Ha's lonely mewling, let a mighty wind be made. Speed of sunbeams from their homeland, swifter than the sundering storm. Speed of arrow deerwoods shooting, let the sorcerer so be born. His voice broke and he called high and clear, Misha! Misha, in the name of my fathers, I summon thee, Lord of Winds. Almost at once the trees of the forest suddenly bent as if some great hand had brushed them aside. A terrible, soughing voice swam from nowhere, and all but Elric, deep in his trance, shivered. Elric of Malnibane, the voice roared like a distant storm, we knew your fathers, I know thee. The debt we owe the line of Elric is forgotten by mortals, but Graol and Misha, kings of the wind, remember, how may the Lassaha aid thee? The voice seemed almost friendly, but proud and aloof and awe-inspiring. Elric, completely in a state of trance now, jerked his whole body in convulsions. His voice shrieked piercingly from his throat, and the words were alien, unhuman, violently disturbing to the ears and nerves of human listeners. Elric spoke briefly, and then the invisible wind giant's great voice roared and sighed, I will do as thee desire. Then the trees bent once more, and the forest was still and muted. Somewhere in the gathered ranks, a man sneezed sharply, and this was the sign for the others to start talking, speculating. 
For many moments, Elric remained in his trance, and then quite suddenly he opened his enigmatic eyes and looked gravely around him, puzzled for a second. Then he clasped Stormbringer more firmly and leaned forward, speaking to the men of Imrir. Soon Thelebkana will be in our power, my friends, and so also will we possess the loot of Nikorn's palace. But Divim Tvar shuddered then. I'm not so skilled in the esoteric arts as you, Elric, he said quietly, but in my soul I see three wolves leading a pack to slaughter. One of those wolves must die. My doom is near me, I think. Elric said uncomfortably, Worry not, Dragon Master. You'll live to mock the ravens and spend the spoils of Bakshan. But his voice was not convincing. In his bed of silk and ermine, Thilem Kana stirred and awoke. He had a brooding inkling of coming trouble, and he remembered that earlier in his tiredness he had given more to Yashana than had been wise. He could not remember what it was, and now he had a presentiment of danger, the closeness of which overshadowed thoughts of any past indiscretion. He arose hurriedly and pulled his robe over his head, shrugging into it as he walked towards a strangely silvered mirror which was set on the wall of his chamber and reflected no image. With bleary eyes and trembling hands he began preparations. From one of the many earthenware jars resting on a bench near the window, he poured a substance which seemed like dried blood mottled with the hardened blue venom of the black serpent whose homeland was in far Dorel, which lay on the edge of the world. Over this, he muttered a swift incantation, scooped the stuff into a crucible and hurled it at the mirror, one arm shielding his eyes. A crack sounded, hard and sharp to his ears, and bright green light erupted suddenly and was gone. The mirror flickered deep within itself. The silver ring seemed to undulate and flicker and flash, and then a picture began to form. Thelab Ka'ana knew that the sight he witnessed had taken place in the recent past. It showed him Elric's summoning of the wind giants. Thelab Ka'ana's dark features grinned with a terrible fear. His hands jerked as spasms shook him. Half gibbering, he rushed back to his bench and, leaning his hands upon it, stared out of the window into the deep night. He knew what to expect. A great and dreadful storm was blowing, and he was the object of the Las Ha's attack. He had to re retaliate, else his own soul would be wrenched from him by the giants of the wind and flung to the air spirits to be born for eternity on the winds of the world. Then his voice would moan like a banshee around the cold peaks of high, ice-clothed mountains forever, lost and lonely. His soul would be damned to travel with the four winds wherever their caprice might bear it, knowing no rest. Thelab Kana had a respect born of fear for the powers of the Eromancer, the rare wizard who could control the wind elementals. And Eromancy was only one of the arts which Elric and his ancestors possessed. Then Thelab Kana realised what he was battling. Ten thousand years and hundreds of generations of sorcerers who had gleaned knowledge from the earth and beyond it and passed it down to the albino whom he, Thelab Kana, had sought to destroy. Then Thelab Kana fully regretted his actions. It was too late. The sorcerer had no control over the powerful wind giants as Elric had. His only hope was to combat one element with another. The fire spirits must be summoned, and quickly. All of Thelab Kana's pyromantic powers would be required to hold off the ravening supernatural winds which were soon to shake the air and the earth. Even hell would shake to the sound and thunder of the wind giant's wrath. Quickly Thelab Kana marshalled his thoughts and with trembling hands began to make strange passes in the air 
and promise unhealthy pacts with whichever of the powerful fire elementals would help him this once. He promised himself to eternal death for the sake of a few more years of life. With the gathering of the wind giants came the thunder and the rain. The lightning flashed sporadically, but not lethally. It never touched the earth. Elric, Moonglum, and the men of Imrir were aware of disturbing movements in the atmosphere. But only Elric, with his witch sight, could see a little of what was happening. The Lashha giants were invisible to other eyes. The war engines, which the Amrurians were even now constructing from pre-fashioned parts, were puny things compared to the wind giant's might. But victory depended upon these engines, since the Lashar's fight would be with the supernatural, not the natural. Battle rams and siege ladders were slowly taking shape as the warriors worked with frantic speed. The hour of the storming came closer as the wind rose and thunder rattled. The moon was blanked out by huge billowings of black cloud, and the men worked by the light of torches. Surprise was no great asset in an attack of the kind planned. Two hours before dawn the men were ready. At last, the men of Imrir, Elric, Divim Tvar and Moonglum, riding high at their head, moved towards the castle of Nykorn. As they did so, Elric raised his voice in an unholy shout. The thunder rumbled in answer to him. A great gout of lightning seared out of the sky towards the palace, and the whole place shook and trembled as a ball of mauve and orange fire suddenly appeared over the castle and absorbed the lightning. The battle between fire and air had begun. The surrounding countryside was alive with a weird and malignant shrieking and moaning, deafening to the ears of the marching men. They sensed conflict all around them, and only a little was visible. Over most of the castle an unearthly glow hung, waxing and waning, defending a gibbering wretch of a sorcerer who knew that he was doomed if once the lords of the flame gave way to the roaring wind giants. Elric smiled without humour as he observed the war. On the supernatural plane, he now had little to fear, but there was still the castle, and he had no extra supernatural aid to help him take that. Swordplay and skill in battle was the only hope against the ferocious desert warriors who now crowded the battlements, preparing to destroy the 200 men who came against them. Up rose the dragon standards, their cloth of gold fabric flashing in the eerie glow. Spread out, walking slowly, the sons of Imri had moved forward to do battle. Up also rose the siege ladders as captains directed warriors to begin the assault. The defenders' faces were pale spots against the dark stone and thin shouts came from them, but it was impossible to catch their words. Two great battle rams fashioned the day before, were brought to the vanguard of the approaching warriors. The narrow causeway was a dangerous one to pass over, but it was the only means of crossing the moat at ground level. Twenty men carried each of the great iron-tipped rams, and now they began to run forward while arrows hailed downwards. Their shields protecting them from most of the shafts, the warriors reached the causeway and rushed across it. Now the first ram connected with the gate. It seemed to Elric as he watched this operation that nothing of wood and iron could withstand the vicious impact of the ram. But the gates shivered almost imperceptibly and held. Like vampires hungry for blood, the men howled and staggered aside, crabwise, to let pass the log held by their comrades. Again the gates shivered and more easily noticed this time. But they yet held. Divim Tvar roared encouragement to these now scaling the siege ladders. Those were brave, almost desperate men, for few of the first climbers would reach the top, 
and even if they were successful, they would be hard-pressed to stay alive until their comrades arrived. Boiling lead hissed from great cauldrons set on spindles, so that they could be easily emptied and filled. Many a brave Imrerian warrior fell earthwards, dead from the searing metal before he reached the sharp rocks beneath. Large stones were released out of leather bags hanging from rotating pulleys which could swing out beyond the battlements and rain bone-crushing death on the besiegers. But still the invaders advanced, voicing half a hundred war shouts and steadily scaling their long ladders, whilst their comrades, using a shield barrier still to protect their heads, concentrated on breaking down the gates. Elric and his two companions could do little to help the scalers or the rammers at that stage. All three were hand-to-hand fighters, leaving even the archery to their rear ranks of bowmen who stood in rows and shot their shafts high into the castle defenders. The gates were beginning to give. Cracks and splits appeared in them, ever widening. Then all at once, when hardly expected, the right gate creaked on tortured hinges and fell. A triumphant roar erupted from the throats of the invaders, and dropping their hold on the logs, they led their companions through the breach, axes and maces swinging like scythes and flails before them, and enemy heads springing from necks like wheat from the stalk. The castle's ours, shouted Moonglum, running forward and upward towards the gap in the archway. The castle's taken. Speak not too hastily of victory, replied Divin Tvar. But he laughed as he spoke and ran as fast as the others to reach the castle. And where is your doom now? Elric called to his fellow Melnabonean. Then broke off sharply when Divin Tvar's face clouded and his mouth set grimly. For a moment there was tension between them even as they ran. And then Divim Tvar laughed loud and made a joke of it. Uh, it lies somewhere, Elric, somewhere. But let us not worry about such things, for if my doom hangs over me, I cannot stop its descent when my hour arrives. He slapped Elric's shoulder, feeling for the albino's uncharacteristic confusion. Then they were under the mighty archway, and in the courtyard of the castle where savage fighting had developed into almost single duels, enemy choosing enemy and fighting him to the death. Stormbringer was the first of the three men's blades to take blood and send a desert man's soul to hell. The song it sang as it was lashed through the air in strong strokes was an evil one. Evil and triumphant. The dark-faced desert warriors were famous for their courage and skill with swords, their curved blades were reaping havoc in the Imrerian ranks, for at that stage the desert men far outnumbered the Melnabonean force. Somewhere above the inspired scalers had got a firm foothold on the battlements, and were closing with the men of Nikorn, driving them back, forcing many over the unrailed edges of the parapets. A falling, still screaming warrior plummeted down to land almost on Elric, knocking his shoulder and causing him to fall heavily to the blood and rain-slick cobbles. A badly scarred desert man, quick to see his chance, moved forward with a gloating look on his travesty of a face. The scimitar moved up, poised to hack Elric's neck from his shoulders, and then his helmet split open and his forehead spurted a sudden gout of blood. Divim Tvar wrenched a captured axe from the skull of the slain warrior and grinned at Elric as the albino rose. We'll both live to see victory yet, he shouted over the din of the warring elementals above them and the sound of clashing arms. My doom I will escape until... He broke off. A look of surprise on his fine-boned face. And Elric's stomach twisted inside him as he saw a steel point appear in Divim Tvar's right side. Behind the dragon master, a maliciously smiling desert warrior pulled his blade from Divim Tvar's body. Elric cursed and rushed forward. The man put up his blade to defend himself, backing hurriedly away from the infuriated albino. Stormbringer swung up and then down. It howled a death song and sheared right through the curved steel of Elric's opponent, and it kept on going, straight through the man's shoulder blade, splitting him half in two. Elric turned back to Divim Tvar, who was still standing up, but was 
pale and strained. His blood dripped from his wound and seeped through his garments. How badly are you hurt? Elric asked anxiously. Can you tell? Uh, that troll spawn's sword passed through my ribs, I think. No vitals were harmed. Divimtvar gasped and tried to smile. I'm sure I'd know if he'd made more of a wound. Then he fell. And when Elric turned him, he looked into a dead and staring face. The Dragon Master, Lord of the Dragon Caves, would never tend his beasts again. Arik felt sick and weary as he got up, standing over the body of his kinsman. Because of me, he thought, another fine man has died. But this was the only conscious thought he allowed himself for the meantime. He was forced to defend himself from the slashing swords of a couple of desert men who came at him in a rush. The archers, their work done outside, came running through the breach in the gate, and their arrows poured into the enemy ranks. Elric shouted loudly, My kinsman, Divim Tvar, lies dead, stabbed in the back by a desert warrior. Avenge him, brethren. Avenge the dragon master of Imrir. A low moaning came from the throats of the Malnabonaeans, and their attack was even more ferocious than before. Elric called to a bunch of axemen who ran down from the battlements, their victory assured. You men, follow me. We can avenge the blood that Thalib Kana took. He had a good idea of the geography of the castle. Moonglub shouted from somewhere, One moment, Elric, and I'll join you. A desert warrior fell, his back to Elric, and from behind him emerged a grinning Moonglum, his sword covered in blood from point to pommel. Elric led the way to a small door, set into the main tower of the castle. He pointed at it and spoke to the axemen. Set to with your castles, lads. Set to with your axes, lads, and hurry. Grimly, the axemen began to hack at the tough timber. Impatiently, Elric watched as the wood chips started to fly. The conflict was appalling. Thelibkana sobbed in frustration. Kakatal, the Fire Lord, and his minions were having little effect on the wind giants. Their power appeared to be increasing, if anything. The sorcerer gnawed his knuckles and quaked in his chamber, while below him the human warriors fought, bled, and died. Thelab Khanna made himself concentrate on one thing only, total destruction of the last Ha forces. But he knew somehow even then that sooner or later, in one way or another, he was doomed. The axes drove deeper and deeper into the stout timber. At last it gave... We're through, my lord, one of the X-Men indicated the gaping hole they'd made. Elric reached his arm through the gap and prized up the bar which secured the door. The bar moved upwards and then fell with a clatter to the stone flagging. Elric put his shoulder to the door and pushed. Above them now, two huge, almost human figures had appeared in the sky, outlined against the night. One was golden and glowing like the sun, and seemed to wield a great sword of fire. The other was dark blue and silver, writhing smoke-like with a flickering spear of restless orange in his hand. Misha and Kakatal clashed. The outcome of their mighty struggle might well decide Thalib Khanna's fate. Quickly, Elric said, upwards. They ran up the stairs, which led to Thalib Khanna's chamber. Suddenly the men were forced to stop as they came to a door of jet black, studded with crimson iron. It had no keyhole, no bolts, no bars, but it was quite secure. Elric directed the axemen to begin hewing at it. All six struck at the door in unison. In unison they screamed and vanished. Not even a wisp of smoke remained to mark where they had disappeared. Moonglum staggered backwards, eyes wide in fear. He was backing away from Elric, who remained firmly by the door. Stormbringer throbbing in his hand. Get out, Alric. This is a sorcery of terrible power. Let your friends in the air finish the wizard. Alric shouted half hysterically, Magic is best fought by magic. 
He hurled his whole body behind the blow which he struck at the black door. Stormbringer whined into it, shrieked as if in victory, and howled like a soul-hungry demon. There was a blinding flash, a roaring in Elric's ears, a sense of weightlessness, and then the door had crashed inwards. Moonglum witnessed this. He had remained against his will. Stormbringer has rarely failed me, Moonglum, cried Elric as he leapt through the aperture. Come, we have reached Thelebkana's den. He broke off, staring at the gibbering thing on the floor. It had been a man. It had been Thelebkana. Now it was hunched and twisted, sitting in the middle of a broken pentacle and tittering to itself. Suddenly, intelligence came into its eyes. Too late for vengeance, Lord Elric, it said. I have won, you see. I have claimed your vengeance as my own. Grim-faced and speechless, Elric stepped forward, lifted Stormbringer and brought the moaning rune sword down into the sorcerer's skull. He left it there for several moments. Drink your fill, Hellblade, he murmured. We have earned it, you and I. Overhead, there was a sudden silence. It's untrue. You lie, screamed the frightened man. We were not responsible, Palamo faced the group of leading citizens. Behind the overdressed merchant were his three colleagues, those who had earlier met Elric and Moonglum in the tavern. One of the accusing citizens pointed a chubby finger towards the north in Nykorn's palace. So Nykorn was an enemy of all other traders in Bakshan, that I accept, but now a horde of bloody-handed reavers attack his castle with the aid of demons, and Elric of Malnibane leads them. You know that you were responsible, the gossips all over the city. You employed Elric, and this is what has happened. But we didn't know he would go to such lengths to kill Nykorn. Fat Tomriel wrung his hands, his face aggrieved and afraid. You are wronging us, we only... We're wronging you... Ferrat, spokesman for his fellow citizens, was thick-lipped and florid. He waved his hands in angry desperation. When Elric and his jackals are done with Nikorn, they'll come to the city. Fool, that is what the albino sorcerer planned to begin with. He was only mocking you, for you provided him with an excuse. Armed men we can fight, but not foul sorcery. Well, what shall we do? Bakshan will be raised within the day. Tomriel turned on Palamo. Or oh, this was your idea. You think of a plan. Palamo stuttered. We, we could pay a ransom, bribe them, give them enough money to satisfy them. Well, and who shall give them this money? asked Ferrat. Again the argument began. Elric looked with distaste at Thelab Khanna's broken corpse. He turned away and faced a blanche-featured Moonglum who said hoarsely, Let's in a way now, Elric. Yashana awaits you in Bakshan, as she promised. You must keep your end of the bargain I made for you. Elric nodded wearily. Aye, the Imridians seem to have taken the castle by the sound of it. We'll leave them to their spoiling and get out while we may. Will you allow me a few moments here alone? The sword rejects the soul. Moonglum sighed, thankfully. I'll join you in the courtyard within the quarter hour. I wish to claim some measure of the spoils. He left, clattering down the stairs, while Elric remained standing over the enemy's body. He spread out his arms, the sword dripping blood still in his hand. Divim Tvar, he cried, you and your countrymen have been avenged. Then any evil one who holds the soul of Divim Tvar, release it now and take instead the soul of Thelab Khanna. Within the room, something invisible and intangible, but sensed all the same, flowed and hovered over the sprawled body of Thelab Khanna. 
Elric looked out of the window and thought he heard the beating of dragon wings. Smelled the acrid breath of dragons. Saw a shape winging across the dawn sky, bearing Divim Tvar, the dragon master, away. Elric half smiled. The gods of Malnubane protect thee wherever thou art, he said quietly, turned away from the carnage leaving the room. On the stairway he met Nikorn of Ilmar. The merchant's rugged face was full of anger. He trembled with rage. There was a big sword in his hand. So I found you, he said. I gave you your life and you have done this to me. Elric said tiredly. It was to be. But I gave my word that I would not take your life and believe me I would not, Nikorn, even had I not pledged my word. Nikorn stood two steps from the door, blocking the exit. Then I'll take yours. Come, engage. He moved out into the courtyard, half stumbled over an Enriberian corpse, righted himself and waited, glowering for Elric to emerge. Elric did so, his rune sword sheathed. No. Defend yourself, wolf. Automatically, the albino's right hand crossed to his sword hilt, but he still did not unsheath it. Nikorn cursed and aimed a well-timed blow which barely missed the white-faced sorcerer. He skipped back and now he tugged out Stormbringer, still reluctant and stood poised and weary, waiting for the Bakshanite's next move. Elric intended simply to disarm Nikorn. He did not want to kill or maim this brave man who had spared him when he had been entirely at the other's mercy. Nikorn swung another powerful stroke at Elric and the albino parried. Stormbringer was moaning softly, shuddering and pulsating. Metal clanged, and then the fight was on in full earnest as Nikorn's rage turned to calm, possessed fury. Elric was forced to defend himself with all his skill and power. Though older than the albino and a city merchant, Nikorn was a superb swordsman. His speed was fantastic, and at times Elric was not on the defensive, only because he desired it. Something was happening to the rune blade. It was twisting in Elric's hand and forcing him to make a counterattack. Nikorn backed away, a light akin to fear in his eyes as he realised the potency of Elric's hell-forged steel. The merchant fought grimly, and Elric did not fight at all. He felt entirely in the power of the whining sword which hacked and cut at Nikorn's guard. Stormbringer suddenly shifted in Elric's hand. Nikorn screamed. The rune sword left Elric's grasp and plunged on its own accord towards the heart of his opponent. No, Elric tried to gra- catch hold of his blade, but could not. Stormbringer plunged into Nikorn's great heart and wailed in demoniac triumph. No, Elric got hold of the hilt and tried to pull it from Nikorn. The merchant shrieked in hell brought agony. He should have been dead. He still half lived. It's taking me. The thrice damned thing is taking me. Nikorn gurgled horribly, clutching at the black steel with hands turned to claws. Stop it, Elric, I beg you, please. Elric tried again to tug the blade from Nikorn's heart. He could not. It was rooted in flesh, sinew and vitals. It moaned greedily, drinking into it all that was the being of Nikorn of Ilmar. It sucked the life force from the dying man, and all the while its voice was soft and disgustingly sensuous. Still Elric struggled to pull the sword free. It was impossible. Damn you, he moaned. This man was almost my friend. I gave my word not to kill him. But Stormbringer, though sentient, could not hear its master. Nikorn shrieked once more, the shriek dying to a low, lost whimper. Then his body died. It died, and the soul stuff of Nikorn joined the souls of the countless others, friends, kin and enemies, who had gone to feed that which fed Elric of Malnibane. Elric sobbed. Why is this curse upon me? He collapsed to the ground in the dirt and the blood. 
Minutes later, Moonglum came by his friend, lying face downward. He grasped Elric by his shoulder and turned him. He shuddered when he saw the albino's agony-racked face. What happened? Elric raised himself on one elbow and pointed to where Nikorn's body lay a few feet away. Another Moonglum. Curse this blade. Moonglum said uncomfortably. He would have killed you, no doubt. Do not think about it. Many a word's been broken through no fault of he who gave it. Come, my friend, Yishana awaits us in the tavern of the Purple Dove. Elric struggled upright and began to walk slowly towards the battered gates of the palace where horses awaited them. As they rode for Bakshan, not knowing what was troubling the people of that city, Elric tapped Stormbringer, which hung once more at his side. His eyes were hard and moody, turned inwards on his own feelings. Be wary of this devil blade, Moonglum. It kills the foe, but favours the blood of friends and kinfolk most. Moonglum shook his head quickly as if to clear it, and looked away. He said nothing. Elric made as if to speak again, but then changed his mind. He needed to talk then. But there was nothing to say. Palamo scowled. He stared, hurt-faced, as his slaves struggled with his chests of treasure, lugging them out to pile them in the street beside his great house. In other parts of the city, Palamo's three colleagues were also in various stages of heartbreak. Their treasure, too, was being dealt with in a like manner. The burghers of Bakshan had decided who was to pay any possible ransom. And then a ragged citizen was shambling down the street, pointing behind them and shouting, the albino and his companion at the north gate. The burghers who stood near to Palamo exchanged glances. Farrat swallowed. He said, Elric comes to bargain. Quick, open the treasure chests and tell the city guard to admit him. One of the citizens scurried off. Within a few minutes, while Farrat and the rest were frantic, worked frantically to expose Palamo's treasure to the gaze of the approaching albino, Elric was galloping up the street, Moonglum beside him. Both men were expressionless. They knew enough not to show their puzzlement. What's this? Elric said, casting a look at Palamo. Farat cringed. Treasure, he whined. Yours, Lord Elric, for you and your men. There's much more. No need to use sorcery. No need for your men to attack us. The treasure here is fabulous. Its value enormous. Will you take it and leave the city in peace? Moonglum almost smiled, but controlled his features. Elric said coolly, It will do. I accept it. Make sure this and the rest is delivered to my men at Nikorn's castle, or we'll be roasting you and your friends over open fires by the morrow. Farat coughed suddenly, trembling. As you say, Lord Elric, it shall be delivered. The two men wheeled their horses in the direction of the tavern of the Purple Dove. When they were out of earshot, Moonglum said, From what I gathered back there, it's Master Palamo and his friends who are paying that unasked for toll. Elric was incapable of any real humour, but he half chuckled. I, I'd planned to rob them from the start, and now their own fellows have done it for us. On our way back, we shall take our pick of the spoils. He rode on and reached the tavern. Yashana was waiting there, nervously dressed for travelling. When she saw Elric's face, she sighed with satisfaction and smiled silkily. So Thaleb Kana is dead, she said. Now we can resume our uninterrupted relationship, Elric. The albino nodded. That was my part of the bargain. You kept yours when you helped Moonglum to get my sword back for me. He showed no emotion. She embraced him, but he drew back. Later, he murmured. But that is one promise I shall not break, Yashana. He helped the puzzled woman mount her waiting horse. They rode back towards Palamo's house. She asked, And what of Nikorn? Is he safe? I liked that man. 
He died. Oruk's voice was strained. How? she asked. Because like all merchants, Oruk answered, he bargained too hard. There was an unnatural silence among the three as they made their horses speed faster towards the gates of Bakshan. And Elric did not stop when the others did to take their pick of Palamo's riches. He rode on unseeing, and the others had to spur their steeds in order to keep up with him, two miles beyond the city. Over Bakshan, no breeze stirred in the gardens of the rich. No wind came to blow cool on the sweating faces of the poor. Only the sun blazed in the heavens, round and red. And a shadow, shaped like a dragon, moved across at once, and then was gone. Retaliated, pierced the man's throat, turned slightly and sheared off another's face. They pressed forward, taking the attack to the incensed foe. His left hand, covered with his own blood, Moonglum painfully pulled his long poignard from its sheath and held it with his thumb along the handle, blocked an opponent's swing, closed in and killed him with a ripping upward thrust of the dagger, the action of which caused his wounds to pound with agony. Elric held his great rune sword in both hands and swung it in a semicircle, hacking down the howling, misshapen things. Saratinia darted towards the horses, leapt onto her own and led the other two towards the fighting men. Elric smote at another and got into his saddle, thanking his own forethought to leave the equipment on the horses in case of danger. Moonglum quickly joined him and they thundered out of the clearing. The saddlebags, Moonglum called in greater agony than that created by his wound, we've left the saddlebags. What of it? Don't press your luck, my friend. But all our treasure's in them. Elric laughed, partly in relief, partly from real humour. We'll retrieve them, friend, never fear. I know you, Elric, you've no value for the realities. But even Moonglum was laughing as they left the engaged men enraged men of Orug behind them and slowed to a canter. Auric reached and hugged Saracinia. You have the courage of your noble clan in your veins, he said. Thank you, she replied, pleased with the compliment. But we cannot match such swordsmanship as that displayed by you and Moonglum. It was fantastic. Thank the blade, he said shortly. No, I will thank you. I think you place too much reliance upon that hell weapon, however powerful it is. I need it. But for what? Well, for my own strength. And now, to give strength to you. I'm no vampire, she smiled, and need no such fearful strength as that supplies. Well then, be assured that I do, he told her gravely. You would not love me if the blade did not give me what I need. I am like a spineless sea thing without it. Well, I do not believe that, but I will not dispute with you now. And they rode for a while without speaking. Later they stopped, dismounted, and Saracinia put herbs that Auric had given her upon Moonglum's wounded arm and began to bind it. Auric was thinking deeply. The forest rustled with macabre, sensuous sounds. We're in the heart of Trues, he said, and our intention to skirt the forest has been forestalled. I have it in mind to call on the King of Orug and so round off our visit. Moonglum laughed. Shall we send our swords along first and bind our own hands? His pain was already eased by the herbs which were having quick effect. I mean it. We owe, all of us, much to the men of Orug. They slew Saracinia's uncle and cousins. They wounded you, and now they have our treasure. We have many reasons for asking the king for recompense. Also, they seem stupid. Should be easy to trick. Aye, the king will pay us back for our lack of common sense by tearing our limbs off. I'm in earnest. I think we should go. I'll agree that I'd like our wealth returned to us, but we cannot risk the lady's safety, Elric. 
I am to be Elric's wife, Moonglum, therefore if he visits the King of Org, I shall come too. Moonglum lifted an eyebrow. A quick courtship? Mm, she speaks the truth, however. We shall all go to Org, and sorcery will protect us from the King's uncalled for wrath. And still you wish for death and vengeance, Elric, shrugged Moonglum mounting. Well, it's all the same to me, since your roads, whatever else, are profitable ones. You may be the lord of bad luck by your own reckoning, but you bring good luck to me, I'll say that. No more courting death, smiled Elric, but we'll have some revenge, I hope. Well, Dawn will be with us soon, Moonglum said. The Orgian Citadel lies six hours' ride from here by my working. South southeast by the ancient star, if the map I memorized in Nadsakor was correct. You have an instinct for direction that never fails, Moonglum. Every caravan should have such a man as you. We base an entire philosophy on the stars in Elfwea, Moonglum replied. We regard them as the master plan for everything that happens on Earth. As they revolve around the planet, they see all things, past, present and future. They are our gods. Predictable gods, at least, said Elric, and they rode off towards Auric with light hearts, considering the enormity of their risk. Book Two of The Bane of the Black Sword Kings in Darkness Quoting the Song of Veercad by James Cawthorn Three kings in darkness lie, Gutherin of Org and I, Under a bleak and sunless sky, The third beneath the hill. Chapter 1 Elric, lord of the lost and sundered empire of Melnibane, Rode like a fanged wolf from a trap, All slavering madness and mirth. He rode from Nadzakor, city of beggars, and there was hate in his wake, for he had been recognised as their old enemy before he could obtain the secret he had sought there. Now they hounded him, and the grotesque little man who rode laughing at Elric's side, Moonglum the Outlander, from Elhwer and the unmapped east. The flames of brands devoured the velvet of the night as the yelling, ragged throng pushed their bony nags in pursuit of the pair. Starvelings and tattered jackals that they were, there was strength in their gaudy numbers and long knives and bone bows glinted in the brand light. They were too strong for a couple of men to fight, too few to represent serious danger in a hunt. So Elric and Moonglum had chosen to leave the city without dispute, now sped towards the full and rising moon which stabbed its sickly beams through the darkness to show them the disturbing waters of the Varkalk River, and a chance of escape from the incensed mob. They had half a mind to stand and face the mob, since the Varkalk was their only alternative. But they knew well what the beggars would do to them, whereas they were uncertain what would become of them once they had entered the river. The horses reached the sloping banks of the Varkalk and reared, with hooves lashing, Cursing, the two men spurred the steeds and forced them down into the water. Into the river, the horses plunged, snorting and spluttering. Into the river, which led a roaring course towards the hell-spawned forest of trues, which lay within the borders of Org, country of necromancy and rotting ancient evil. Elric blew water away from his mouth and coughed. Now they'll not follow us to Trues, I think, he shouted at his companion. Moonglum said nothing. He only grinned, showing his white teeth and the unhidden fear in his eyes. The horses swam strongly with the current, and behind them the ragged mob shrieked in frustrated bloodlust, while some of their number laughed and jeered. Let the forest do our work for us. Elric laughed back at them wildly as the horses swam on down the dark, straight river, wide and deep, towards a sun-starved morning, cold and spiky with ice. 
Scattered, slim-peaked crags loomed on either side of the flat plain, through which the river ran swiftly. Green-tinted masses of jutting blacks and browns spread colour through the rocks, and the grass was wavering on the plain as if for some purpose. Through the dawn light, the beggar crew chased along the banks, but eventually gave up their quarry to return, shuddering, but eventually gave up their quarry to return shuddering to Ned Sakor. When they had gone, Elric and Moonglum made their mounts swim towards the banks and climbed them, stumbling to the top where rocks and grass had already given way to sparse forest land, which rose starkly on all sides, staining the earth with sombre shades. The foliage waved jerkily, as if it was alive, sentient. It was a forest of malignantly erupting blooms, blood-coloured and sickly mottled. A forest of bending, sinuously smooth trunks, black and shiny. A forest of spiked leaves with murky purples and gleaming greens. Certainly an unhealthy place if judged only by the odour of rotting vegetation, which was almost unbearable, impinging as it did upon the fastidious nostrils of Elric and Moonglum. Moonglum wrinkled his nose and jerked his head in the direction they'd come. Back now? he inquired. We can avoid trues and cut swiftly across a corner of Org to be in Bakshan in just over a day. What say you, Elric? Elric frowned. I don't doubt they'd welcome us in Bakshan with the same warmth we received in Nadza Kor. They'll not have forgotten the destruction we wrought there, and the wealth we acquired from their merchants. No, I have a fancy to explore fo the forest a little. I've heard tales of Org and its unnatural forest and should like to investigate the truth of them. My blade and sorcery will protect us if necessary. Moonglum sighed. Alric, this once let us not court the danger. Alric smiled icily. His scarlet eyes blazed out of his dead white skin with peculiar intensity. Danger? It can only bring death. Well, death is not to my liking just yet, Moonglum said. The flesh pots of Bakshan, or if you prefer, Yadma, on the other hand. But Elric was already urging his horse onward, heading for the forest. Moonglum sighed and followed. Soon, dark blossoms hid most of the sky, which was dark enough, and they could see only a little way in all directions. The rest of the forest seemed vast and sprawling. They could sense this, though sight of most of it was lost in the depressing gloom. Moonglum recognised the forest from descriptions he had heard from mad-eyed travellers who drank purposefully in the shadows of Nadzakor's taverns. This is the forest of trues, sure enough, he said to Al Alric. It's told of how the doomed folk released tremendous forces upon the earth and caused terrible charges, changes among men, beasts and vegetation. This forest is the last they created and the last to perish. A child will always hate its parents at certain times, Elric said mysteriously. Children of whom to be extremely wary, I should think, Moonglum retorted. Some say that when they were at the peak of their power, they had no gods to frighten them. Hmm. A daring people indeed, Elric replied, with a faint smile. Now they have my respect. Now fear and the gods are back, and that at least is comforting. Moonglum puzzled over this for a short time and then eventually said nothing. He was beginning to feel uneasy. The place was full of malicious rustlings and whispers, though no living animal inhabited it. As far as they could tell, there was a discomforting absence of birds, 
rodents or insects. And though they normally had no love for such creatures, they would have appreciated their company in the disconcerting forest. In a quavering voice, Moonglum began to sing a song in the hope that it would keep his spirits up and his thoughts off the lurking forest. A grin and a word is my trade, from these my profit is made. Though my body's not tall and my courage is small, my fame will take longer to fade. So singing, with his natural amiability returning, Moonglum rode after the man he regarded as a friend, a friend who possessed something akin to mastery over him, though neither admitted it. Elric smiled at Moonglum's song. To sing of one's own lack of size and absence of courage is not an action designed to ward off one's enemies, Moonglum. Yeah, but this way I offer no provocation, Moonglum replied glibly. If I sing of my shortcomings, I am safe. If I were to boast of my talents, then someone might consider this to be a challenge and decide to teach me a lesson. Hmm, true, Elric assented gravely. And well spoken. He began pointing at certain blossoms and leaves, remarking upon their alien tint and texture, referring to them in words which Moonglum could not understand, though he knew the words to be part of a sorcerer's vocabulary. The albino seemed to be untroubled by the fears which beset the Eastlander, but often, Moonglum knew, appearances with Elric could hide the opposite of that which they indicated. They stopped for a short break while Elric sifted through some of the samples he had torn from trees and plants. He carefully placed his prizes in his belt pouch, but would say nothing of why he did so to Moonglum. Come, he said, true's mysteries await us. But then in a new voice, a woman's, said softly from the gloom, Save the excursion for another day, strangers. Elric reined his horse, one hand at Stormbringer's hilt. The voice had had an unusual effect upon him. It had been low, deep, and had for a moment sent the pulse in his throat throbbing. Incredibly, he sensed that he was suddenly standing on one of fate's roads, but where the road would take him he did not know. Quickly he controlled his mind, and then his body, and looked towards the shadows from where the voice had come. "'You are very kind to offer us advice, madam,' he said sternly. "'Come show yourself and give explanation.' She rode then, very slowly, on a black-coated geldling that pranced with a power she could barely restrain. Moonglum drew an appreciative breath, for, although heavy-featured, she was incredibly beautiful. Her face and bearing were patrician. Her eyes were grey-green, combining enigma and innocence. She was very young, for all her obvious womanhood and beauty, Moonglum aged her at seventeen or little more. Elric frowned. Do you ride alone? Well, I do now, she replied, trying to hide her obvious astonishment at the albino's colouring. I need aid. Protection. Men who will escort me safely to Carlark. There they will be paid. Carlark, by the weeping waste. It lies the other side of Ilmiora, a hundred leagues away, in a week's travel at speed. Elric did not wait for her to reply to the statement. We are not hirelings, madam. Well, then you are bound by the vows of chivalry, sir, and you cannot refuse my request. Elric laughed shortly. <laughs> chivalry, madam. We come not from the upstart nations of the south with their strange codes and rules of behaviour. We are nobles of an older stock, whose actions are governed by our own desires. You would not ask what you do if you knew our names. She wetted her full lips with her tongue and said almost timidly, You are... 
Elric of Malnibane, madam, called Elric Woman Slayer in the West. And this is Moonglam of Elfwear. He has no conscience. She said, There are legends. The white faced reaver. The hell driven sorcerer with a blade that drinks the souls of men. Aye, that's true. And however magnified they are with the retelling, they cannot hint those tales at the darker truths which lie in their origin. Now, madam, do you still seek our aid? Alric's voice was gentle, without menace, as he saw that she was very much afraid, although she had managed to control the signs of fear and her lips were tight with determination. I have no choice. I am at your mercy. My father, the senior senator of Carlark, is very rich. Carlark is called the City of the Jade Towers, as you will know, and such rare jades and ambers we have. Many could be yours. Be careful, madam, lest you anger me, warned Elric, although Moonglum's bright eyes lighted with avarice. We are not nags to be hired or goods to be brought. Besides which, he smiled disdainfully, I am from crumbling Imrir, the dreaming city, from the Isle of the Dragon, hub of ancient Malnibane, and I know what beauty really is. Your baubles cannot tempt one who has looked upon the milky heart of Arioch, upon the blinding iridescence that throbs from the ruby throne, of the languorous and unnameable colours in the actorious stone of the Ring of Kings. These are more than jewels, madam. They contain the life stuff of the universe. I apologise, Lord Elric. And to you, Sir Moonglum. Elric laughed, almost with affection. We are but grim clowns, lady, but the gods of luck aided our escape from Nadsakor, and we owe them a debt. We'll escort you to Karlark, city of the Jade Towers, and explore the Forest of Trues another time. Her thanks were tempered with a weary look in her eyes. And now we have made introductions, said Elric. Perhaps you would be good enough to give your name and tell us your story. I am Tsaradzinia from Karlark, daughter of a Vashun, the most powerful clan in southeastern Ilmiora. We have kinsmen in the trading cities on the coasts of Picarade, and I went with two cousins and my uncle to visit them. A perilous journey, Lady Tsaracinia. Aye, and there are not only natural dangers, sir. Two weeks ago we made our goodbyes and began the journey home. Safely, we crossed the Straits of Vilmia, and there employed men-at-arms, forming a strong caravan to journey through Vilmia, and so to Ilmiora. We skirted Nad's core since we had heard that the city of beggars is inhospitable to honest travellers. And here Elric smiled, and sometimes to dishonest travellers, as we can appreciate. Again, the expression of her face showed that she had some difficulty in equating his obvious good humour with his evil reputation. Having skirted Nad's core, she continued, we came this way and reached the borders of Org. Wherein, of course, Trues lies. Very warily we travelled, knowing Dark Org's reputation, along the fringes of the forest. And then we were ambushed, and our hired men-at-arms deserted us. Ambushed, eh? Broke in Moonglum. By whom, madam, do you know? Well, by their unsavoury looks and squat shapes, they seemed natives. They fell upon the caravan, and my uncle and cousins fought bravely, but were slain. One of my cousins slapped the rump of my gelding and sent it galloping so that I could not control it. I heard terrible screams, mad, giggling shouts, and when I had at last brought my horse to a halt, I was lost. Later I heard you approach and waited in fear for you to pass, thinking you were also of Org. But when I heard your accents and some of your speech, I thought that maybe you might help me. 
"'And help you we shall, madam,' said Moonglum, bowing gallantly from the saddle. "'And I am indebted to you for convincing Lord Elric here of your need. "'But for you we should be deep in this awful forest by now "'and experiencing strange terrors, no doubt. "'I offer my sorrow for your dead kinfolk "'and assure you that you will be protected from now onwards "'by more than swords and brave hearts, "'for sorcery can be called up if needs be. "'Now let's hope there'll be no need,' frowned Elric. You talk blithely of sorcery, friend Moonglum, you who hate the art. Moonglum grinned. I was consoling the young lady, Elric, and I've had occasion to be grateful for your horrid powers. I'll admit. Now, I suggest that we make camp for the night, and so refreshed be on our way at dawn. I'll agree to that, said Elric, glancing almost with embarrassment at the girl. Again he felt the pulse in his throat, and this time he had more difficulty in controlling it. The girl also seemed fascinated by the albino. There was an attraction between them which might be strong enough to throw both their destinies along wildly different paths than either had guessed. Night came again quickly, for the days were short in those parts. While Moonglum tended the fire, nervously peering around him, Saracenia, her richly embroidered cloth of gold gown shimmering, shimmering in the firelight, walked gracefully to where Elric sat, sorting the herbs he had collected. She glanced at him cautiously, and then, seeing that he was absorbed, stared at him with open curiosity. He looked up and smiled faintly, his eyes for once unprotected, his strange face frank and pleasant. Some of these are healing herbs, he said, and others are used in summoning spirits. Yet others give unnatural strength to the imbiber, and some turn men mad. They will be useful to me. She sat down beside him, her thick-fingered hands pushing her black hair back. Her small breasts lifted and fell rapidly. Are you really the terrible evil-bringer of the legends, Lord Elric? I find it hard to credit. I have brought evil to many places, he said, but usually there has already been evil to match mine. I seek no excuses, for I know what I am, and I know what I have done. I have slain malignant sorcerers and destroyed oppressors, but I have also been responsible for slaying fine men. And a woman, my cousin whom I loved, I killed, or my sword did. Are you master of your sword? I often wonder. Without it I am helpless. He put his hand around Stormbringer's hilt. I should be grateful to it. Once again his red eyes seemed to become deeper, protecting some bitter emotion rooted at the core of his soul. I am sorry if I have revived an unpleasant recollection. Now, do not feel sorry, Lady Tsaratsenia. The pain is within me, and you did not put it there. In fact, I'd say you relieve it greatly by your presence. Half startled, she glanced at him and smiled. I am no wanton, sir, she said. He got up quickly. Moonglum, is the fire going well? Aye, Elric, she'll stay in for the night. Moonglum cocked his head to one side. It was unlike Elric to make such empty queries, but Elric said nothing further, so the Eastlander shrugged and turned away to check his gear. Since he could think of little else to say, Elric turned and said quietly, urgently, I'm a killer and a thief. Not fit to. Lord Elric, I am... You're infatuated by a legend, that is all. No, if you feel what I feel, you will know it is more. You are too young, but old enough. Beware that I must fulfil my destiny. Your destiny? It is no destiny at all, but an awful thing called doom. And I have no pity except when I see something in my own soul. Then I have pity. And I pity, but I hate to look, and this is part of the doom which drives me. 
not fate, nor the stars, nor men, nor demons, nor gods. Look at me, Tsaritsinia. It is Elric, poor, white, chosen plaything of the gods of time. Elric of Malnibane, who causes his own gradual and terrible destruction. It is suicide. I, I drive myself to slow death, and those who go with me suffer also. Oh, you speak falsely, Lord Elric, from guilt madness. But I am guilty, lady. And does Sir Moonglum go to doom with you? He is unlike the others, indestructible in his own self-assurance. I am confident also, Lord Elric. Yeah, but your confidence is that of youth. It is different. Need I lose it with my youth? When well, you have strength, you are as strong as we are, I'll grant you that. She opened her arms, rising. Then be reconciled, Elric of Maldibane. And he was. He seized her, kissing her with a deeper need than that of passion. For the first time, Simaril of Imrir was forgotten as they lay down, together on the soft turf, oblivious of Moonglum, who polished away at his curved sword with wry jealousy. They all slept and the fire waned. Elric in his joy had forgotten, or not heeded, that he had a watch to take, and Moonglum, who had no source of strength but himself, stayed awake for as long as he could, but sleep overcame him. In the shadows of the awful trees, figures moved with shambling caution. The misshapen men of Ordu began to creep inwards towards the sleepers. Then Elric opened his eyes, aroused by instinct, stared at Saracinia's peaceful face beside him, moved his eyes without turning his head and saw the danger. He rolled over, grasped Stormbringer and tugged the runeblade from its sheath. The sword hummed as if in anger at being awakened. Moonglum, danger! Elric bellowed in fear, for he had more to protect than his own life. The little man's head jerked up. His curved sabre was already across his knees, and he jumped to his feet, ran towards Elric as the men of Org closed in. Apologise. I apologise, he said. My fault, I... And then the men of Org were at them. Elric and Moonglum stood over the girl as she came awake, saw the situation, did not scream. Instead, she looked around for a weapon, but found none. She remained still where she was, the only thing she could do. Smelling like awful, the gibbering creatures, some dozen of them, slashed at Elric and Moonglum with heavy blades like cleavers, long and dangerous. Stormbringer whined and smote through a cleaver, cut into a neck and beheaded the owner. Blood gurgled from the corpse as it slumped back across the fire. Moonglum ducked beneath a howling cleaver, lost his balance, fell, slashed at his opponent's legs and hamstrung him so that he collapsed shrieking. Moonglum stayed on the ground and lunged upwards, taking another in the heart. Then he sprang to his feet and stood shoulder to shoulder with Elric while Tsaritsinia got up behind them. The horses, grunted Elric, if it's safe, try to get them. There were still seven natives standing, and Moonglum groaned as a cleaver sliced flesh from his left arm. Retaliated, pierced the man's throat, turned slightly and sheared off another's face. They pressed forward, taking the attack. Retaliated, pierced the man's throat, turned slightly and sheared off another's face. They pressed forward, taking the attack to the incensed foe. His left hand covered with his own blood, Moonglum painfully pulled his long poignard from its sheath and held it with his thumb along the handle, blocked an opponent's swing, closed in and killed him with a ripping upward thrust of the dagger, the action of which caused his wounds to pound with agony. Elric held his great rune sword in both hands and swung it in a semicircle, hacking down the howling misshapen things. 
Saracinia darted towards the horses, leapt onto her own and led the other two towards the fighting men. Elric smote at another and got into his saddle, thanking his own forethought to leave the equipment on the horses in case of danger. Moonglum quickly joined him and they thundered out of the clearing. The saddlebags, Moonglum called in greater agony than that created by his wound, we've left the saddlebags. What of it? Don't press your luck, my friend. But all our treasure's in them. Elric laughed, partly in relief, partly from real humour. We'll retrieve them, friend, never fear. I know you, Elric, you've no value for the realities. But even Moonglum was laughing as they left the engaged men enraged men of Orug behind them and slowed to a canter. Auric reached and hugged Saracinia. You have the courage of your noble clan in your veins, he said. Thank you, she replied, pleased with the compliment. But we cannot match such swordsmanship as that displayed by you and Moonglum. It was fantastic. Thank the blade, he said shortly. No, I will thank you. I think you place too much reliance upon that hell weapon, however powerful it is. I need it. But for what? Well, for my own strength. And now, to give strength to you. I'm no vampire, she smiled, and need no such fearful strength as that supplies. Well then, be assured that I do, he told her gravely. You would not love me if the blade did not give me what I need. I am like a spineless sea thing without it. Well, I do not believe that, but I will not dispute with you now. And they rode for a while without speaking. Later they stopped, dismounted, and Saracinia put herbs that Auric had given her upon Moonglum's wounded arm and began to bind it. Auric was thinking deeply. The forest rustled with macabre, sensuous sounds. We're in the heart of Trues, he said, and our intention to skirt the forest has been forestalled. I have it in mind to call on the King of Orug and so round off our visit. Moonglum laughed. Shall we send our swords along first and bind our own hands? His pain was already eased by the herbs which were having quick effect. I mean it. We owe, all of us, much to the men of Orug. They slew Saracinia's uncle and cousins. They wounded you, and now they have our treasure. We have many reasons for asking the king for recompense. Also, they seem stupid. Should be easy to trick. Aye, the king will pay us back for our lack of common sense by tearing our limbs off. I'm in earnest. I think we should go. I'll agree that I'd like our wealth returned to us, but we cannot risk the lady's safety, Elric. I am to be Elric's wife, Moonglum. Therefore, if he visits the King of Org, I shall come too. Moonglum lifted an eyebrow. A quick courtship. Mm, she speaks the truth, however. We shall all go to Org, and sorcery will protect us from the King's uncalled-for wrath. And still you wish for death and vengeance, Elric, shrugged Moonglum, mounting. Well, it's all the same to me, since your roads, whatever else, are profitable ones. You may be the lord of bad luck by your own reckoning, but you bring good luck to me, I'll say that. No more courting death, smiled Elric, but we'll have some revenge, I hope. Well, Dawn will be with us soon, Moonglum said. The Orgian Citadel lies six hours' ride from here by my working. South southeast by the ancient star, if the map I memorized in Nadsakor was correct. You have an instinct for direction that never fails, Moonglum. Every caravan should have such a man as you. We base an entire philosophy on the stars in Elfwea, Moonglum replied. We regard them as the master plan for everything that happens on Earth. As they revolve around the planet, they see all things, past, present and future. They are our gods. Predictable gods, at least, said Elric, and they rode off towards Auric with light hearts, considering the enormity of their risk.
Little was known of the tiny kingdom of Org, save that the forest of Trues lay within its boundaries, and to that, other nations felt, it was welcome. The people were unpleasant to look upon, for the most part, and their bodies were stunted and strangely altered. Legend had it that they were the descendants of the doomed folk. Their rulers, it was said, were shaped like normal men in so far as their outward bodily appearance went, but their minds were warped more horribly than the limbs of their subjects. The inhabitants were few, and were generally scattered, ruled by their king from his citadel, which was also called Org. It was for the citadel that Elric and his companions rode, and as they did so, Elric explained how he planned to protect them all from the natives of Org. In the forest he had found a particular leaf, which, when used with certain invocations, which were harmless in that the invoker was in little danger of being harmed by the spirits he marshalled, would invest that person, and anyone else to whom he gave the drug distilled from the leaf, with temporary invulnerability. The spell somehow re-knitted the skin and flesh structure so that it could withstand any edge and almost any blow. Elric explained, in a rare, garrulous mood, how the drug and spell combined to achieve the effect, but his archaicisms and esoteric words meant little to the other two. They stopped an hour's ride from where Moonglum expected to find the citadel so that Elric could prepare the drug and invoke the spell. He worked swiftly over a small fire, using an alchemist's pestle and mortar, mixing the shredded leaf with a little water. As the brew bubbled on the fire, he drew peculiar runes on the ground, some of which were twisted into such alien forms that they seemed to disappear into a different dimension and reappear beyond it. Bone and blood and flesh and sinew, spell and spirit bind anew. Potent potion work the life charm, keep its takers safe from harm. So Elric chanted as a small pink cloud formed in the air over the fire, wavered, reformed into a spiral shape which curled downwards into the bowl. The brew spluttered and then was still. The albino sorcerer said, An old boyhood spell, so simple I'd nearly forgotten it. The leaf for the potion grows only in trues, and therefore it is rarely possible to perform. The brew, which had been liquid, had now solidified, and Alric broke it into small pellets. Too much, he warned, taken at one time, is poison. And yet the effect can last for several hours. Not always, though but we must accept that small risk. He handed both of them a pallet, which they received dubiously. Swallow them just before we reach the citadel, he told them, or in the event of the men of Org finding us first. And then they mounted and rode on again. Some miles to the southeast of Trues, a blind man sang a grim song in his sleep and so woke himself. They reached the brooding citadel of Auric at dusk. Guttural voices shouted at them from the battlements of the square-cut ancient dwelling place of the kings of Auric. The thick rock oozed moisture and was corroded by lichen and sickly mottled moss. The only entrance large enough for a mounted man to pass through was reached by a path almost a foot deep in evil-smelling black mud. What's your business at the royal court of Guthrin the Mighty? They could not see who asked the question. We seek hospitality and an audience with your liege, called Moonglum cheerfully, successfully hiding his nervousness. We bring important news to Org. A twisted face peered down from the battlements. Enter strangers and be welcome, it said, unwelcomingly. The heavy wooden drawgate shifted upwards to allow them entrance, and the horses pushed their way slowly through the mud and so into the courtyard of the citadel. 
Overhead, the grey sky was a racing field of black, tattered clouds which streamed towards the horizon as if to escape the horrid boundaries of Org and the disgusting forest of trues. The courtyard was covered, though not so deeply, with the same foul mud as had impaired their progress to the citadel. It was full of heavy, unmoving shadow. On Alric's right, a flight of steps went up to an arched entrance which was hung, partially, with the same unhealthy lichen he had seen on the outer walls and also in the forest of trues. Through this archway, brushing at the lichen with a pale, beringed hand, a tall man came and stood on the top step, regarding the visitors through heavy-lidded eyes. He was, in contrast to the others, handsome, with a massive leonine head and long hair as white as Elric's, though their hair on the head of this great solid man was somewhat dirty, tangled and unbrushed. He was dressed in a heavy jerkin of quilted embossed leather, a yellow kilt which reached to his ankles, and he carried a wide-bladed dagger naked in his belt. He was older than Elric, aged between forty and fifty, and his powerful if somewhat decadent face was seamed and pockmarked. He stared at them in silence, and did not welcome them. Instead, he signed to one of the battlement guards who caused the drawgate to be lowered. It came down with a crash, blocking off their way of escape. Kill the men and keep the woman, said the massive man in a low monotone. Elric had heard dead men speak in that manner. As planned, Elric and Moonglum stood either side of Tsaritsinia and remained where they were, arms folded. Puzzled, shambling creatures came wearily at them, their loose trousers dragging in the mud, their hands hidden by the long, shapeless sleeves of their filthy garments. They swung their cleavers. Ulrich faint, felt a faint shock as the blade thudded onto his arm, but that was all. Moonglum's experience was similar. The men fell back, amazement and confusion on their bestial faces. The tall man's eyes widened. He put one ring-covered hand to his thick lips, chewing at a nail. Our swords have no effect on them, king. They do not cut and they do not bleed. What are these folk? Ulrich laughed theatrically. We are not common folk, little human, be assured. We are the messengers of the gods and come to your king with a message from our great masters. Do not worry. We shall not harm you, since we are in no danger of being harmed. Stand aside and make us welcome. Eric could see that King Gutherin was puzzled and not absolutely taken in by his words. Eric cursed to himself. He had measured their intelligence by those he had seen. This king, mad or not, was much more intelligent. He was going to be harder to deceive. He led the way up the steps towards Glower and Gutherin. Greetings, King Gutherin. The gods have at last returned to Org and wish you to know this. Org has had no gods to worship for an eternity, said Gutherin hollowly, turning back into the citadel. Why should we accept them now? You are impertinent, King. And you are audacious. How do I know you come from the gods? He walked ahead of them, leading them through the low-roofed halls. You saw that the swords of your subjects had no effect upon us. True. I'll take that incident as proof for the moment. I suppose there must be a banquet in your honour. I shall order it. Be welcome, messengers. His words were ungracious, but... It was virtually impossible to detect anything from Gutherin's tone, since the man's voice stayed at the same pitch. Ulrich pushed his heavy riding cloak back from his shoulders and said lightly, We shall mention your kindness to our masters. The court was a place of gloomy halls and false laughter, and although Ulrich put many questions to Gutherin, the king would not answer them, or did so by means of ambiguous phrases which meant nothing. 
They were not given chambers wherein they could refresh themselves, but instead stood about for several hours in the main hall of the citadel. And Guthrun, while he was with them and not giving orders for the banquet, sat slumped on his throne and chewed at his nails, ignoring them. Pleasant hospitality, whispered Moonglum. Elric, how long will the effects of the drug last? Saracenia had remained close to him. He put his arm around her shoulders. I do not know. Not much longer, but it has served its purpose. I doubt if they will try to attack us a second time. However, be aware of other attempts, subtler ones, upon our lives. The main hall, which had a higher roof than the others, it was completely surrounded by a gallery, which ran around it well above the floor, fairly close to the room, was chilly and unwarmed. No fires burned in the several hearths, which were open and let into the floor, and the walls dripped moisture and were undecorated. Damp, solid stone, time-worn and gaunt. There were not even rushes upon the floor, which was strewn with old bones and pieces of decaying food. Hardly house-proud, are they? commented Moonglum, looking around him with distaste and glancing at brooding Guthrun, who was seemingly oblivious of their presence. A servitor shambled into the hall and whispered a few words to the king. He nodded and arose, leaving the great hall. Soon men came in carrying benches and tables and began to place them about the hall. The banquet was at last due to commence, and the air had menace in it. The three visitors sat together on the right of the king, who had donned a richly jewelled chain of kingship, whilst his son and several pale-faced female members of the royal line sat on the left, unspeaking even among themselves. Prince Hurd, a sullen-faced youth who seemed to bear a resentment against his father, picked at the unappetizing food which was served them all. He drank heavily of the wine which had little flavour but was strong, fiery stuff, and this seemed to warm the company a little. And what do the gods want of us poor folk at Org? Hurd said, staring hard at Saracenia with more than friendly interest. Auric answered, they ask nothing of you but your recognition. In return they will, on occasions, help you. That is all, Hurd laughed. That's more than those from the hill can offer, eh, father? Guthrun turned his great head slowly to regard his son. Yes, he murmured, and the words seemed to carry warning. Moonglum said, The hill? What is that? He got no reply. Instead, a high-pitched laugh came from the entrance of the great hall. A thin, gaunt man stood there, staring ahead with a fixed gaze. His features, though emaciated, strongly resembled Guthrun's. He carried a stringed instrument and plucked at the gut so that it wailed and moaned with melancholy insistence. Heard said savagely, Look, father, tis blind Veerkad, the minstrel, your brother. Shall he sing for us? Sing? Shall he sing songs, father? Guthrun's mouth trembled and twisted, and he said after a moment, He may entertain our guests with a heroic ballad if he wishes. But, but certain other songs he shall not sing, Heard grinned maliciously. He seemed to be tormenting his father deliberately in some way which Elric could not guess. Heard shouted at the blind man, Come, Uncle Veerkad, sing. There are strangers present, said Veerkad hollowly above the wail of his own music. Strangers in Org. Heard giggled and drank more wine. Guthrun scowled and continued to tremble, gnawing at his nails. Elric called, Would appreciate a song, minstrel. Then you'll have the song of the three kings in darkness, strangers, and hear the ghastly story of the kings of Org. No, shouted Guthrun, leaping from his place, but Veerkad was already singing. Three kings in darkness lie, Guthrun of Org and I, 
Under a bleak and sunless sky, the third beneath the hills. When only the third arise, only when another dies. Stop! Guthrun got up in an obviously insane rage and stumbled across the table, trembling in terror. His face blanched, striking at the blind man, his brother. Two blows and the minstrel fell, slumping to the floor and not moving. Take him out and do not let him enter again. The king shrieked and foam flecked his lips. Heard, sober for a moment, jumped across the table, scattering dishes and cups and took his father's arm. Be calm, father, I have a new plan for our entertainment. You seek my throne. T'was you who goaded Veerkad to sing his dreadful song. You know I cannot listen. He stared at the door. One day the legend shall be realised, and the hill king shall come. And then shall I, you, and Auruk perish. Father, Hurd was smiling horribly, let the female visitor dance for us, a dance of the gods. What? Let the woman dance for us, father. Auruk heard him. By now the drug must have worn off. He could not afford to show his hand by offering his companions further doses. He got to his feet. What sacrilege do you speak, prince? Well, we have given you entertainment. It is the custom in Auruk for our visitors to give us entertainment also. The hall was filled with menace. Auruk regretted his plan to trick the men of Org, but there was nothing he could do. He had intended to exact tribute from them in the name of the gods, but obviously these madmen feared more immediate and tangible dangers than any the gods might represent. He had made a mistake, put the lives of his friends in danger as well as his own. What should he do? Saradzinia murmured, I have learned dances in Ilmiora where all ladies are taught the art. Let me dance for them. It might placate them and bedazzle them to make our work easier. Arioch knows our work is hard enough now. I was a fool to have conceived this plan. Very well, Tsaratsinia, dance for them, but with caution. He shouted at Hurd. Our companion will dance for you to show you the beauty that the gods create. Then you must pay the tribute, for our masters grow impatient. The tribute? Butherin looked up. You mentioned nothing of tribute. Well, your recognition of the gods must take the form of precious stones and metals, King Guthrun. I thought you to understand that. You seem more like common thieves than uncommon messengers, my friends. We are poor in all and have nothing to give away to charlatans. Beware of your words, King. Alric's clear voice echoed warningly through the hall. We'll see the dance and then judge the truth of what you've told us. Alric seated himself, grasped Saracinia's hand beneath the table as she arose, giving her comfort. She walked gracefully and confidently into the centre of the hall, and there began to dance. Alric, who loved her, was amazed at her splendid grace and artistry. She danced the old, beautiful dances of Ilmiora, entrancing even the thick-skulled men of Org, and as she danced, a great golden guest cup was brought in. Hurd leaned across his father and said to Alric, The guest cup, Lord, it is our custom that our guests drink from it in friendship. Alric nodded, annoyed at being disturbed in his watching of the wondrous dance, his eyes fixed on Saracinia as she postured and glided. There was silence in the hall. Hurd handed him the cup and absently he put it to his lips, seeing the Saracinia danced onto the table and began to weave along it to where Elric sat. As he took the first sip, Saracinia cried out and with her foot knocked the cup from his hand. The wine splashed on Guthrun and Hurd, who half rose startled. It was drugged to Elric, they drugged it. Hurd lashed at her with his hand, striking her across the face. She fell from the table and lay moaning slightly on the filthy floor. Bitch, would the messengers of the gods be harmed by a little drugged wine? 
Enraged, Elric pushed aside Guthrin and struck savagely at her so that the young man's mouth gushed blood. But the drug was already having effect. Guthrin shouted something and Moonglum drew his sabre, glancing upwards. Elric was swaying. His senses were jumbled, and the scene had an unreal quality. He saw servants grasp Saracenia, but could not see how Moonglum was faring. He felt sick and dizzy, could hardly control his limbs. Summoning up his last remaining strength, Alric clubbed Hurd down with one tremendous blow. Then he collapsed into unconsciousness. There was the cold clutch of chains about his wrists, and a thin drizzle was falling directly onto his face, which stung where Hurd's nails had ripped it. He looked about him. He was chained between two stone meniers upon an obvious burial barrow of gigantic size. It was night, and a pale moon hovered in the heavens above him. He looked down at the group of men below, Hurd and Guthrin were among them. They grinned at him mockingly. Well, farewell, messenger. You will serve as a good purpose and placate the ones from the hill. Hurd called out as he and the others scurried back towards the citadel which lay silhouetted a short distance away. Where was he? What had happened to Zarazinia and Moonglum? Why had he been chained upon the hill thus? Realisation and remembrance came to him. The hill. He shuddered, helpless in the strong chains which held him. Desperately he began to tug at them, but they would not yield. He searched his brain for a plan, but he was confused by torment and worry for his friend's safety. He heard a dreadful scuttling sound from below and saw a ghastly white shape dart into the gloom. Wildly he struggled in the rattling iron which held him. In the great hall of the citadel, a riotous celebration was now reaching the state of an ecstatic orgy. Guthrin and Hurd were totally drunk, laughing insanely at their victory. Outside the hall, Veerkad listened and hated. Particularly he hated his brother, the man who had deposed and blinded him to prevent his study of sorcery by means of which he had planned to raise the king from beneath the hill. Time has come at last, he whispered to himself, and stopped a passing servant. Tell me, where is the girl kept? In Guthrin's chamber, master. Vekad released the man and began to grope his way through the gloomy corridors up twisting steps until he reached the room he sought. Here he produced a key, one of the many he'd made without Guthrin's knowledge, and unlocked the door. Tsaratzinia saw the blind man enter and could do nothing. She was gagged and bound with her own dress and still dazed from the blow Hurd had given her. They had told her of Alric's fate, but Moonglum had so far escaped them. Guards hunted him now in the stinking corridors of Org. I've come to take you to your companion, lady, smiled blind Veerkad, grasping her roughly with strength that his insanity had given him. Picked her up and fumbled his way towards the door. He knew the passages of Auruk perfectly, for he had been born and grown up among them. But two men were in the corridor outside Guthrin's chambers. One of them was Hurd, Prince of Auruk, who resented his father's appropriation of the girl and desired her for himself. He saw Veerkad bearing the girl away and stood silent while his uncle passed. The other man was Moonglum, who observed what was happening from the shadows where he had hidden from the searching guards. As Hurd followed Veerkad on cautious feet, Moonglum followed him. Veerkad went out of the citadel by a small side door, carried his living burden towards the looming burial hill. 
All about the foot of the monstrous barrow swarmed the leprous white ghouls who sensed the presence of Elric, the folk of Org's sacrifice to them. Now Elric understood. These were the things that Org feared more than the gods. These were the living, dead ancestors of those who now reveled in the Great Hall. Perhaps these were actually the doomed folk. Was that their doom? Never to rest? Never to die? Just to degenerate into mindless ghouls? Elric shuddered. Now desperation brought back his memory. His voice was an agonised wail to the brooding sky and the pulsing earth. Arioch! Destroy the stones. Save your servant. Arioch, master! Aid me to destroy them. The earth trembled and the sky became overcast, hiding the moon, but not the white-faced, bloodless ghouls who are now almost upon him. And then a ball of fire formed in the sky above him, and the very sky seemed to shake and sway around it. Then with a roaring crash, two bolts of lightning slashed down, pulverizing the stones and releasing Elric. He got to his feet, knowing that Ariok would demand his price as the first ghouls reached him. He did not retreat, but in his rage and desperation leapt among them, smashing and flailing with the lengths of chain. The ghouls fell back and fled, gibbering in fear and anger, down the hill and into the barrow. Arik could now see that there was a gaping entrance to the barrow below him, black against the blackness. Breathing heavily, he found that his belt pouch had been left him. From it, he took a length of slim gold wire and began frantically to pick at the locks of the manacles. Veerkad chuckled to himself. In Saratinia, hearing him was almost mad with terror. He kept drooling the words into her ear. When shall the third arise? Only when the other dies. When that other's blood flows red. We'll hear the footfalls of the dead. You and I, we shall resurrect him. Such vengeance will he wreak upon my cursed brother. And your blood, my dear, will be that which released him. He felt that the ghouls were gone and judged them placated by their feast. Your love has been useful to me. He laughed as he began to enter the barrow. The smell of death almost overpowered the girl as the blind madman bore her downwards into the heart of the hill. Heard, sobered after his walk in the colder air, was horrified when he saw where Veerkad was going. The barrow, the Hill of the King, was the most feared spot in the land of Org. Heard paused before the black entrance and turned to run. And then suddenly he saw the form of Elric, looming huge and bloody, descending the barrow slope, cutting off his escape. With a wild yell, he fled into the hill passage. Elric had not previously noticed the prince, but the yell startled him and he tried to see who had given it. But he was too late. He began to run down the steep incline towards the entrance of the barrow. Another figure came scampering out of the darkness. Elric, thank the stars and all the gods of Earth you live. Thank Ariok, Moonglum. And where's Zaratinia? In there, the mad minstrel took her with him and Heard followed. They are all insane, these kings and princes. I see no sense to their actions. Ah, I have an idea that the minstrel means Saracenia no good. Quickly we must follow. By the stars, the stench of death. I have breathed nothing like it. Not even at the great battle of the Eshmir Valley, where the armies of Elfwe met those of Kaleg Vogon, usurper prince of the Tanghensi. Half a million corpses strewed the valley from end to end. If you've no stomach, pff, I wish I had none. 
would not be so bad. Come on. They rushed into the passage, led by the faraway sounds of Veerkad's maniacal laughter and the somewhat nearer movements of a fear-maddened herd, who was now trapped between two enemies, and yet more afraid of a third. Hers blundered along in the willed blackness, sobbing to himself in his terror. In the phosphorescent central tomb, surrounded by the mummified corpses of his ancestors, Veerkad chanted the resurrection ritual before the great coffin of the Hill King. A giant thing, half as tall again as Veerkad, who was tall enough, Veerkad was forgetful for his own safety and thinking only of vengeance upon his brother Gutherin. He held a long dagger over Tsaritsinia, who lay huddled and terrified upon the ground near the coffin. The spilling of Tsaritsinia's blood would be the culmination of the ritual. And then... Then hell would quite literally be let loose, or so Veerkad planned. He finished his chanting and raised the knife, just as Hurd came screeching into the central tomb with his own sword drawn. Veerkat swung round, his blind face working in thwarted rage. Savagely, without stopping for a moment, Hurd ran his sword into Veerkad's body, plunging the blade up to the hilt, so that its bloody point appeared sticking from his back. But the other, in his groaning death spasms, locked his hands about the prince's throat, locked them immovably. Somehow the two men retained a semblance of life, and, struggling with each other in a macabre death dance, swayed about the glowing chamber. The coffin of the Hill King began to tremble and shake slightly, a movement hardly perceptible. So Elric and Moonglum found Veerkad and Hurd. Seeing that both were near dead, Elric raced across the central tomb to where Tsaritsinia lay, unconscious, mercifully, from her ordeal. Elric picked her up and made to return. He glanced at the throbbing coffin. Quickly, Moonglum, that blind fool has invoked the dead, I can tell. Hurry, my friend, for the hosts of hell are upon us. Moonglum gasped and followed Elric as he ran back towards the cleaner air of night. Where to now, Elric? We'll have to risk going back to the citadel. Our horses are there and our goods. We need the horses to take us quickly away, for I fear there's going to be a terrible bloodletting soon, if my instinct is right. There should not be too much opposition, Elric. They were all drunk when I left. That was how I managed to evade them so easily. By now, if they continue drinking as heavily as when last I saw them, they'll be unable to move at all. Well, then let's make haste. They left the hill behind them, began to run towards the citadel. Moonglum had spoken truth. Everyone was lying about the great hall in drunken sleep. Open fires had been lit in the hearths, and they blazed, sending shadows skipping around the hall. Elric said softly, Moonglum, Go with Saratinia to the stables and prepare our horses. I will settle our debt with Gutherin first. He pointed. See, they have heaped their booty upon the table, gloating in their apparent victory. Stormbringer lay upon the pile of burst sacks and saddlebags which contained the loot stolen from Saratinia's uncle and cousins, and from Elric and Moonglum. Saratinia, now conscious but confused, left with Moonglum to locate the stables, and Elric picked his way towards the table, across the sprawled shapes of drunken men of Org, around the blazing fires. Then caught up, thankfully, his hell-forged rune blade. Then he leapt over the table and was about to grasp Guthrin, who still had his fabulously gemmed chain of kingship around his neck when the great doors of the hall crashed open, and a howling blast of icy air sent the torches dancing and leaping. Elric turned, Guthrin forgotten, and his eyes widened. 
Framed in the doorway stood the king from beneath the hill. The long-dead monarch had been raised by Veerkad, whose own blood had completed the work of resurrection. He stood in rotting robes, his fleshless bones covered by tight, tattered skin. His heart did not beat, for he had none. He drew no breath, for his lungs had been eaten by the creatures which feasted on such things. But horribly, he lived. King from the Hill He had been the last great ruler of the doomed folk who had in their fury destroyed half the earth and created the forest of trues. Behind the dead king crowded the ghastly host who had been buried with him in a legendary past. The massacre began. What secret vengeance was being reaped, Elric could only guess at, but whatever the reason, the danger was still very real. Elric pulled out Stormbringer as the awakened horde vented their anger upon the living. The hall became filled with the shrieking, horrified screams of the unfortunate Orgians. Elric remained half paralysed in his horror beside the throne. Elric remained half paralysed in his horror. Aroused, Guthrun woke up and saw the king from the hill and his host. He screamed almost thankfully, At last I can rest. And fell dying in a seizure, robbing Elric of his vengeance. Veerkad's grim song echoed in Elric's memory. The three kings in darkness... Guthrun, Veerkad, and the king from beneath the hill. Now only the last lived, and he had been dead for millennia. The king's cold, dead eyes roved the hall and saw Guthrun sprawled upon the throne, the ancient chain of office still about his throat. Elric wrenched it off the body and backed away as the king from beneath the hill advanced, and then his back was against a pillar, and there were feasting ghouls everywhere else. The dead king came nearer, and then, with a whistling moan which came from the depths of his decaying body, launched himself at Elric, who found himself fighting desperately against the hill king's clawing abnormal strength, cutting at flesh that neither bled nor suffered pain. Even the sorceress Runeblade could do nothing against this horror that had no soul to take and no blood to let. Frantically, Elric slashed and hacked at the Hill King, but ragged nails raked his flesh and the teeth snapped at his throat. And above everything came the almost overpowering stench of death as the ghouls packed the great hall with their horrible shapes, feasted on the living and the dead. Then Elric heard Moonglum's voice calling and saw him upon the gallery which ran around the hall. He held a great oil jar. Lure him close to the central fire, Elric. There may be a way to vanquish him. Quickly, man, or you're finished. In a frantic burst of energy, the Malnabonean forced the giant king towards the flames. Around them, the ghouls fed off the remains of their victims, some of whom still lived, their screams calling hopelessly over the sound of carnage. The hill king now stood, unfeeling with his back to the leaping central fire. He still slashed at Elric. Moonglum hurled the jar. It shattered upon the stone hearth, spraying the king with blazing oil. He staggered, and Elric struck with his full power, the man and the blade combining to push the hill king backwards. Down went the king into the flames, and the flames began to devour him. A dreadful, lost howling came from the burning giant as he perished. Flames licked everywhere throughout the great hall, and Soon the place was like hell itself, an inferno of licking fire through which the ghouls ran about, still feasting, unaware of their destruction. The way to the door was blocked. Eric stared around him and saw no way of escape, save one. Sheathing Stormbringer, he ran a few paces and leapt upwards, just grasping the rail of the gallery as flames engulfed the spot where he had been standing. Moonglum reached down and helped, to clamber acro- helped him to clamber across the rail. I'm disappointed, Elric, he grinned. You forgot to bring the treasure. 
Alric showed him what he had grasped in his left hand, the jewel-encrusted chain of kingship. This bauble is some reward for our hardship, he smiled, holding up the glittering chain. I stole nothing by Arioch. There are no kings left in Org to wear it. Come, let's join Zaratzinia and get our horses. They ran from the gallery as masonry began to crash downwards into the great hall. They rode fast away from the halls of Org and, looking back, saw great fissures appear in the walls and heard the roar of destruction as the flames consumed everything that had been Org. They destroyed the seat of the monarchy, the remains of the three kings in darkness, the present and the past. Nothing would be left of Org save an empty burial mound and two corpses locked together, lying where their ancestors had lain for centuries in the central tomb. They destroyed the last link with the previous age and cleansed the earth of an ancient evil. Only the dreadful forest of trues remains to mark the coming and the passing of the doomed folk. And the forest of trues was a warning. Weary and yet relieved, the three saw the outlines of trues in the distance, behind the blazing funeral pyre. And yet, in his happiness, Elric had a fresh problem on his mind now that the danger was past. Why do you frown frown now, love? asked Saratinia. Because I think you spoke the truth. Remember, you said I placed too much reliance on my rune blade here. Yes, and I said I would not dispute it with you. Agreed. But I have a feeling that you were partially right. On the burial mound and in it, I did not have Stormbringer with me. And yet I fought and won because I feared for your safety. His voice was quiet. Perhaps in time I can keep my strength, by means of certain herbs I found in Trues and dispense with the blade forever. Moonglum shouted with laughter hearing these words. Alric, I never thought I'd witness this. You daring to think of dispensing with that foul weapon of yours? I don't know if you ever shall, but the thought is comforting. It is, my friend, it is. He leaned in his saddle and grasped Saracenia's shoulders, pulling her dangerously towards him as they galloped without slackening speed. And as they rode, he kissed her, heedless of their pace. A new beginning, he shouted above the wind. A new beginning, my love. And then they all rode, laughing, towards Kalak, by the weeping waste, to present themselves, to enrich themselves, and to attend the strangest wedding the northern lands had ever witnessed. Book 3, The Flamebringers, in which Moonglum returns from the Eastlands with disturbing news. Bloody beaked hawks soared on the frigid wind. They soared high above a mounted horde, inexorably moving across the weeping waste. The horde had crossed two deserts and three mountain ranges to be there, and hunger drove them onwards. They were spurred on by remembrances of stories heard from travellers who had come to their eastern homelands by the encouragements of their thin-lipped leader who swaggered in his saddle ahead of them, one arm wrapped around a ten-foot lance decorated with the gory trophies of his pillaging campaigns. The riders moved slowly and wearily, unaware that they were nearing their goal. Far behind the horde, a stocky rider left elsewhere, the singing, boisterous capital of the eastern world, and came soon to a valley. The hard skeletons of trees had a blighted look, and the horse kicked earth the colour of ashes as its rider drove it fiercely through the sick wasteland that had once been gentle Eshmere, the golden garden of the east. A plague had smitten Eshmere, and the locust had stripped her of her beauty. Both plague and locust went by the same name, Tehran Gashtek, Lord of the Mountain Hordes, sunken-faced carrier of destruction. 
Taran Gashtek, insane blood drawer, the shrieking flamebringer. And that was his other name, Flamebringer. The writer who witnessed the evil that Taran Gashtek had brought to gentle Eshmir was named Moonglum. Moonglum was riding now for Karlark by the Weeping Waste, the last outpost of the Western civilization of which those in the Eastlands knew little. In Kalark, Moonglum knew he would find Elric of Malnibane, who now dwelt permanently in his wife's graceful city. Moonglum was desperate to reach Karlark quickly, to warn Elric and to solicit his help. He was small and cocky, with a broad mouth and a shock of red hair. But now his mouth did not grin, and his body was bent over the horse as he pushed it on towards Karlark. For Eshmir, gentle Eshmir, had been Moonglum's home province, and with his ancestors had formed him into what he was. So, cursing, Moonglum rode for Karlark. But so did Tiran Gashtek, and already the Flamebringer had reached the Weeping Waste. The horde moved slowly, for they had wagons with them, which at one time dropped far behind, but now the supplies they carried were needed. As well as provisions, one of the wagons carried a bound prisoner who lay on his back, cursing Tehran Gashtek and his slant-eyed battle-mongers. Drinaj Bara was bound by more than strips of leather, and that was why he cursed, for Drinaj Bara was a sorcerer who could not normally be held in such a manner. If he had not succumbed to his weakness for wine and woman just before the flamebringer had come down on the town in which he was staying, he would not have been trussed so and Tehran Gashtek would not now have Drinaj Bara's soul. Drinaj Bara's soul reposed in the body of a small black cat, the cat which Tehran Gashtek had caught and carried with him always, for, as was the habit of eastern sorcerers, Drinaj Bara had hidden his soul in the body of the cat for protection. Because of this, he was now slave to the lord of the mountain's hordes, and had to obey him, lest the man slay the cat, and so send his soul to hell. It was not a pleasant situation for the proud sorcerer, but he did not deserve less. There was on the pale face of Elric of Malnibane some slight trace of an earlier haunting, but his mouth smiled, and his crimson eyes were at peace as he looked down at the young black-haired woman with whom he walked in the terraced gardens of Kalark. Elric, said Zaratsinia, have you found your happiness? He nodded. I think so. Stormbringer now hangs amid cobwebs in your father's armoury. The drugs I discovered in Trues keep me strong. My eyesight clear, and need to be taken only occasionally. I need never think of travelling or fighting again. I am content here to spend my time with you and study the books in Kalark's library. What more would I require? You compliment me over much, my lord. I would become complacent. He laughed. Rather that than you were doubting. Do not fear, Tsaratsinia. I possess no reason now to journey on. Moonglum I miss, but it was natural that he should become restless of residence in a city and wish to revisit his homeland. I'm glad you're at peace, Elric. My father was at first reluctant to let you live here, fearing the black evil that once accompanied you. But three months have proved to him behind... The, the evil has gone and left no fuming berserker with it. Suddenly there came a shouting from below them. In the street a man's voice was raised and he banged at the gates of the house. Let me in, damn you, I must speak with your master. A servant came running. Lord Elric, there is a man at the gates with a message. He pretends friendship with you. 
his name. An alien one, Moonglum, he says. Moonglum? His stay in Elwhere has been short. Let him in. Saracinia's eyes held a trace of fear. She held Alric's arm fiercely. Alric, pray he does not bring news to take you hence. Well, no news could do that. Fear not, Saracinia. He hurried out of the garden and into the courtyard of the house. Moonglum rode hurriedly through the gates, dismounting as he did so. Moonglum, my friend, why the haste? Naturally, I'm pleased to see you after such a short time, but you've been riding hastily. Why? The little Eastlander's face was grim beneath its coating of dust, and his clothes were filthy from hard riding. The flamebringer comes with sorcery to aid him, he panted. You must warn the city. Flamebringer? The name means nothing. You sound delirious, my friend. Aye, it's true I am, delirious with hate. He destroyed my homeland, killed my family, my friends, and now plans conquest in the West. Two years ago, he was little more than an ordinary desert raider, but then he began to gather a great horde of barbarians around him, and has been looting and slaying his way across the eastern lands. Only Elhwer has not suffered from his attacks, for the city was too great for even him to take. But he has turned 2,000 miles of pleasant country into a burning waste. He plans world conquest, rides westward with 500,000 warriors. You mentioned sorcery. What does this barbarian know of such sophisticated arts? Little himself, but he has one of our greatest wizards in his power, Drinage Bara. The man was captured as he lay drunk between two wenches in a cavern in Foom. He had put his soul into the body of a cat so that no rival sorcerer might steal it while he slept. But Taran Gashtek, the flamebringer, knew of this trick, seized the cat and bound its legs, eyes and mouth, so imprisoning Drenage Bara's evil soul. And now the sorcerer is his slave. If he does not obey the barbarian, the cat will be killed by an iron blade, and Drenage Bara's soul will go to hell. Now these are unfamiliar sorceries to me, said Alric. They seem little more than superstitions. Well, who knows what they may be, but so long as Drenage Bara believes what he believes, he will do as Taran Geshtak dictates. Several proud cities have become destroyed with the aid of his magic. And how far away is this flame bringer? Three days' ride at most. I was forced to come hence by a longer route to avoid his outriders. Well, then we must prepare for a siege. <laughs> no, Alric, you must prepare to flee. To flee? Should I request the citizens of Kalak to leave their beautiful city unprotected, to leave their homes? If they will not, you must, and take your bride with you. None can stand against such a foe. Well, my own sorcery is no mean thing. One man's sorcery is not enough to hold back half a million men also aided by sorcery. And Kalak is a trading city, not a warrior's fortress. Very well. I will speak to the, to the council of elders. Try to convince them. Well, you must convince them quickly, Alric, for if you do not, Kalak will not stand half a day before Teran Gashtek's howling blood letters. They are stubborn, said Alric, as the two sat in his private study later that night. They refuse to realise the magnitude of the danger. They refuse to leave, and I cannot leave them, for they have welcomed me and made me a citizen of Karlark. Then we must stay here and die? Perhaps. There seems to be no choice. But I have another plan. You say that the sorcerer is a prisoner of Turan Gashtek. What would he do if he regained his soul? Why, he would take vengeance upon his captor. But Taran Gashtek would not be so foolish as to give him the chance. There is no help for us there. And what if we managed to aid Drinage Bara? How? It would be impossible. Well, it seems our only chance. Does this barbarian know of me or my history? Not as far as I know. 
Would he recognise you? Why would he? Well, then I suggest we join him. <laughs> join him? Elric, you are no more sane than when we rode as free travellers together. I know what I am doing. It would be the only way to get close to him and discover a subtle way to defeat him. We will set off at dawn. There is no time to waste. Very well, but let's hope your old luck is good. I doubt it now, for you've forsaken your old ways, and the luck went with them. Let us find out. Will you take Stormbringer? I had hoped never to have to make use of that Hellforged blade again. She's a treacherous sword at best. Aye, but I think you'll need her in this business. Yes, you are right. I'll take her. Ulrich frowned, his hands clenched. It will mean breaking my word to Tsaritsinia. Better to break it than to give her up to the mounted hordes. Ulrich unlocked the door to the armory, a pitch torch flaring in one hand. He felt sick as he strode down the narrow passage lined with dulled weapons which had not been used for a century. His heart pounded heavily as he came to another door and flung off the bar to enter the little room in which lay the disused regalia of Karlark's long-dead war chieftains and Stormbringer. The black blade began to moan as if welcoming him, welcoming him as he took a deep breath of the musty air and reached for the sword. He clutched the hilt and his body was racked by an unholy sensation of awful ecstasy. His face twisted as he sheathed the blade and he almost ran from the armory towards cleaner air. Elric and Moonglum mounted their plainly equipped horses and, garbed like common mercenaries, bade urgent farewell to the councillors of Karlag. Saracenia kissed Elric's pale hand. I realise the need for this, she said, her eyes full of tears. But take care, my love. I shall, and pray that we are successful in whatever we decide to do. The white gods be with you. No, pray to the lords of the darks, for it is their evil help I'll need in this work. Forget not my words to the messenger who is to ride to the southwest and find Divim Slorm. I'll not forget, she said, though I worry lest you succumb again to your old black ways. Uh, fear for the moment. I'll worry about my own fate later. Then farewell, my lord, and be lucky. Farewell, Saracenia. My love for you will give me more power even than this foul blade here. He spurred his horse through the gates, and then they were riding for the weeping waste and a troubled future. Dwarfed by the vastness of the softly turfed plateau which was the weeping waste, in the place of eternal rains, the two horsemen drove their hard-pressed steeds through the drizzle. A shivering desert warrior, huddled against the weather, saw them come towards him. He stared through the rain, trying to make out details of the riders, then wheeled his stocky pony and rode swiftly back in the direction he had come. Within minutes he had reached a larger group of warriors, attired like himself in furs and tasseled iron helmets. They carried short bone bows and quivers of long arrows fletched with hawk feathers. There were curved scimitars at their sides. He exchanged a few words with his fellows, and soon they were all lashing their horses towards the two riders. How much further lies the camp of Terra and Gashtek, Moonglum? Elric's words were breathless, for both men had ridden for a day without halt. Not much further, Elric. We should be... Now look. Moonglum pointed ahead. About ten riders came swiftly towards them. Desert barbarians... The Flamebringers men, prepare for a fight. They won't waste time parleying. Stormbringer scraped from the scabbard, 
and the heavy blade seemed to aid Elric's wrist as he raised it, so that it felt almost weightless. Moonglum drew both his swords, holding the short one with the same hand with which he grasped his horse's reins. The eastern warriors spread out in a half-circle as they rode down on the companions, yelling wild war shouts. Elric reared his mount to a savage standstill and met the first rider with Stormbringer's point, full in the man's throat. There was a stink like brimstone as it pierced flesh, and the warrior drew a ghastly choking breath as he died, his eyes staring out in full realisation of his terrible fate, for Stormbringer drank souls as well as blood. Elric cut savagely at another desert man, lopping off his sword arm and splitting his crested, ha- crest, his crested helm and the skull beneath. Rain and sweat ran down his white, taut features into his glowing crimson eyes, but he blinked it aside, half fell in his saddle as he turned to defend himself against another howling scimitar, parried the sweep, slid his own rune blade down its length, turned the blade with a movement of his wrist and disarmed the warrior. And then he plunged his sword into the man's heart, and the desert warrior yelled like a wolf at the moon, a long, baying shout before Stormbringer took his soul. Elric's face was twisted in self-loathing as he fought intently with superhuman strength. Moonglum stayed clear of the albino sword, for he knew its liking for the taking of lives of Elric's friends. Soon only one opponent was left. Elric disarmed him and had to hold his own greedy sword back from the man's throat. Reconciled to the horror of his death, the man said something in a guttural language which Elric half recognised. He searched his memory and realised that it was a language close to one of the many ancient tongues which as a sorcerer he had been required to learn years before. He said in the same language, Thou art one of the warriors of Terran Gashtek, the Flamebringer. That is true, and you must be the white-faced evil one of legends. I beg you to slay me with a cleaner weapon than that which you hold. Well, I do not wish to kill thee at all. We were coming hence to join Terran Gashtek. Take us to him. The man nodded hastily and clambered back on his horse. Who are you that speaks the high tongue of our people? I am called Elric of Malnibane. Dost thou know the name? The warrior shook his head. No, but the high tongue has not been spoken for generations save by shamans. Yet you're no shaman. But by your dress you seem a warrior. We are both mercenaries, but speak no more. I'll explain the rest to thy leader. They left a jackal's feast behind them and followed the quaking Easterner in the direction he led them. Fairly soon the low-lying smoke of many campfires could be observed, and at length they saw the sprawling camp of the barbarian warlord's mighty army. The camp encompassed over a mile of the Great Plateau. The barbarians had erected skin tents on rounded frames, and the camp had the aspect of a large primitive town. Roughly in the centre was a much larger construction, decorated with a motley assortment of gaudy silks and brocades. Moonglum said in a western tongue, That must be Terran Gashtek's dwelling. See, he has covered it, half-cured hides with a score of eastern battle flags. His face grew grimmer as he noted the torn standard of Eshmir, the lion flag of Okara, and the blood-soaked penance of sorrowing Chang Shai. The captured warrior led them through the squatting ranks of barbarians who stared at them impassively and muttered to one another. Outside Terran Gashtek's tasteless dwelling was his great war lance decorated with more trophies and his conquests, the skulls and bones of eastern princes and kings. Auric said, Such a one as this must not be allowed to destroy the reborn civilization of the young kingdoms. Young kingdoms are resilient, remarked Moonglum, but it is when they are old that they fall. 
and it is often Tehran Gashtek's kind that tear them down. And while I live, he shall not destroy Karlark, nor reach as far as Bakshan. Moonglam said, though in my opinion he'd be welcome to Ned Sakor. The city of beggars deserves such visitors as the Flamebringer. If we fail Elric, only the sea will stop him, and perhaps not that. With Divim Slorm's age, we will stop him. Let us hope Karlak's messenger finds my kinsman soon. If he does not, we shall be hard put to fight off half a million warriors, my friend. The barbarian shouted, O oh, conqueror, mighty flamebringer, there are men here who wish to speak with you. A slurred voice snarled, Bring him in. They entered the badly smelling tent, which was lighted by a fire flickering in a circle of stones. A gaunt man, carelessly dressed in bright, captured clothing, lounged on a wooden bench. There were several women in the tent, one of whom poured wine into a heavy golden goblet, which he held out. Tehran Gashtek pushed the woman aside, knocking her sprawling and regarding the newcomers. His face was almost as fleshless as the skulls hanging outside his tent. His cheeks were sunken, and his slanting eyes narrow beneath thick brows. Who are these? The Lord I know not, but between them they slew ten of our men and would have slain me. You deserve no more than death if you let yourself be disarmed. Get out and find a new sword quickly, or I'll let the shamans have the vitals for divination. The man slunk away. Tehran Gashtek seated himself upon the bench once more. So you slew ten of my bloodletters, did you? Come here to boast to me about it. What's the explanation? We but defended ourselves against your warriors. We sought no quarrel with them. Elric now spoke the cruder tongue as best he could. You defended your lives fairly well, I grant you. We reckon three soft-living house-dwellers to one of us. You're a westerner, I can tell that, though your silent friend has the face of an elf where I... Have you come from the east or the west? The west, Elric said. We are free-travelling warriors, hiring our swords to those who will pay or... Promise us good booty. You're all western warriors as skillful as you. Tehran Gashtek could not hide his sudden realisation that he might have underestimated the men he hoped to conquer. We are a little better than most, lied Moonglum, but not much. And what of sorcery? Is there much strong magic here? No, said Alric. The art has been lost to most. The barbarian's thin mouth twisted in a grin, half of relief and half of triumph. He nodded his head, reached into his gaudy silks and produced a small, black and white, bound cat. He began to stroke its back. It wriggled, but could do no more than hiss at its captor. Then we need not worry, he said. Now... Why did you come here? I could have you tortured for days for what you did. Slaying ten of my best outriders. Well, we recognise the chance of enriching ourselves by aiding you, Lord Flamebringer, said Elric. Could show you the richest towns, lead you to ill-defended cities that would take little time to fall. Will you enlist us? I've need of men such as you true enough. I'll enlist you readily, but mark this. I'll not trust you until you've proved loyal to me. Find yourselves quarters now and come to the feast tonight. There I'll be able to show you something of the power I hold. The power which will smash the strength of the West and lay it waste for ten thousand miles. Thank you, said Elric. I'll look forward to tonight. They left the tent and wandered through the haphazard collection of tents and cooking fires, wagons and animals. There seemed little food, but 
Wine was in abundance, and the taut, hungry stomachs of the barbarians were placated with that. They stopped a warrior and told him of Turan Gashtek's orders to them. The warrior sullenly led them to a tent. The air was shared by three of the men you slew. It is yours by right of battle, as are the weapons and booty inside. We're richer already, grinned Elric with feigned delight. In the privacy of the tent, which was less clean than Taran Gashtek's, they debated. I feel uncommonly uncomfortable, said Moonglum, surrounded by this treacherous horde, and every time I think of what they made of Eshmir, I itch to slay more of them. What now? Well, we can do nothing now. Let us wait until tonight and see what develops. Elric sighed. Our task seems impossible. I've never seen so great a horde as this. They are invincible as they are, said Moonglum. Even without Drenage Bower's sorcery to tumble down the walls of cities, no single nation could withstand them. And with the western nations squabbling among themselves, they could never unite in time. Civilization itself is threatened. Let us pray for inspiration. Your dark gods are at least sophisticated, Elric. We must hope that they'll resent the barbarians' intrusion as much as we do. They play strange games with their human pawns, Elric replied. Who knows what they plan? Turan Gashtek's smoke wreath's tent had been further lighted by rush torches when Elric and Moonglum swaggered in, and the feast, consisting primarily of wine, was already in progress. Welcome, my friends, shouted the flamebringer, waving his goblet. These are my captains. Come join them. Elric had never before seen such an evil-looking group of barbarians. They were all half-drunk, and like their leader, had draped a variety of looted articles of clothing about themselves. But their swords were their own. Room was made on one of the benches, and they accepted wine, which they drank sparingly. Bring in our slave, yelled Turan Gashtek. Bring in Drinage Bara, our pet sorcerer. Before him on the table lay the bound and struggling cat and beside it an iron blade. Grinning warriors dragged a morose-faced man close to the fire and forced him to kneel before the barbarian chief. He was a lean man, and he glowered at Taran Gashtek and the little cat, and his eyes saw the iron blade and his gaze faltered. What do you want with me now? He said sullenly. Is that any way to address your master spellmaker? Still no matter. We have guests to entertain. Men who have promised to lead us to fat merchant cities. We require you to do a few minor tricks for them. I'm no petty sorcerer. You cannot ask this of one of the greatest conjurers in the world. We do not ask. We order Come make the evening lively. What do you need for your magic making? A few slaves? The blood of virgins? We'll arrange it. I am no mumbling shaman. I need no such trappings. Suddenly the sorcerer saw Elric. The albino felt the man's powerful mind tentatively probing his own. He had been recognized as a fellow sorcerer. Would Strinage Bara betray him? Auric was tense, waiting to be denounced. He leaned back in his chair and as he did so made a sign with his hands which would be recognised by western sorcerers. Would the easterner know it? He did, and for a moment he faltered, glancing at the barbarian leader. Then he turned away and began to make new passes in the air, muttering to himself. The beholders gasped as a cloud of golden smoke formed near the roof and began to metamorphose into the shape of a great horse bearing a rider which recognised as Turan Gashtek. 
The barbarian leader leaned forward, glaring at the image. What's this? A map showing great land areas and seas seemed to unroll beneath the horse's hooves. The western lands, cried Drinage Barra. I make a prophecy. And what is it? The ghostly horse began to trample the map. It split and flew into a thousand smoky pieces. Then the image of the horseman faded also into fragments. Thus will the mighty flamebringer rend the bountiful nations of the west, shouted Drinage Barra. The barbarians cheered exultantly, but Alric smiled thinly. The eastern wizard was mocking Taran Gashtek and his men. The smoke formed into a golden globe which seemed to blaze and vanish. Taran Gashtek laughed. A good trick, magic maker, and a true prophecy. You've done your work well. Take him back to his kennel. His drainage barrow was dragged away. He glanced questioningly at Elric, but said nothing. Later that night, as the barbarians drank themselves into a stupor, Elric and Moonglum slipped out of the tent and made their way to the place where Drinage Barra was imprisoned. They reached the small hut and saw that a warrior stood guard at the entrance. Moonglum produced a skin of wine and, pretending drunkenness, staggered toward the man. Elric stayed where he was. What do you want, Outlander? growled the guard. Nothing, my friends. We're trying to get back to our own tent, is all. Do you know where it is? Well, how should I know? Drew, how should you know? Have some wine, it's good. And Terran Gashtek's own supply. The man extended a hand. Let's have it. Moonglum took a swig of the wine. No, nah, I've changed my mind. It's too good to waste on common warriors. Is that so? The warrior took several paces towards Moonglum. We'll find out, won't we? Maybe we'll mix some of your blood with it to give it flavour, my little friend. Moonglum backed away. The warrior followed. Eric ran softly towards the tent and ducked into it to find Drinage Barra, wrists bound, lying on a pile of uncured hides. The sorcerer looked up. You. What do you want? We've come to aid you, Drinage Barra. Aid me? But why? You're no friend of mine. What would you gain? You risk too much. Well, as a fellow sorcerer, I thought I'd help you, Alric said. I thought you were that. But in my land, sorcerers are not so friendly to one another. The opposite, in fact. I'll tell you the truth. We need your aid to halt the barbarian's bloody progress. We have a common enemy. If we can help you regain your soul, will you help? Help, of course. All I do is plan the way I'll avenge myself. But for my sake, be careful. If he suspects that you're here to aid me, he'll slay the cat and slay us too. We'll try to bring the cat to you. Will that be what you need? Yes, we must exchange blood to the cat and I, and my soul will then pass back into my own body. Very well, I'll try to. Arik turned, hearing voices outside. What's that? The sorcerer replied fearfully. It must be Terran Gashtek. He comes every night to taunt me. Where's the guard? The barbarian's harsh voice came closer as he entered the little tent. He saw Arik standing above the sorcerer. His eyes were puzzled and wary. What are you doing here, Westerner? What have you done with the guard? Guard? said Elric. I saw no guard. I was looking for my own tent and heard this cur cry out, so I entered. I was curious anyway to see such a great sorcerer, clad in filthy rags and bound so. Turan Gashtek scowled. Any more of such unweary curiosity, my friend, and you'll be discovering what your own heart looks like. And get thee hence... We ride on in the morning. Alric pretended to flinch and stumbled hurriedly from the tent.
a lone man in the livery of an official messenger of Carlark goaded his horse southwards. The mount galloped over the crest of a hill and the messenger saw a village ahead. Hurriedly he rode into it, shouting at the first man he saw. Quickly tell me, know you what of Divim Slorm and his Imrurian mercenaries? Have they passed this way? Aye, a week ago. They went towards Rignarium by Jadmar's border to offer their sources to the Vilmurian pretender. Were they mounted or on foot? Both? Thanks, friends, cried the messenger behind him, and galloped out of the village in the direction of Rignarium. The messenger from Karlark rode through the night, rode along a recently made trail. A large force had passed this way. He prayed that it had been Divim Slorm and his Imrurian warriors. In the sweet-smelling garden city of Karlark, the atmosphere was tense as the citizens waited for news they knew they could not expect for some time. They were relying on both Elric and on the messenger. If only one was successful, then there would be no hope for them. Both had to be successful. Both. The tumbling sound of moving men cut through the weeping morning, and the hungry voice of Terran Gashtek lashed at them to hurry. Slaves packed up his tent and threw it into a wagon. He rode forward and wrenched his tall war lance from the soft earth, wheeled his horse and rode westwards. His captains, Elric and Moonglum among them, behind him. Speaking their western tongue, Elric and Moonglum debated their problem. The barbarian was expecting them to lead him to his prey. His outriders were covering wide distances, so it would be impossible to lead him past a settlement. They were in a quandary, for it would be disgraceful to sacrifice another township to give Karlark a few days' grace. Yes. A little later, two whooping outriders came galloping up to Tehran Gashtek. A town, my lord, a small one and easy to take. At last, this will do to test our blades and see how easy western flesh is to pierce. And then we'll aim at a bigger target. He turned to Elric. Do you know this town? Where does it lie? asked Elric thickly. A dozen miles to the southwest, replied the outrider. In spite of the fact that the town was doomed, Elric felt almost relieved. They spoke of the town of Gorge Han. I know it, he said. Kevin the saddler, riding to deliver a new set of horse furniture to an outlying farm, saw the distant riders, their bright helmets caught by a sudden beam of sunlight. That the riders came from off the weeping waste was undoubtable, and he recognised menace in their massed progress. He turned his mount about and rode with the speed of fear, back the way he had come to the town of Gorshan. The flat, hard mud of the street trembled beneath the thudding hooves of Cavum's horse, and his high, excited shout knifed through shuttered windows. Raiders come! Where the raiders? Within a quarter of an hour, the head man of the town had met in hasty conference and debated whether to run or to fight. The older men advised their neighbours to flee the raiders. Other younger men preferred to stay ready, armed to meet a possible attack. Some argued that the town was too poor to attract any raider. The townspeople of Gorshan debated and quarrelled and the first wave of raiders came screaming, screaming to their walls. With the realisation that there was no time for further argument came the realisation of their doom. And they ran to the ramparts with their pitiful weapons. Tehran Gashtek roared through the milling barbarians who churned the mud around Gorjan. Waste no time in siege. Fetch the sorcerer. They dragged Drinage Bara forward. From his garments, Tehran Gashtek produced a small black cat and held an iron blade to its throat. 
Work your spells, sorcerer, and tumble the walls quickly. Sorcerer scowled, his eyes seeking Elric, but the albino averted his own eyes and turned his horse away. The sorcerer produced a handful of powder from his belt pouch and hurled it into the air where it became first a gas, then a flickering ball of flame, and finally a face, a dreadful, unhuman face formed in the flame. Dag Gaddon, the destroyer, intoned Drinage Barra, you are sworn to our ancient pact. Will you obey me? I must, and therefore I will. What do you command? That you obliterate the walls of this town and so leave the men inside naked, like crabs without their shells. My pleasure to destroy and destroy I shall. The flaming face faded, altered, shrieked a searing course upward, became a blossoming scarlet canopy which hid the sky. Then it swept down over the town and... In the instant of its passing, the walls of Gorjan groaned, crumbled, and vanished. Elric shuddered. If Dag Gaddon came to Karlark, such would be their fate. Triumphant, the barbarian battlemongers swept into the defenceless town. Careful to take no part in the massacre, Elric and Moonglum were also helpless to aid the slaughtered townspeople. The sight of the senseless, savage bloodshed around them innovated them. They ducked into a small house which seemed so far untouched by the pillaging barbarians. Inside they found three cowering children huddled around an older girl who clutched an old scythe in her soft hands. Shaking with fear, she prepared to stand them off. Do not waste our time, girl. Eric said, or you'll be wasting your lives. Does this house have a loft? She nodded. Then get to it quickly. We'll make sure you're unharmed. They stayed in the house, hating to observe the slaughter madness which came upon the howling barbarians. They heard the dreadful sounds of carnage and smelled the stench of dead flesh and running blood. A barbarian, covered in blood which was not his own, dragged a woman into the house by her hair. She made no attempt to resist, her face stunned by the horror she had witnessed. Elric growled. Find another nest, Hawk. We've made this our own. The man said, There's room enough here for what I want. And then at last, Elric's clenched muscles reacted almost in spite of him. His right hand swung over to his left hip and the long fingers locked around Stormbringer's black hilt. The blade leapt from the scabbard as Elric stepped forward and his crimson eyes blazing in sickened hatred, he smashed his sword down through the man's body. Unnecessarily, he clove again, hacking the barbarian in two. The woman remained where she lay, conscious but unmoving. Elric picked up her inert body and passed it gently to Moonglum. Take her upstairs with the others, he said brusquely. The barbarians had begun to fire part of the town, their slaying all but done. Now they looted. Elric stepped out of the doorway. There was precious little for them to loot, but still hungry for violence, they spent their energy on smashing inanimate things and setting fire to the broken, pillaged dwellings. Stormbringer dangled loosely in Elric's hand as he looked at the blazing town. His face was a mask of shadow, and frisking light as the fire threw up still longer tongues of flame to the misty sky. Round him, barbarians squabbled over the pitiful beauty. And occasionally a woman's scream cut through the other sounds, intermingled with rough shouts and a clash of metal. Then he heard voices which were pitched differently than those in the immediate vicinity. The accents of the reavers mingled with a new tone, a whining, pleading tone. A group led by Tehran Gashtek came into view through the smoke. 
Duran Gashtek held something bloody in his hand. Human head. A human hand severed at the wrist, and behind him swaggered several of his captains, holding a naked old man between them. Blood ran over his body and gushed from his ruined arm, spurting sluggishly. Turan Gashtek frowned when he saw Elric, and then he shouted, Now, Westerner, you, see, you shall see how we placate our gods with better gifts than meal and sour milk as the swine once did. He'll soon be dancing a pretty measure, I'll warrant, won't you, Lord Priest? The whining note went out of the old man's voice then, and he stared with fever-bright eyes at Elric. His voice rose to a frenzied and high-pitched shriek which was curiously repellent. You dogs can howl over me, he spat, but Midath and Targano will be revenged for the ruin of their priests in their temple. You have brought flame here, and you shall die by flame. He pointed the bleeding stump of his arm at Elric. And you, traitor, have been one in many causes. I can see it written in you. Though now you are... The priest drew breath, and Elric licked his lips. I am what I am, he said. And you are nothing but an old man soon to die. Your gods cannot harm us, for we do not pay them any respect. And I'll listen no more to your senile meanderings. There was in the old priest's face all the knowledge of his past torment and the torment which was to come. He seemed to consider this and then was silent. Save your breath for screaming, said Turan Gashtek to the uncomprehending priest. And then Alric said, it is bad luck to kill a priest, Flamebringer. Well, you seem weak of stomach, my friend. His sacrifice to our own gods will bring us good luck. Fear not. Alric turned away, and he entered the house again. A wild shriek of agony seared out of the night, and the laughter which followed was not pleasant. Later, as the still-burning houses lit the night, Alric and Moonglum carried heavy sacks on their shoulders clasping a woman edge, moving with a simulation of drunkenness to the edge of the camp. Moonglum left the sacks and the woman with Elric and went back, returning soon with three horses. They opened the sacks to allow the children to climb out and watch the silent woman mount the horses, aiding the children to clamber up, and then they galloped away. Now, said Elric savagely, we must work our plan tonight whether the messenger reached Divim Slorm or not. I could not bear to witness another such sword-quenching. Turan Gashtek had drunk himself insensible. He lay sprawled in an upper room of one of the unburned houses. Alric and Moonglum crept towards him, while Alric watched to see that he was undisturbed. Moonglum knelt beside the barbarian leader and, light-fingered, cautiously reached inside the man's garments. He smiled in self-approval as he lifted out the squirming cat and replaced it with a stuffed rabbit skin he had earlier prepared for the purpose. Holding the animal tight, he arose and nodded to Elric. Together, warily, they left the house and made their way through the chaos of the camp. I ascertained that Drinage Barra lies in the large wagon, Elric told his friend. Quickly now, the main danger's over. Moonglum said, When the cat and Drinage Barra have exchanged blood and the sorcerer's soul is back in his body, what then, Elric? And together our powers may serve at last to hold the barbarians back, but he broke off as a large group of warriors came weaving towards him. It's the westerner and his little friend, laughed one. Where are you off to, comrades? Ulrich sensed their mood. The slaughter of the day had not completely satiated their bloodlust. They were looking for trouble. Nowhere in particular, he replied. The barbarians lurched around them, encircling them. We've heard much of your straight blade, stranger, grinned the spokesman, and I have a mind to test it against a real weapon. He grabbed his own scimitar out of his belt. What do you say? I would spare you that, said Elric, coolly. 
You were generous, but I'd rather you accepted my invitation. Let us pass, said Moonglum. The barbarian's face is hardened. Speak you so to the conquerors of the world, said the leader. Moonglum took a step back and drew his sword, the cat squirming in his left hand. We'd best get this done, said Elric to his friend. He tugged his rune blade from its scabbard. The sword sang a soft and mocking tune and the barbarians heard it. They were disconcerted. Well, said Elric, holding the half-sentient blade out. The barbarian who had challenged him looked uncertain of what to do, and then he forced himself to shout, Clean iron can withstand any sorcery, and launched himself forward. Elric, grateful for the chance to take further vengeance, blocked his swing, forced the scimitar back, and aimed a blow which sliced the man's torso just above the hip. The barbarian screamed and died. Moonglum, dealing with a couple more, killed one, but another came in swiftly and a sweeping sword sliced the little Eastlander's left shoulder. He howled and dropped the cat. Elric stepped in, slew Moonglum's opponent, Stormbringer wailing a triumphant dirge. The rest of the barbarians turned and ran off. How bad is your wound, gasped Elric, but Moonglum was on his knees, staring through the gloom. Quick, Elric, can you see the cat? I dropped it in the struggle. If we lose it, we too are lost. And frantically, they began to hunt through the camp. But they were unsuccessful, for the cat, with the dexterity of its kind, had hidden itself. A few moments later, they heard the sounds of uproar coming from the house which Tehran Gashtek had commandeered. He's discovered that the cat's been stolen, exclaimed Moonglum. What do we do now? I don't know. Keep searching and hope he does not suspect us. They continued to hunt, but with no result. And while they searched, several barbarians came up to them. One of them said, Our leader wishes to speak with you. Why? He'll inform you of that. Come on. Reluctantly, they went with the barbarians to be confronted by a raging Terran Gashtek. He clutched the stuffed rabbit skin in one claw-like hand, and his face was warped with fury. My hold over the sorcerer has been stolen from me, he roared. What do you know of it? I don't understand, said Elric. The cat is missing. I found this rag in its place. You were caught talking to Drinage Barra recently. I think you were responsible. We know nothing of this, said Moonglum. Taran Gashtek growled. The camp's in disorder. It will take a day to reorganize my men. Once loose like this, they will obey no one. But when I've restored order, I shall question the whole camp. If you tell the truth, then you will be released. But meanwhile, you will be given all the time you need to speak with the sorcerer. He jerked his head. Take them away. Disarm them. Bind them. And throw them in Drinage Barra's kennel. And as they were led away, Alric muttered, We must escape and find the cat. But meanwhile, we need not waste this opportunity to confer with Drinage Barra. Drinage Barra said in the darkness, No, brother sorcerer, I will not aid you. I will risk nothing until the cat and I are united. But Tehran Gashtek cannot threaten you any more. Well, what if he recaptures the cat? What then? Elric was silent. He shifted his bound body uncomfortably on the hard boards of the wagon. He was about to continue his attempts at persuasion when the awning was thrown aside and he saw another trussed figure thrown towards them. Through the blackness, he said in the eastern tongue, Who are you? The man replied in the language of the West, I do not understand you. Are you then a Westerner? asked Elric in the common speech. Yes, I am an official messenger from Karlark. I was captured by these odorous jackals as I returned to the city. What? 
You the man we sent to Divim Slorm, my kinsman. I am Elric of Malnibane. My lord, are we all then prisoners? O oh gods, Kalak is truly lost. Did you get to Divim Slorm? Aye, oh, I caught up with him and his band. Luckily, they were nearer to Kalak than we suspected. And what was his answer to my request? He said that a few young ones might be ready, but even with sorcery to aid him, it would take time to get to the Dragon Isle. There is a chance. A chance is all we need, but it will be no good unless we accomplish the rest of our plan. Somehow, Drinage Barra's soul must be regained so that Turan Gashtek cannot force him to defend the barbarians. There is one idea I have. In memory of an ancient kinship that we of Malnibane had for beings called Mirkla. Thank the gods that I discovered those drugs and trues and still have my strength. Now I must call my sword to me. He closed his eyes and allowed his mind and body first to relax completely and then concentrate on one single thing, the sword Stormbringer. For years, the evil symbiosis had existed between man and sword, and the old attachments lingered. He cried, Stormbringer, unite with your brother. Come, sweet runeblade, hell-forged kinslayer, your master needs thee. Outside it seemed that a wailing wind had suddenly sprung up, Elric heard shouts of fear and a whistling sound, and then the covering of the wagon was sliced apart to let in the starlight, and the moaning blade quivered in the air above his head. He struggled upwards, already feeling nauseated at what he was about to do, but he was reconciled that he was not, this time, guided by self-interest, but by the necessity to save the world from the barbarian menace. Give me thy strength, my sword. He groaned as his bound hands grasped the hilt. Give me thy strength and let us hope it is for the last time. The, vamp uh, the blood writhed in his hands. and He felt an awful sensation as its power, the power stolen vampire-like from a hundred brave men, flowed into his shuddering body. He became possessed of a peculiar strength which was not by any means wholly physical. His white face twisted as he concentrated on controlling the new power and the blade, both of which threatened to possess him entirely. He snapped his bonds and stood up. Barbarians were even now running towards the wagon. Swiftly he cut the leather ropes binding the others and, unconscious of the nearing warriors, called a different name. He spoke a new tongue, an alien tongue which normally he could not remember. It was the language taught by the sorcerer kings of Malnibane, Auric's ancestors, even before the building of Imrir, the dreaming city, over ten thousand years previously. Mirkla of the cats, it is I, your kinsman, Auric of Malnibane, last of the line that made vows of friendship with you and your people. Do you hear me, Lord of the Cats? Far beyond the earth, dwelling within a world set apart from the physical laws of space and time which governed the planet, glowing in a deep warmth of blue and amber, a man-like creature stretched itself and yawned, displaying tiny pointed teeth. It pressed its head languidly against its furry shoulder and listened. The voice it heard was not the, that of one of its people, the kind he loved and protected, but he recognised the language. He smiled to himself as remembrance came, and he felt the pleasant sensation of fellowship. He remembered a race which, unlike other humans whom he disdained, had shared his qualities. A race which, him, which like him, loved pleasure, cruelty and sophistication for its own sake the race of Melnibonaeans. Mirkla, lord of the cats, protector of the feline kind, projected himself gracefully towards the source of the voice. And how may I aid thee, he purred. 
We seek one of your folk, Mia Clara, who is somewhere close to here. Oh yes, I sense him, but what do you want of him? Nothing which is his, but he has two souls, one of them not his own. That is so. His name is Fiashu, and of the great family of Triashau. I will call him. He will come to me. Outside, the barbarians were striving to conquer their fear of the supernatural events taking place in the wagon. Turan Gashtek cursed them. There are 500,000 of us and a few of them. Take them now. His warriors began to move cautiously forward. Fiashu and the cat heard a voice which it knew instinctively to be that one which it would be foolish to disobey. It ran swiftly towards the source of that voice. Look, the cat, there it is, sees it quickly. Two of Turan Gashtek's men jumped forward to do his bidding, but the little cat eluded them and leapt lightly into the wagon. Give the human back its soul, Fjarshun, said Mirkla softly. The cat moved towards its source, human master and dug its delicate teeth into the sorcerer's veins. A moment later, Drinage Bara laughed wildly. My soul is mine again. Thank you, great cat lord, and let me repay you. Oh, there's no need, smiled Mia Clare mockingly. Anyway, I perceive that your soul is already bartered. Goodbye, Elric of Melnabene. I was pleased to answer your call, though I see that you no longer follow the ancient pursuits of your fathers. Still, for the sake of old loyalties, I do not begrudge you the service. Farewell. I go back to a warmer place than this inhospitable one. The Lord of the Cats faded and returned to the world of blue and amber warmth, where he once more resumed his interrupted sleep. Come, brother sorcerer, cried Drinage Barra exultantly. Let us take the vengeance which is ours. He and Elric sprang from the wagon, but the Two others were not quite so quick to respond. Turan Gashtek and his men confronted them. Many had bows with long arrows fitted to them. Shoot them down swiftly, yelled the flamebringer. Shoot them now before they have time to summon further demons. A shower of arrows whistled towards them. Drinjbara smiled, spoke a few words as he moved his hands almost carelessly. The arrows stopped in mid-flight turned back and each uncannily found the throat of the man who had shot it. Turan Gashtek gasped and wheeled back, pushed past his men and, as he retreated, shouted for them to attack the four. Driven by the knowledge that if they fled they would be doomed, the great mass of barbarians closed in. Dawn was bringing light to the cloud-ripped sky as Moonglum looked upwards. Look, Elric, he shouted, pointing. Only five, said the albino. Only five, but perhaps enough. He parried several lashing blades of his own, with his own sword, and although he was possessed of superhuman strength, all the power seemed to have left the sword, so that it was only as useful as an ordinary blade. Still fighting, he relaxed his body and felt the power leave him, flowing back into Stormbringer. Again the rune blade began to whine and thirstily sought the throats and hearts of the savage barbarians. Drinage Bara had no sword, but he did not need one. He was using subtler means to defend himself. All around him were the gruesome results, boneless masses of flesh and sinew. The two sorcerers and Moonglum and the messenger forced their way through the half-insane barbarians who were desperately attempting to overcome them. In the confusion, it was impossible to work out a coherent plan of action. Moonglum and the messenger grabbed scimitars from the corpses of the barbarians and joined in the battle. Eventually, they had reached the outer limits of the camp. A whole mass of barbarians had fled, spurring their mounts westwards. Then Auric saw Turan Gashtek holding a bow. He saw the flamebringer's intention and shouted a warning to his fellow sorcerer, who had his back to the barbarian. 
Drenage Barra, yelling some disturbing incantation, half turned, broke off, attempted to begin another spell, but the arrow pierced his eye. He screamed, no, and then he died. Seeing his ally slain, Alric paused and stared at the sky and the great wheeling beasts which he recognised. Divim Slorm, son of Alric's cousin Divim Tvar, the dragon master, had brought the legendary dragons of Imria to aid his kinsmen. Most of the huge beasts slept and would sleep for another century. Only five dragons had been aroused. As yet, Divim Slorm could do nothing for fear of harming Alric and his comrades. Taran Gashtek, too, had seen the magnificent beasts. His grandiose plans of conquest were already fading and Thwarted, he ran towards Elric. You white-faced filth, he howled. You have been responsible for all of this, and you will pay the Flamebringer's price. Elric laughed as he brought up Stormbringer to protect himself from the incensed barbarian. He pointed to the sky. These two can be called Flamebringers, Taran Gashtek, and they are better named than thou. Then he plunged the evil blade full into Turan Gashtek's body, and the barbarian gave a choking moan as his soul was drawn from him. Destroyer I may be, Elric of Melnibane, he gasped, but my way was cleaner than yours. May you and all you hold dear be cursed for eternity. Elric laughed, but his voice shook slightly as he stared at the barbarian's corpse. I've rid myself of such curses once before, my friend. Yours will have little effect, I think. He paused. By Arioch, I hope I'm right. Thought my fate cleansed of doom and curses, but perhaps I was wrong. The huge horde of barbarians were nearly all mounted now and fleeing westwards. They had to be stopped, for at the pace they were travelling they would soon reach Karlark, and only the gods knew what they would do once they got to the unprotected city. Above him he heard the flapping of thirty-foot wings, and scented the familiar smell of the great flying reptiles which had pursued him years before when he had led a reaver fleet on the attack of his home city. Then he heard the curious notes of the dragon horn, and saw that Divim Slorm was seated on the back of the leading beast, a long, spear-like goad in his gauntleted right hand. The dragon spiralled downwards and its great bulk came to rest on the ground thirty feet away, its leathery wings folding back along its length. The dragon master waved to Elric. Greetings, King Elric. We barely managed to arrive in time, I see. Time enough, kinsman, smiled Elric. It is good to see the son of Divim Tvar again. I was afraid you might not answer my plea. Old scores were forgotten at the Battle of Bakshan, when my father Divim Tvar died, aiding you in the siege of Nikorn's fortress. I regret only the younger beasts were ready to be awakened. You'll remember the others were used, but a few years passed. I remember, said Ulrich. May I beg another favour, Divim Slorm? What is that? Let me ride the chief dragon. I am trained in the arts of the dragon master and have good reason for riding against the barbarians. We were forced to witness insensate carnage a while ago and may perhaps pay them back in their own coinage. Divim Slorm nodded and swung off his mount. The beast stirred restlessly and drew back the lips of its tapering snout to reveal teeth as thick as a man's arm, as long as a sword. Its forked tongue flickered and it turned its huge, cold eyes to regard Elric. Elric sang to it in the old Malnabonean speech, took the goad and the dragon horn from Divim Slorm and carefully climbed into the high saddle at the base of the dragon's neck. He placed his booted feet in the great silver stirrups. Now fly, dragon brother, he sang, up and have your venom ready. He heard the snap of displaced air as the wings began to beat, and then the great beast was clear of the ground and soaring upwards into the grey and brooding sky. 
The other four dragons followed the first, and as he gained height, sounding specific notes on the horn to give them directions, he drew his sword from its scabbard. Centuries before, Elric's ancestors had ridden their dragon steeds to conquer the whole of the western world. There had been many more dragons in the dragon caves in those days. Now only a handful remained, and of those only the youngest had slept sufficiently long enough to be awakened. High in the wintry sky climbed the huge reptiles, and Elric's long white hair and stained black cloak flew behind him as he sang the exultant song of the dragon masters and urged his charges westwards. Wild wind horses saw the cloud trails, and holy horn doth sound its blast. You and we were first to conquer, you and we shall be the last. Thoughts of love, peace, and vengeance even were lost in the reckless sweeping across the glowering skies which hung over the ancient age of the young kingdoms. Elric, archetypal, proud, disdainful in his knowledge that even his deficient blood was the blood of the sorcerer kings of Malnibane, became detached. He had no loyalties then, no friends, and if evil possessed him, it was a pure, brilliant evil, untainted by human drivings. High soared the dragons until below them was the heaving black mass, marring the landscape. The fear-driven horde of barbarians who, in their ignorance, had sought to conquer the lands beloved of Elric of Malnibane. O oh, dragon brothers, loose your venom, burn, and in your burning cleanse the world. Stormbringer joined in the wild shout, and diving, the dragons swept across the sky, down upon the crazed barbarians, shooting streams of combustible venom which water could not extinguish, and the stink of charred flesh drifted upwards through the smoke and the flame, so that the scene became a scene of hell. And proud Elric was the lord of demons, reaping awful vengeance. He did not gloat, for he had done only what was needed. That was all. He shouted no more, but turned his dragon mount back and upward, sounding his horn and summoning the other reptiles to him. And as he climbed, the exultation left him and was replaced by cold horror. I am still a Malnabonean, he thought. I cannot rid myself of what else I do. And in my strength I am still weak, ready to use this cursed blade in any small emergency. With a shout of loathing, he flung the sword away, flung it into space. It screamed like a woman and went plummeting downwards towards the distant earth. There, he said, it is done at last. Then, in a calmer mood, he returned to where he had left his friends and guided his reptilian mount to the ground. Divim Slorm said, Where is the sword of your forefathers, King Elric? But the albino did not answer, just thanked the kinsman for the loan of the dragon leader. Then they all remounted the dragons and flew back towards Karlark to tell them the news. Saratinia saw her lord riding the first dragon and knew that Karlark in the western world was saved, the eastern world avenged. His stance was proud, but his face was grave as he went to meet her outside the city. She saw in him a return of an earlier sorrow which he had thought forgotten. She ran to him and he caught her in his arms, holding her close but saying nothing. He bade farewell to Divim Slorm and his fellow Imridians, and with Moonglum and the messenger following at a distance went into the city, thence to his house, impatient of the congratulations which the citizens showered upon him. What is it, my lord? Saracinia said as, with a sigh, he sprawled wearily upon the great bread. Can speaking help? I am tired of swords and sorcery, Saracinia, that is all. But at last I have rid myself once and for all of that hellblade which I had thought my destiny to carry always. Stormbringer, you mean? What else? She said nothing. 
She did not tell him of the sword which, apparently of its own volition, had come screaming into Carlark and passed into the armory to hang in its old place in darkness there. He closed his eyes and drew a long, sighing breath. Sleep well, my lord, she said softly. With tearful eyes and a sad mouth, she lay herself down beside him. She did not welcome the morning. Epilogue to Rescue Tanalorn, in which we learn of the further adventures of Rakir, the Red Archer, and other heroes and places Alric has hitherto encountered only in what he chooses to consider his dreams. Beyond the tall and ominous glass green forest of Trues, well to the north and unheard of in Bakshan, elsewhere, or any other city of the young kingdoms, on the shifting shores of the sighing desert, lay Tanalorn, a lonely, long ago city, loved by those it sheltered. Tanalorn had a peculiar nature in that it welcomed and held the wanderer. To its peaceful streets and low houses came the gaunt, the savage, the brutalised, the tormented, and in Tanalorn they found rest. Now most of these troubled travellers who dwelt in peaceful Tanalorn had thrown off earlier allegiances to the Lords of Chaos, who, as gods, took more than a mild interest in the affairs of men. It happened, therefore, that these same lords grew to resent the unlikely city of Tanalorn, and not for the first time decided to act against it. They instructed one of their number, more they could not then send, Lord Najhan, to journey to Nadsakor, the city of beggars, which had an old grudge against Tanalorn, and raise an army that would attack undefended Tanalorn and destroy it and its inhabitants. So he did this, arming his ragged army and promising them many things. Then, like a ferocious tide that the beggar rabble set off to tear down Tanalorn and slay its residents. In a great torrent of men and women in rags, on crutches, blind, maimed, but moving steadily, ominously, implacably, northwards towards the sighing desert. In Tanalorn dwelt the Red Archer, Rahir, from the east lands beyond the sighing desert. Beyond the weeping waste, Rahir had been a warrior priest, a servant of the Lords of Chaos, but had forsaken this life for the quieter pursuits of thievery and learning. A man with harsh features slashed from the bone of his skull, strong, fleshless nose, deep eye cavities, a thin mouth and a thin beard. He wore a red skull cap, decorated with a hawk's feather, a red jerkin, tight-fitting and belted at the waist, red breeks and red boots. It was as if all the blood in him had transferred itself to his gear and left him drained. He was happy, however, in Tanalorn, the city which made all such men happy, and felt he would die there, if men died there, he did not know if they did. One day he saw Brute of Lashmar, a great blonde-headed noble of shamed name, ride wearily, yet urgently, through the low wall gate of the City of Peace. Brute's silver harness and trappings were begrimed, his yellow cloak torn and his brawn-brimmed hat battered. A small crowd collected around him as he rode into the city square and halted, and then he gave his news. Beggars from Nadsakor, many thousands move against our Tanalorn, he said, and they are led by Narjan of Chaos. Now, all the men in there were soldiers of some kind, good ones for the most part, and they were confident warriors, but few in number. A horde of beggars led by such a being as Naj Han could destroy Tanalorn, they knew. Or should we then leave Tanalorn? 
said Uroch of Nieva, a young wasted man who had been a drunkard. We owe this city too much to desert her, Rakia said. We should defend her for her sake and ours. There will never be such a city again. Brute leaned forward in his saddle and said, In principle, Red Archer, I am in agreement with you. But principle is not enough without deeds. How would you suggest we defend this low-walled city against siege and the powers of chaos? We should need help, Rakia replied. Supernatural help, if need be. Would the Grey Lords help us? Sass, the one-handed, asked the question. He was an old torn wanderer who had once gained a throne and lost it again. Aye, the Grey Lords, several voices chorused this hopefully. Who are the Grey Lords, said Uroch, but no one heard him. They are not inclined to aid anyone at all, Sass, the one-handed, pointed out. But surely Tanalorn, coming as it does under neither the forces of law nor the Lords of Chaos, would be worth their while preserving. After all, they have no loyalties either. I'm for seeking the Grey Lord's aid, Brute nodded. Well, what of the rest of us? There was a general agreement. Then silence when they realised that they knew of no means of contacting the mysterious and insouciant beings. At last, Zass pointed this out. Wakir said, I know a seer, a hermit who lives in the Sighing Desert. Perhaps he can help. I think that after all we should not waste time looking for supernatural assistance against this bigger rabble, Uroch said. Let us prepare instead to meet the attack with physical means. Will you forget, Brute said wearily, that they are led by Narshan of Chaos. He is not human and has the whole strength of Chaos behind him. We know that the Grey Lords are pledged neither to law nor to Chaos, but will sometimes help either side if the whim takes them. They are our only chance. Well, why not seek the forces of law, sworn enemies of chaos and mightier than the Grey Lords? Uroch said. Because Tanalorn is a city owing allegiance to neither side. We are all of us men and women who have broken our pledge to chaos, but have made no new one to law. The forces of law in matters of this kind will help only those sworn to them. Grey Lords only may protect us, if they would. So said Zass. I will go to find my seer, Rickier the Red Archer said, and if he knows how I may reach the domain of the Grey Lords, then I'll continue straight on, for there is so little time. If I reach them and solicit their help, you will know that I have done so. If not, you must die in Tanalor's defence, and if I live I will join you in the last battle. Very well, Brute agreed. Go quickly, Red Archer. Let one of your own arrows be the measure of your speed. And taking little with him, save his bone bow and a quiver of scarlet-fletched arrows, Rakir set off for the sighing desert. From Nadsakor, southwest through the land of Vilnia, even through the squalid country of Org, which has in it the dreadful forest of Trues, there was flame and black horror in the wake of the beggar horde, and insolent, disdainful of them, though he led them, rode a being completely clad in black armour, with a voice that rang hollow in the helm. People fled away at their approach, and the land was made barren by their passing. Most knew what had happened, that the beggar citizens of Nadzakor had, contrary to their traditions of centuries, vomited forth from the city in the, into the a wild, menacing horde. Someone had armed them. Someone had made them go northwards and westwards towards the sighing desert. But who was the one who led them? Ordinary folk did not know. And why did they head for the sighing desert? There was no city beyond, beyond Karlark, which they had skirted, only the sighing desert, and beyond that the edge of the world. Was that their destination? Were they heading lemming-like to their destruction? Everyone hoped so, in their hate for the horrible horde. Rakir rode through the mournful wind of the sighing desert. 
His face and eyes protected against the particles of sand which flew about. He was thirsty and had been riding a day. Ahead of him at last were the rocks he saw. He reached the rocks and called above the wind. Lamsa! The hermit came out in answer to Rakia's shout. He was dressed in oiled leather to which sand clung. His beard too was encrusted with sand, and his skin seemed to have taken on the colour and texture of the desert. He recognised Rakia immediately by his dress, beckoned him into the cave and disappeared back inside. Rakia dismounted and led his horse to the cave entrance and went in. Lamsar was seated on a smooth rock. You are welcome, Red Archer, he said, and I perceive by your manner that you wish information from me and that your mission is urgent. Well, I seek the help of the Grey Lords, Lamsar, said Rakia. The old hermit smiled. It was as if a fissure had suddenly appeared in a rock. To risk the journey through the five gates, your mission must be important. I will tell you how to reach the Grey Lords, but the road is a difficult one. Well, I am willing to take it, Rakia replied, for Tanalorn is threatened, and the Grey Lords could help her. Then you must pass through the first gate, which lies in our own dimension. I will help you find it. And then what must I do? You must pass through all five gates... Each gateway leads to a realm which lies beyond and within our own dimension. In each realm you must speak with the dwellers there. Some are friendly to men and some are not, but all must answer your question. Where lies the next gate? Though some may seek to stop you passing, the last gate leads to the Grey Lord's domain. And the first gate? Well, that lies anywhere in this realm. I will find it for you now. Lamzar composed himself to meditate, and Rakia, who had expected some sort of gaudy miracle working from the old man, was disappointed. Several hours went by until Lamzar said, The gate is outside. Memorize the following. If X is equal to the spirit of humanity, then the combination of the two must be of double power. Therefore, the spirit of humanity always contains the power to dominate itself. A strange equation, said Rakia. Aye, but memorize it. Meditate upon it, and then we will leave. We? You as well? Hmm, I think so. The hermit was old. Rakia did not want him on the journey. But then he realised that the hermit's knowledge could be of use to him, so he did not object. He thought about the equation, and as he thought, his mind seemed to glitter and become diffused until he was in a strange trance, and all his powers felt greater, both those of mind and body. The hermit got up, and Rakia followed him. They went out of the cave mouth, but instead of the sighing desert, there was a hazy cloud of blue shimmering light ahead. And when they had passed through this in a second, they found themselves in the foothills of a low mountain range. Below them in a valley were villages. The villages were strangely laid out, all the houses in a wide circle about a huge amphitheatre containing, at its centre, a circular dais. It will be interesting to learn the reason why these villages are so arranged, Lamzar said, and they began to move down into the valley. As they reached to the bottom and came close to one of the villages, people came gaily out and danced joyfully towards them. They stopped in front of Rakia and Lamsar, and jumping from foot to foot as he greeted them, the leader spoke. You are strangers, we can tell, and you are welcome to all we have, food, accommodation, entertainment. The two men thanked them graciously and accompanied them back into the circular village. The amphitheatre was made of mud and seemed to have been stamped out hollowed into, the ground encompassed by the houses. The leader of the villagers took them to his house and offered them food. You have come to us at a rest time, he said, but do not worry, things will soon commence again. My name is Yerleru. We seek the next gate, Lamzar said politely, and our mission is urgent. 
you will forgive us if we do not stay long. Come, said Ye Laru. Things are about to commence. You will see us at our best and must join us. All the villagers had assembled in the amphitheatre, surrounding the platform in the centre. Most of them were light-skinned and light-haired, gay and smiling, excited, but a few were evidently of a different race, dark, black-haired, and these were sullen. Sensing something ominous in what he saw, Rakia asked the question directly, Where is the next gate? Yerlaru hesitated, his mouth worked, and then he smiled. Where the winds meet, he said. Rakia declared angrily, That's no answer. Well, yes it is, said Lamzar softly behind him. A fair answer. Now we shall dance, Yerlaru said. First you shall watch our dance, and then you shall join in. Dance, said Rakia, wishing he had brought a sword or at least a dagger. Yes, you will like it. Everyone likes it. You will find it will do you good. What if we do not wish to dance? Well, you must. It is for your own good. Be assured. And he? Rakia pointed at one of the sullen men. Does he enjoy it? It is for his own good, too. Yularu clapped his hands, and at once the fair-haired people leapt into a frenetic, senseless dance. Some of them sang... The sullen people did not sing, and after a little hesitation they began to prance dully about, their frowning features contrasting with their jerking bodies. Soon the whole village was dancing, whirling, singing a monotonous song. Yularu flashed by, whirling. Come, join in now. We'd better leave, Lamzar said with a faint smile, and they backed away. Yularu saw them. No, you must not leave, you must dance. They turned and ran as fast as the old man could go. The dancing villagers changed the direction of their dance and began to whirl menacingly towards them in a horrible semblance of gaiety. There's nothing for it, Lamzar said and stood his ground, observing them through ironic eyes. The mountain gods must be invoked. A pity for sorcery wearies me. Let us hope their magic extends to this plane. Gorda! Words in an unusually harsh language issued from Lamzar's old mouth. The whirling villagers came on. Lamzar pointed at them. The villagers became suddenly petrified, and slowly, disturbingly, their bodies caught in a hundred positions, turned to smooth black basalt. That was for their own good. Lamzar smiled grimly. Come to the place where the winds meet. And he took Rakia there quite swiftly. At the place where the winds met, they found the second gateway, a colour of amber-coloured flame and shot through with streaks of green. They entered it and instantly were in a world of dark, seething colour. Above them was a sky of murky red in which other colours shifted, agitated, changing. Ahead of them lay a forest, dark, blue, black, heavy mottled green, the tops of its trees moving like a wild tide. It was a howling land of unnatural phenomena. Lamsar pursed his lips. On this plane, chaos rules. We must get to the next gate swiftly, for obviously the lords of chaos will try to stop us. Is it always like this? Rakia gasped. It is always boiling midnight, but the rest it changes with the moods of the lords. There are no rules at all. They pressed on through the bounding, blossoming scenery as it erupted and changed around them. Once they saw a huge winged figure in the sky, smoky yellow and roughly man-shaped. Vesjan, Lamzar said. Let's hope he did not see us. Vesjan, Rakia whispered the name for it was to Vejan that he had once been loyal. They crept on, undisturbed of their direction or even of their speed. Uncertain of their direction or even of their speed in that disturbing land. At length they came to the shores of a peculiar ocean. It was a grey, heaving, timeless sea. 
a mysterious sea which stretched into infinity. There could be no other shores beyond this rolling plain of water, no other lands or rivers or dark cool woods, no other men or women or ships. It was a sea which led to nowhere, complete to itself, a sea. Over this timeless ocean hovered a brooding ochre sun which cast moody shadows of black and green across the water, giving the whole scene something of the look of being enclosed in a vast cavern, for the sky above was gnarled and black with ancient clouds, and all the while the doom carried crash of breakers, the lonely, fated monotony of the ever-rearing white-topped waves, the sound which portended neither death nor life nor war nor peace. Simply existence and shifting in harmony. They could go no further. This has the air of our death about it, Rikia said, shivering. The sea roared and tumbled, the sound of it increasing to a fury, daring them to go towards it, welcoming them with wild temptation, offering them nothing but achievement, the achievement of death. Lamzar said, It is not my fate wholly to perish. But then they were running back towards the forest, feeling that the strange sea was pouring up the beach towards them. They looked back and saw that it had gone no further, that the breakers were less wild, the sea more calm. Lamzar was a little way behind Rakir. The red archer gripped his hand and hauled him forwards, as if he had rescued the old man from a whirlpool. They remained there, mesmerised for a long time, while the sea called to them and the wind was a cold caress on their flesh. In the bleak brightness of the alien shore, under a sun which gave no heat, their bodies shone like stars in the night. They turned towards the forest quietly. Are we trapped then in this realm of chaos? Rokia said at length. If we meet someone, they will offer us harm. How can we ask our question? Then there emerged from the huge forest a great figure, naked and gnarled like the trunk of a tree, green as a lime, but the face was jovial. Greetings, unhappy renegades, it said. Where is the next gate? said Lamzar quickly. You almost entered it, but turned away laughed the giant. That sea does not exist. It is there to stop travellers from passing through the gate. It exists here in the realm of chaos, Rakia said thickly. You could say so. But what exists in chaos save the disorders of the minds of gods gone mad? Rakia had strung his bone bow and fitted an arrow to the string but he did it in the knowledge of his own hopelessness. Do not shoot the arrow, said Lamzar softly. Not yet. And he stared at the arrow and muttered. The giant advanced carelessly towards them, unhurried. It will please me to exact the price of your crimes from you, it said. For I am Hjornhern, the executioner. You will find your death pleasant, but your fate unbearable. As he came closer, his clawed hands outstretched. Shoot, croaked Lemzar, and Rakia brought the bowstring to his cheek, pulled it back with might, and released the arrow at the giant's heart. Run, cried Lamzar, and in spite of their forebodings, they ran back down the shore towards the frightful sea. They heard the giant groan behind them, and as they reached the edge of the sea, and instead of running into the water, found themselves in a range of stark mountains. No mortal arrow could have delayed him, Rokia said. How did you stop him? I used an old charm, a charm of justice, which, when applied to any weapon, makes it strike at the unjust. But why did it hurt Hjornhurn, an immortal? Rikia asked. There is no justice in the world of chaos. Something constant and inflexible, whatever its nature, must harm any servant of the lords of chaos. We have 
pass through the third gate, Rakia said, unstrunging his bow, and have the fourth and fifth to find. Two dangers have been avoided, but what new ones will we encounter now? Who knows, said Lamsar, and they walked on through the rocky mountain pass and entered a forest that was cool, even though the sun had reached its zenith and was glaring down through parts of the thick foliage. There was an air of ancient calm about the place. They heard unfamiliar bird calls and saw tiny golden birds which were also new to them. There's something calm and peaceful about this place. I almost distrust it, Rekia said, but Lamsar pointed ahead silently. Rekia saw a large domed building, magnificent in marble and blue mosaic. It stood in a clearing of yellow grass and the marble caught the sun, flashing like fire. They neared the domed construction and saw that it was supported by big marble columns set into a platform of milky jade. In the centre of the platform, a stairway of blue stone curved upwards and disappeared into a circular aperture. There were wide windows set into the sides of the raised buildings, but they could not see inside. There were no inhabitants visible, and it would have seemed strange to the pair if there had been. They crossed the yellow glade and stepped onto the jade platform. It was warm, as if it had been exposed to the sun. They almost slipped on the smooth stone. They reached the blue steps and mounted them, staring upwards, but they could still see nothing. They did not attempt to ask themselves why they were so assuredly invading the building. It seemed quite natural that they should do what they were doing. Well, there was no alternative. There was an air of familiarity about the place. Rakia felt it, but did not know why. Inside the cool, shadowy hall, a blend of soft darkness and bright sunlight which entered by the windows. The floor was pearl pink, and the ceiling deep scarlet. The hall reminded her care of a womb. Partially hidden by deep shadow was a small doorway, and beyond its steps, Rakia looked questioningly at Lamzar. Do we proceed in our explorations? We must, to have our question answered, if possible. They climbed the steps and found themselves in a smaller hall, similar to the one beneath them. This hall, however, was furnished with twelve wide thrones placed in a semicircle in the centre. Against the wall, near the door, were several chairs, upholstered in purple fabric. The thrones were of gold, decorated with fine silver, padded with white cloth. The door behind the throne opened and a tall, fragile-looking man appeared, followed by others whose faces were almost identical. Only their robes were noticeably different. Their faces were pale, almost white, their noses straight, their lips thin but not cruel. Their eyes were unhuman, green-flecked eyes which stared outwards with sad composure. The leader of the tall men looked at Rakia and Lamzar. He nodded and waved a pale, long-fingered hand gracefully. Welcome, he said. His voice was high and frail like a girl's, but beautiful in its modulation. The other eleven men seated themselves in the throne, in the thrones, but the first man who had spoken remained standing. Sit down, please, he said. And Akira and Lamzar sat down on two of the purple chairs. How did you come here? inquired the man. Through the gates from chaos, Lamzar replied. And were you seeking our realm? No, we travel towards the domain of the Grey Lords. I thought so, for your people rarely visit us save by accident. Where are we? asked Rakia, as the man seated himself in the remaining throne. In a place beyond time. Once our land was part of the earth you know, but in the dim past it became separated from it. 
our bodies, unlike yours, are immortal. We choose this, but we are not bound to our flesh as you are. I don't understand, frowned Rakia. What are you saying? I have said what I can in the simplest terms understandable to you. If you do not know what I say, then I can explain no further. We are called the Guardians, though we guard nothing. We are warriors, but we fight nothing. What else do you do? inquired Rakia. We exist. You will want to know where the next gateway lies. Yes. Refresh yourselves here and then we shall show you the gateway. What is your function? asked Rakia. To function, said the man. You are unhuman. We are human. You spend your lives chasing that which is within you and that which you can find in any other human being, but you will not look for it there. You must follow more glamorous paths to waste your time in order to discover that you have wasted your time. I am glad that we are no longer like you, but I wish it were help lawful to help you further. This, however, we may not do. Well, ours is no meaningless quest, said Lamzar quietly, with respect. We go to rescue Tanalorn. Tanalorn, the man said softly. Does Tanalorn still remain? Aye, said Rakia, and shelters tired men who are grateful for the rest she offers. Now he realised why the building had been familiar. It had the same quality intensified, as Tanalorn. Tanalorn was the last of our cities, said the Guardian. Forgive us for judging you. Most of the travellers who pass through this plain are searchers, restless with no real purpose, only excuses, imaginary reasons for journeying on. You must love Tanalorn to brave the dangers of the gateways. We do, said Rakia, and I am grateful that you built her. We built her for ourselves, but it is good that others have used her well, and she them. Will you help us, Rakia said, for Tanalorn? We cannot. It is not lawful. Now refresh yourselves and be welcome. The two travellers were given foods, both soft and brittle, sweet and sour, and drink which seemed to enter the pores of their skin as they quaffed it. And then the guardian said, We have caused a road to be made. Follow it and enter the next world, but we warn you it is the most dangerous of all. And they set off down the road that the guardians had caused to be made, and passed through the fourth gateway into a dreadful realm. The realm of law. Nothing shone in the grey-lit sky. Nothing moved. Nothing marred the grey. Nothing interrupted the bleak grey plains stretching on all sides of them forever. There was no horizon. It was a bright, clean wasteland. There was a sense about the air, a presence of something past, something which had gone but left a faint aura of its passing. What dangers could be here, said Rakia, shuddering, here where there is nothing. The danger of the loneliest madness, Lamzar replied. Their voices were swallowed in the grey expanse. When the earth was very young, Lamzar continued, his words trailing away across the wilderness. Things were like this. But there were seas. Here there is nothing. You are wrong, Rakia said with a faint smile. I have thought. Here there is law. That is true, but what is law without something to decide between? 
here is law bereft of justice. They walked on, all about them an air of something intangible that had once been tangible. On they walked through this barren world of absolute law. Eventually, Rikia spied something. Something that flickered, faded, appeared again, until, as they near it, they saw it was the body of a man. His great head was noble, firm, and his body was massively built, but the face was twisted in a tortured frown, and he did not see them as they approached him. They stopped before him, and Lamzar coughed to attract his attention. He turned his great head and regarded them abstractly, the frown clearing at length to be replaced by a calmer, thoughtful expression. Who are you? asked Rakia. The man sighed. Not yet, he said. Not yet, it seems. More phantoms. Are we the phantoms? smiled Rakia. That seems to be more your own nature. He watched as the man began slowly to fade again, his form less definite, melting. The body seemed to make a great heave, like a salmon attempting to leap a dam, and then it was back again in a more solid form. I had thought myself rid of all that was superfluous, save my own obstinate shape, the man said tiredly. But here is something back again. Is my reason failing? Is my logic no longer what it was? Well, do not fear, said Rakia. We are material beings. That is what I feared. For an eternity I have been stripping away the layers of unreality which obscure the truth. I have almost succeeded in the final act, and now you begin to creep back. My mind is not what it was, I think. Perhaps you worry lest we do not exist, Lamzar said slowly with a clever smile. You know that is not so. You do not exist, just as I do not exist. The frown returned, the features twisted, the body began again to fade, only to resume once more its earlier nature. The man sighed. Even to reply to you is betraying myself, but I suppose a little relaxation will serve to rest my powers and equip me for the final effort of will, which will bring me to the ultimate truth. The truth of non-being. But non-being involves non-thought, non-will, non-action, Lamzar said. Surely you would not submit yourself to such a fate. There is no such thing as self. I am the only reasoning thing in creation. I am almost pure reason. A little more effort and I shall be what I desire to be the one truth in this non-existent universe that requires first ridding myself of anything extraneous around me, such as yourselves, and then making the final plunge into the only reality. What is that? The state of absolute nothingness where there is nothing to disturb the order of things because there is no order of things. Scarcely a constructive ambition, Rakia said. Construction is a meaningless word. Like all words, like all so-called existence, everything means nothing. That is the only truth. But what of this world? Barren as it is, it still has light and firm rock. You have not succeeded in reasoning that out of existence, Lamzar said. That will cease when I cease, the man said slowly, just as you will cease to be. Then there can be nothing but nothing, and law will reign unchallenged. But logic cannot reign, it will not exist either, according to your logic. You are wrong. Nothingness is the law. 
Nothingness is the object of law. Law is the way to its ultimate state, the state of non-being. Well, said Lamza amusingly, then you had better tell us where we may find the next gate. There is no gate. Well, if there were, where would we find it, Rakia said. If a gate existed, and it does not, it would have been inside the mountain, close to what was once called the Sea of Peace. And where was that? Rikia asked, conscious now of their terrible predicament. There were no landmarks. No sun, no stars, nothing by which they could determine direction. Close to the mountain of severity. Which way do you go? Lamza inquired of the man. Out. Beyond, to nowhere. And where, if you succeed in your object, will we be consigned? To some other nowhere. I cannot truthfully answer. But since you have never existed in reality, therefore you can go on to no non-reality. Only I am real, and I do not exist. We are getting nowhere, said Rakia with a smirk, which changed to a frown. It is only my mind which holds the non-reality at bay, the man said, and I must concentrate or else it will all come flooding back and I shall have to start from the beginning again. In the beginning there was everything. Chaos. I created nothing. With resignation, Rakia strung his bow, fitted an arrow to the string and aimed at the frowning man. You wish for non-being? he said. I have told you so. Rikia's arrow pierced his heart. His body faded, became solid and slumped to the grass as mountains, forests and rivers appeared around them. It was still a peaceful, well-ordered world, and Rakia and Lamza, as they strode on in search of the mountain of severity, savoured it. There seemed to be no animal life here, and they talked in puzzled terms about the man they had been forced to kill, until at length they reached a great smooth pyramid which seemed, though it was of natural origin, to have been carved into this form. They walked around its base until they discovered an opening. There could be no doubt that this was the mountain of severity, and a calm ocean lay some distance away. They went into the opening and emerged into a delicate landscape. They were now through the last gateway and in the domain of the Grey Lords. There were trees like stiffened spider webs. Here and there were blue pools, shallow with shining water, and graceful rocks balanced in them and around their shores. Above them and beyond them, the light hills swept away towards a pastel yellow horizon, which was tinted with red, orange, and deep, deep blue. They felt overlarge, clumsy, like crude, gross giants treading on fine, short grass. They felt as if they were destroying the sanctity of the place. Then they saw a girl come walking towards them. She stopped as they came closer to her. She was dressed in loose black robes which flowed about her as if in a wind. But there was no wind. Her face was pale and pointed. Her black eyes large and enigmatic. At her long throat was a jewel. Sorana, said Rakia thickly. You died. I disappeared, said she, and this is where I came. I was told that you would come to this place and decided that I would meet you. But this is the domain of the Grey Lords and you serve chaos. I do, but many are welcome at the Grey Lords court, whether they be of law or chaos or neither. Come, I will escort you there. Bewildered now. Rikia let her lead the way across the strange terrain, and Lamzar followed him. 
Sorana and Rekia had been lovers once in Yesh Patum Kalai, the unholy fortress where evil blossomed and was beautiful. Sorana, sorceress, adventurous, was without conscience, but had had high regard for the Red Archer since he had come to Yesh Patum Kalai one evening, covered in his own blood, survivor of a bizarre battle between the Knights of Tumbru and Loheb Bakra's brigand engineers. Seven years ago, that had been, and he had heard her scream when the blue assassins had crept into the unholy fortress, pledged to murder evil makers. Even then he had been in the process of hurriedly leaving Yesh Patum Kalai, and had considered it unwise to investigate what was obviously a death screen. Now she was here, and if she was here then it was for a strong reason, and for her own convenience. On the other hand, it was in her interest to serve chaos, and he must be suspicious of her. Ahead of them now they saw many great tents of shimmering grey, which in the light seemed composed of all colours. People moved slowly among the tents, and there was an air of leisure about the place. Here, Sorana said, smiling at him and taking his hand. The Grey Lords hold impermanent court. They wander about their land and have few artefacts and only temporary houses, which you see. They will make you welcome if you interest them. But will they help us? Well, you must ask them. You are pledged to e Corps of Chaos, Rakia observed, and must aid her against us. Is that not so? Here, she smiled, is a truce. I can only inform Chaos of what I learn of your plans, and if the Grey Lords aid you, must tell them how, if I can find out. You are Frank Sorana? Here there are subtler hypocrisies. And the subtlest lie of all is the full truth, she said, as they entered the area of tall tents and made their way towards a certain one. In a different realm of the earth, the huge horde careered across the grasslands of the north, screaming and singing behind the black-armoured horsemen, their leader. Nearer and nearer they came to lonely Tanalorn, their motley weapons shining through the evening mists, like a boiling tidal wave of insensate flesh. The mob drove on, hysterical with their hate for Tanalorn, which Najan had placed in their thin hearts. Thieves... Murderers, jackals, scavengers, a scrawny horde, but huge. And in Tanalorn the warriors were grim-faced, as their outriders and scouts flowed into the city with messages and estimates of the bigger army's strength. Brute, in the silver armour of his rank, knew that two full days had passed since Rakia had left for the sighing desert. Three more days and the city would be engulfed by Najan's mighty rabble, and they knew there was no chance of halting their advance. They might have left Tanalorn to its fate, but they could not. Even weak Uroch would not, for Tanalorn the Mysterious had given them all a secret power which each believed to be his only, a strength which filled them where before they had been hollow men. Selfishly they stayed, for to leave Tanalorn to her fate would be to become hollow again, and that they all dreaded. Brute was the leader, and he prepared the defence of Tanalorn, a defence which might just have held against the bigger army, but not against it and Chaos. Brute shuddered when he thought that if Chaos had directed its full force against Tanalorn, they would be sobbing in hell at that moment. Dust rose high above Tanalorn, sent flying by the hooves of the scouts and messengers' horses. One came through the gate as Brute watched. He pulled his mount to a stop before the nobleman. He was the messenger from Carlark, by the Weeping Waste, one of the nearest major cities to Tanalorn. The messenger gasped. I asked Carlark for aid, but as we had supposed, they had never heard of Tanalorn and suspected that I was an emissary from the beggar army, sent to lead their few forces into a trap. 
I pleaded with the senators, but they would do nothing. Was not Elric there? He knows Tanelorn. No, he was not there. There is a rumour which says that he himself fights chaos now, for the minions of chaos captured his wife, Tsaratsinia, and he rides in pursuit of them. Chaos, it seems, gains strength everywhere in our realm. Brute was pale. And what of Yadmar? Will Yadmar send warriors? The messenger spoke urgently, for many had been sent to nearer cities to solicit aid. I do not know, replied Brute. And it does not matter now, for the beggar army is not three days' march from Tanalorn, and it would take two weeks for a Yadmarian force to reach us. And Rick here? I have heard nothing, and he has not returned. I have the feeling he will not return. Tanalorn is doomed. Rakir and Lamsar bowed before the three small men who sat in the tent, but one of them said impatiently, Do not humble yourselves before us, friends, we who are humbler than any. So they straightened their backs and waited to be further addressed. The Grey Lords assumed humility, but this, it seemed, was their greatest ostentation, for it was a pride they had. Rakir realised that he would need to use subtle flattery, and was not sure that he could, for he was a warrior, not a courtier or a diplomat. Lamzar too realised the situation, and he said, In our pride, lords, we have come to learn the simpler truths which are only truths, the truths which you can teach us. The speaker gave a self-deprecating smile and replied, A truth is not for us to define, guest. We can but offer our incomplete thoughts. They might interest you, or help you to find your own truths. Indeed, that is so, Rikia said, not wholly sure that with what he was agreeing, but judging it best to agree. And we wondered if you had any suggestions on a matter which concerns us, the protection of our Tanner lawn. We would not be so prideful as to interfere our own comments. We are not mighty intellects, the speaker replied blandly, and we have no confidence in our own decisions. For who knows that they may be wrong and based on wrongly assessed information. Indeed, said Lamsar, judging that he must flatter them with their own assumed humility, and it is lucky for us, lords, we do not confuse pride with learning, for it is the quiet man who observes and says little who sees the most. Therefore, though we realise that you are not confident that your suggestion or help would be useful, nonetheless we... Taking example from your own demeanour, humbly ask if you know of any way in which we might rescue Tanelorn? Rakia had hardly been able to follow the complexities of Lamsar's seemingly unsophisticated argument, but he saw that the Grey Lords were pleased. Out of the corner of his eye he observed Sorana. She was smiling to herself, and it seemed evident by the characteristics of that smile that they had behaved in the right way. Now Sorana was listening intently, and Rakia cursed to himself that the Lords of Chaos would know of everything, and might, even if they did gain the Grey Lord's aid, still be able to anticipate and stop any action they took to save Tanalorn. The speaker conferred in a liquid speech with his fellows and said finally, Rarely do we have the privilege to entertain such brave and intelligent men. How might our insignificant minds be put to your advantage? Rakia realised quite suddenly and almost laughed that the Grey Lords were not very clever at all. Their flattery had got them the help they required. He said, Narjan of Chaos heads a huge army of human scum, a bigger army, and is sworn to tear down Tanalorn and kill her inhabitants. We need magical aid of some kind to combat one so powerful as Narshan and defeat the beggars. But Tanalorn cannot be destroyed, said a grey lord. She is eternal. And another, uh, but this manifestation, murmured the third, ah, uh, yes. There are beetles in Caliph, 
said a grey lord who had not spoken before, which emit a peculiar venom. Beetles, lord, said Rickia. They are the size of mammoths, said the third lord, but can change their size, and change the size of their prey, if it is too large for their gullets. Well, as for that matter, the first speaker said, there is a chimera which dwells in mountains south of here. It can change its shape, and contains hate for chaos, since chaos bred it and abandoned it with no real shape of its own. Well, then there are the four brothers of Hemishal, who are endowed with sorcerous power, said the second lord, but the first interrupted him. Their magic is no good outside their own dimension. I had thought, however, of reviving the blue wizard. Mm, too dangerous. And anyways, beyond our powers, said his companion. They continued to debate for a while, and Rakia and Lamzar said nothing, but waited. The boatmen of Zerlarines, we have decided, will probably be best equipped to aid you in defence of Tanalorn. You must go to the mountains of Zerlarines and find their lake. A lake, said Lamzar, in a range of mountains, I see. N no, the lord said, their lake lies above the mountains. We will find someone to take you there. Perhaps they will aid you. You can guarantee nothing else? Nothing. It is not our business to interfere. It is up to them to decide whether they will aid you or not. I see, said Rickia. Thank you. How much time had passed since he had left Tanalorn? How much time before Najan's beggar army reached the city? Or had it already done so? And suddenly he thought of something, looked for Sarana, but she had left the tent. Where lies Zerlarines? Lamzar was asking. Well, not in our realm, one of the Grey Lords replied. Come, we'll find you a guide. Sorana spoke the necessary word, which took her immediately into the blue half-world, with which she was so familiar. There were no other colours in it, but many, many shades of blue. Here she waited until Ikor noticed her presence. In the timelessness, she could not tell how long she had waited. The beggar horde came to an undisciplined and slow halt at the sign of its leader. A voice rang hollowly from the helm that was always closed. Tomorrow we march on Tanalorn. The time we have anticipated is almost upon us. Make camp now. Tomorrow shall Tanalorn be punished, and the stones of her little houses will be dust on the wind. The million beggars crackled to their glee and wetted their scrawny lips. Not one of them asked why they had marched so far, and this was because of Najan's power. In Tanalorn, Brute and Sass the one-handed discussed the nature of death in quiet, over-controlled tones. Both were filled with sadness, less for themselves than for Tanalorn, soon to perish. Outside, a pitiful army tried to place a cordon around the town, but failed to fill the gaps between men. There were so few of them. Lights in the houses burned as if for the last time. The candles guttered moodily. Sorana, sweating as she always did after such an episode, returned to the plain occupied by the Grey Lords and discovered that Rakia, Lamzar and their guide were preparing to leave. Ikor had told her what to do. It was for her to contact Najan. The rest the Lords of Chaos would accomplish. She blew her ex-lover a kiss as he rode from the camp into the night. He grinned at her defiantly, but when his face was turned from her he frowned and then went in silence into the valley of the currents where they entered the world where lay the mountains of zur Almost as soon as they arrived, danger presented itself. Their guide, a wanderer called Tamaris, pointed into the night sky which was spiked by the outlines of crags. This is a world where the air elementals are dominant, he said. Look. Flowing downwards in an ominous sweep, they saw a flight of owls, great eyes gleaming. 
Only as they came nearer did the men realise that these owls were huge, almost as large as a man. In the saddle, Rakia strung his bow. Tamiris said, How could they have learned of our presence so soon? Sorana, Rakia said, busy with the bow. She must have warned the Lords of Chaos and they have sent these dreadful birds. As the first one homed in, great claws grasping, great beak gaping, he shot it in its feathery throat and it shrieked and swept upwards. Many arrows fled from his humming bowstring to find a mark, while Tamiris drew his sword and slashed at them, ducking as they whistled downwards. Lamzar watched the battle, but took no part. Seemed thoughtful at a time when action was desired of him. He mused. If the spirits of air are dominant in this world, then they will resent a stronger force of other elementals. And he racked his brain to remember a spell. Rakia had but two arrows left in his quiver by the time they had driven the owls off. The birds had not been used, evidently, to a prey which fought back and had put up a poor fight considering their superiority. We can expect more danger, said Rakia somewhat shakily, for the Lords of Chaos will use other means to try and stop us. How far to Zerilini's? Not far, said Tamiris, but it is a hard road. They rode on, and Lamzar rode behind them, lost in his own thoughts. Now they urged their horses up a steep mountain path, and a chasm lay below them. Dropping, dropping, dropping. Rakir, who had no love for heights, kept as close to the mountainside as was possible. If he had had gods to whom he could pray, he would have prayed for their help then. The huge fish came flying, or swimming at them as they rounded a bend. They were semi-luminous, big as sharks, but with enlarged fins with which they planed through the air like rays. They were quite evidently fish. Tamiris drew his sword, but Rakir had only two arrows left, and it would have been useless against the airfish to have shot them, for there were many of the fish. But Lamzar laughed and spoke in a high-pitched, staccato speech. Crack! Hoa! Pishta! Sta! Sala! Fla! Huge balls of flame materialised amongst the black, sky-flaring balls of multicoloured fire which shaped themselves into strange, war-like forms and streamed towards the unnatural fish. The flame shapes seared into the big fish and they shrieked, struck at the fireballs, burned and fell flaming down into the deep gorge. Fire elementals, Rakir exclaimed. The spirits of the air fear such things, Lamzar said calmly. The flame beings accompanied the rest of them on the way to Zerlerines, and were with them when dawn came, having frightened away many other dangers which the Lords of Chaos had evidently sent against them. They saw the boats of Zelerines in the dawn, at anchor on a calm sky, fluffy clouds playing around their slender keels, their huge sails furled. The boatmen live aboard their vessels, Tamira said, for it is only their ships which deny the laws of nature, not they. Tamira cupped his hands around his mouth and called through the still mountain air, Boatmen of Zer Lerines, freemen of the air, guests come with a request for aid. A black and bearded face appeared over the side of one of the red gold vessels. The man shielded his eyes against the rising sun and stared down at them, and then he disappeared again. At length a ladder of slim thongs came snaking down to where they sat their horses on the tops of the mountains. Tamiris grasped it tested it and began to climb. Rakhir reached out and steadied the ladder for him. It seemed too thin to support a man, but when he had it in his hands he knew it was the strongest he had ever known. Lamzar grumbled as Rakhir signalled for him to climb, but he did so, and quite nimbly. 
Rakir was the last, following his companions, climbing up through the sky, high above the crags, towards the ship that sailed on the air. The fleet comprised some twenty or thirty ships, and Rakir felt that with these to aid him, there was a good chance to rescue Tanalorn, if Tanalorn survived. Narshan would anyway be aware of the nature of the aid he sought. Starved dogs barked the morning in, and the beggar horde, walking from where they had sprawled on the ground, saw Najan already mounted, but talking to a newcomer, a girl in black robes that moved as if in a wind, but there was no wind. There was a jewel at her long throat. When he had finished conversing with the newcomer, Najan ordered a horse he brought for her, and she rode slightly behind him when the beggar army moved on the last stage of their hateful journey to Tanalorn. When they saw how lovely Tanalorn and how it was so poorly guarded, the beggars laughed, but Najan and his new companion looked up into the sky. There may be time, said the hollow voice, and gave the order to attack. Howling, the beggars broke into a run towards Tanalorn. The attack had started. Brute rose in his saddle, and there were tears flowing down his face and glistening in his beard. His huge war axe was in one gauntleted hand, and the other held a spiked mace across the saddle before him. Zas, the one-handed, gripped the long and heavy broadsword with its pommel of a rampant golden lion pointed downwards. This blade had won him a crown in Andlemania, and he doubted whether it would successfully defend his peace in Tanalorn. Beside him stood Uroch of Nieva, pale-faced but angry as he watched the ragged horde's implacable approach. Then, yelling, the beggars met with the warriors of Tanalorn, and although greatly outnumbered, the warriors fought desperately, for they were defending more than life or love. They were defending that which had told them of a reason for living. Najan set his horse aside from the battle, Sorana next to him, for Najan could take no active part in the battle, could only watch and, if necessary, use magic to aid his human pawns or defend his person. The warriors of Tanalorn, incredibly, held back the roaring beggar horde, their weapons drenched with blood, rising and falling in at that sea of moving flesh, flashing in the light of the red dawn. Sweat now mingled with the salt tears in Brute's bristling beard, and with agility he leapt clear of his black horse as the screaming beast was cut from under him. The noble war cry of his forefathers sang on his breath, and although in his shame he had no business to use it, he let it roar from him as he slashed about him with biting war axe and rending mace. But he fought hopelessly, for Rakir had not come, and Tanalorn was soon to die. His one fierce consolation was that he would die with the city, his blood mingling with the ashes. Zas also acquitted himself very well before he died of a smashed skull, his old body twitching as trampling feet stumbled over it as the beggars made for Uroch of Nieva. The gold-pommeled sword was still gripped in his single hand and his soul was fleeing for limbo as Uroch too was slain fighting. Then the ships of Azur Lerines suddenly materialised in the sky, and Brute, looking upward for one instant, knew that Rakir had come at last, though it might be too late. Narjan also saw the ships and was prepared for them. They skimmed through the sky, the fire elementals which Lamzar had summoned flying with them. The spirits of air and flame had been called to rescue, weakening Tanalorn. The boatmen prepared their wagons and made themselves ready for war. Their black faces had a concentrated look, and they grinned in their bushy beards. War harness clothed them, and they bristled with weapons. Long, barbed tridents, nets of steel mesh, curved swords, long harpoons. Rakir stood in the prow of the leading ship, his quiver packed with slim arrows loaned to him by the boatmen. Below him he saw Tanalorn and was relieved that the city still stood. 
He could see the milling warriors below, but it was hard to tell from the air which were friends and which were foes. Lamzar called to his frisking fire elementals, instructing them. Tamiris grinned and held his sword ready as the ships rocked on the wind and dropped lower. Now Rakia observed Najan with Sorana beside him. The bitches warned him. He is ready for us, Rakia said, wetting his lips and drawing an arrow from his quiver. Down the ships of Zulerines dropped, coursing downwards on the currents of air, their golden sails billowing, the warrior crew straining over the side and keen for battle. Then Najan summons the Kyrene. Huge as a storm cloud, black as its native, Hal, the Kyrene grew from the surrounding air and moved its shapeless bulk forward towards the ships of Zerlerines, sending out flowing tendrils of poison towards them. The boatmen groaned as the coils curled around their naked bodies and crushed them. Lamzar called urgently to his fire elementals and they rose again from where they had been devouring beggars, came together in one great blossoming of flame which moved to do battle with the Kyrene. The two masses met and there was an explosion which blinded the Red Archer with multicoloured light and sent the ships rocking and shaking so that several capsized and sent their crews hurtling downwards to death. Blotches of flame flew everywhere, and patches of poison blackness from the body of the Kyrene were flung about, slaying those they touched before disappearing. There was a terrible stink in the air, the smell of burning, a smell of outraged elements which had never been meant to meet. The Kyrene died, lashing about a wailing, while the flame elementals, dying or returning to their own sphere, faded and vanished. The remaining bulk of the great Kyrene billowed slowly down to the earth, where it fell upon the scrabbling beggars and killed them, leaving nothing but a wet patch on the ground for yards around, the patch glistening with the bones of beggars. Now Rakia cried, Quickly, finish the fight before Najan summons more horrors! and the boats sailed downwards while the boatmen cast their steel nets, pulling large catches of beggars aboard their ships and finishing the wriggling starvelings with their tridents or spears. Lakia shot arrow after arrow and had the satisfaction of seeing each one take a beggar just where he had aimed it. The remaining warriors of Tanalorn, led by Brute, who was covered in sticky blood but grinned in his victory, charged towards the unnerved beggars. Najan stood his ground while the beggars, fleeing, streamed past him and the girl. Sorana seemed frightened, looking up, and her eyes met Rakia's. The Red Archer aimed an arrow at her, thought better of it, and shot instead at Najan. The arrow went into the black armour, but had no effect upon the Lord of Chaos. Then the boatman of Zer Lernes flung down their largest net from the vessel in which Rakia sailed, and they had caught Lord Najan and his coils, and caught Sorana too. Shouting their exhilaration, they pulled the struggling bodies aboard, and Rakia ran forward to inspect their catch. Sorana had received a scratch across her face from the net's wire, but the body of Najan lay still and dreadful in the mesh. Rakia grabbed an axe from a boatman and knocked back the helm, his foot upon the chest. Yield, Najan of Chaos, he cried in mindless merriment. He was near hysterical with victory, for this was the first time a mortal had ever bested a lord of chaos. But the armour was empty. If it had ever been occupied by flesh, Najan was now gone. Calm settled aboard the ships of Zerlerines and over the city of Tanalorn. The remnants of the warriors had gathered in the city square and were cheering their victory. Friago, the captain of the Zerlerines, came up to Rakia and shrugged. We did not get the catch we came for, but these will do. Thanks for the fishing, friend. Rakia smiled and gripped Friago's black shoulder. Thanks for the aid. You have done us all a great service. 
Friago shrugged again and turned back to his nets, his trident poised. Suddenly, Rakia shouted, No, Friago, let that one be. Let me have the contents of that net. Sorana, the contents to which he'd referred, looked anxious as if she had rather been transfixed on the prongs of Friago's trident. Friago said, Very well, Red Archer, there are plenty more people on the land. Pulled at the net to release her. She stood up shakily, looking at Rakia apprehensively. Rakia smiled quite softly and said, Come here, Sarana. She went to him and stood staring up at his bony hawk's face, her eyes wide. With a laugh, he picked her up and flung her over his shoulder. Tanalorn is safe, he shouted, and you shall learn to love its peace with me. And he began to clamber down the trailing ladders that the boatman had dropped over the side. Lamzar waited for him below. I go now to my hermitage again. Oh, I thank you for your aid, said Rakir. Without it, Tanalorn would no longer exist. Tanalorn will always exist while men exist, said the hermit. It was not a city you defended today. It was an ideal. That is Tanalorn. And Lamzar smiled. <laughs>